Section twenty nine of Volume One C of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of sixteen eighty eight. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of sixteen eighty eight by David Hume, Volume One C, Section twenty nine. Chapter thirty two, part two. But as Henry was observed to be much governed by his wives while he retained his fondness for them, the final prevalence of either party seemed much to depend on the choice of the future queen. Immediately after the death of Jane Seymour, the most beloved of all his wives, he began to think of a new marriage. He first cast his eye towards the Duchess Dowager of Milan, niece to the Emperor, and he made proposals for that alliance. But meeting with difficulties, he was carried by his friendship for Francis rather to think of a French princess. He demanded the Duchess Dowager of Longueville, daughter of the Duke of Guise, a prince of the House of Lorraine. But Francis told him that the lady was already betrothed to the King of Scotland. The King, however, would not take a refusal. He had set his heart extremely on the match. The information which he had received of the Duchess's accomplishments and beauty had prepossessed him in her favour, and having privately sent over Miltoys to examine her person and get certain intelligence of her conduct, the accounts which that agent brought him served further to inflame his desires. He learned that she was big maid, and he thought her on that account the more proper match for him who is now become somewhat corpulent. The pleasure, too, of mortifying his nephew, whom he did not love, was a further incitement to his prosecution of this match and he insisted that Francis should give him the preference to the King of Scots. But Francis, though sensible that the alliance of England was of much greater importance to his interests, would not affront his friend and ally, and to prevent further solicitation, he immediately sent the princess back to Scotland. Not to shock, however, Henry's humour, Francis made him an offer of Mary of Bourbon, daughter of the Duke of Vendôme. But as the king was informed that James had formally rejected this princess, he would not hear any further of such a proposal. The French monarch then offered him the choice of the two younger sisters of the Queen of Scots, and he assured him that they were nowise inferior either in merit or size to their elder sister and that one of them was even superior in beauty. The king was as scrupulous with regard to the person of his wives, as if his heart had been really susceptible of a delicate passion, and he was unwilling to trust any relations, or even pictures, with regard to this important particular. He proposed to Francis that they should have a conference at Calais, on pretense of business, and that this monarch should bring along with him the two princesses of Guise, together with the finest ladies of quality in France, that he might make a choice among them. But the gallant spirit of Francis was shocked with the proposal. He was impressed with too much regard, he said, for the fair sex, to carry ladies of the first quality like geldings to a market, there to be chosen or rejected by the humour of the purchaser. Henry would hearken to none of these niceties, but still insisted on his proposal, which, however, notwithstanding Francis' earnest desire of obliging him, was finally rejected. The king then began to turn his thoughts towards a German alliance, and as the princesses of the Smalcaldic League were extremely disgusted with the emperor on account of his persecuting their religion, he hoped, by matching himself into one of their families, to renew a connection which he regarded as so advantageous to him. Cromwell joyfully seconded this intention, 
and proposed to him Anne of Cleves, whose father, the duke of that name, had great interest among the Lutheran princes, and whose sister, Sibylla, was married to the elector of Saxony, the head of the Protestant League. A flattering picture of the princess by Hans Holborn determined Henry to apply to her father, and after some negotiation the marriage, notwithstanding the opposition of the elector of Saxony, was at last concluded, and Anne was sent over to England. The king, impatient to be satisfied with regard to the person of his bride, came privately to Rochester and got a sight of her. He found her big, indeed, and tall as he could wish, but utterly destitute both of beauty and grace, very unlike the pictures and representations which he had received. He swore that she was a great Flanders mare, and declared that he never could possibly bear her any affection. The matter was worse when he found that she could speak no language but Dutch, of which he was entirely ignorant, and that the charms of her conversation were not likely to compensate for the homeliness of her person. He returned to Greenwich, very melancholy, and he lamented his hard fate to Cromwell, as well as to Lord Russell, Sir Anthony Brown, and Sir Anthony Denny. This last gentleman, in order to give him comfort, told him that his misfortune was common to him with all kings, who could not, like private persons, choose for themselves, but must receive their wives from the judgment and fancy of others. It was the subject of debate among the king's counsellors whether the marriage could not yet be dissolved and the princess be sent back to her own country. Henry's situation seemed at that time very critical. After the ten years' truce concluded between the emperor and the king of France, a good understanding was thought to have taken place between these rival monarchs, and such marks of union appeared as gave great jealousy to the court of England. The emperor, who knew the generous nature of Francis, even put a confidence in him which is rare to that degree among great princes. An insurrection had been raised in the low countries by the inhabitants of Ghent, and seemed to threaten the most dangerous consequences. Charles, who resided at that time in Spain, resolved to go in person to Flanders, in order to appease these disorders, but he found great difficulties in choosing the manner of his passing thither. The road by Italy and Germany was tedious, the voyage through the Channel dangerous by reason of the English naval power. He asked Francis's permission to pass through his dominions, and he entrusted himself into the hands of a rival, whom he had so mortally offended. The French monarch received him at Paris with great magnificence and courtesy, and though prompted both by revenge and interest, as well as by the advice of his mistress and favourites to make advantage of the present opportunity, he conducted the emperor safely out of his dominions, and would not so much as speak to him of business during his abode in France, lest his demands should bear the air of violence upon his royal guest. Henry, who was informed of all these particulars, believed that an entire and cordial union had taken place between these princes, and that their religious zeal might prompt them to fall with combined arms upon England. An alliance with the German princes seemed now more than ever requisite for his interest and safety, and he knew that if he sent back the Princess of Cleves, such an affront would be highly resented by her friends and family. He was therefore resolved, notwithstanding his aversion to her, to complete the marriage, and he told Cromwell that since matters had gone so far, he must put his neck into the yoke. Cromwell, who knew how much his own interests were concerned in this affair, 
was very anxious to learn from the king, next morning after the marriage, whether he now liked his spouse any better. The king told him that he hated her worse than ever, and that her person was more disgusting on a near approach. He was resolved never to meddle with her, and even suspected her not to be a true maid, a point about which he entertained an extreme delicacy. He continued, however, to be civil to Anne. He even seemed to repose his usual confidence in Cromwell. But though he exerted this command over himself, a discontent lay lurking in his breast, and was ready to burst out on the first opportunity. A session of Parliament was held, and none of the abbots were now allowed a place in the House of Peers. The king, by the mouth of the Chancellor, complained to the Parliament of the great diversity of religions which still prevailed among his subjects. A grievance, he affirmed, which ought the less to be endured, because the scriptures were now published in English, and ought universally to be the standard of belief to all mankind. But he had appointed, he said, some bishops and divines to draw up a list of tenets to which his people were to assent, and he was determined that Christ, the doctrine of Christ, and the truth should have the victory. The king seems to have expected more effect in ascertaining truth from this new book of his doctors than had ensued from the publication of the scriptures. Cromwell, as vicar-general, made also in the king's name a speech to the upper house, and the peers, in return, bestowed great flattery on him, and in particular said that he was worthy by his desert to be vicar-general of the universe. That minister seemed to be no less in his master's good graces. He received, soon after the sitting of the Parliament, the title of Earl of Essex, and was installed Knight of the Garter. There remained only one religious order in England, the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem, or the Knights of Malta, as they are commonly called. This order, partly ecclesiastical, partly military, had by their valour done great service to Christendom, and had very much retarded at Jerusalem, Rhodes, and Malta the rapid progress of the barbarians. During the general surrender of the religious houses in England, they had exerted their spirit, and had obstinately refused to yield up their revenues to the king. And Henry, who would endure no society that professed obedience to the Pope, was obliged to have recourse to Parliament for the dissolution of this order. Their revenues were large, and formed an addition nowise contemptible to the many acquisitions which the king had already made. But he had very ill husbanded the great revenue acquired by the plunder of the church. His profuse generosity dissipated faster than his rapacity could supply and the Parliament was surprised this session to find a demand made upon them of four-tenths, and a subsidy of one shilling in the pound during two years. So ill were the public expectations answered, that the Crown was never more to require any supply from the people. The Commons, though lavish of their liberty, and of the blood of their fellow-subjects, were extremely frugal of their money and it was not without difficulty so small a grant could be obtained by this absolute and dreaded monarch. The pretext for these grants was the great expense which Henry had undergone for the defence of the realm, in building forts along the sea-coast, and in equipping a navy. As he had at present no ally on the continent in whom he reposed much confidence, he relied only on his domestic strength, and was on that account obliged to be more expensive in his preparations against the danger of an invasion. The king's favour to Cromwell and his acquiescence in the marriage with Anne of Cleves were both of them deceitful appearances. 
His aversion to the queen secretly increased every day, and having at last broken all restraint, it prompted him at once to seek the dissolution of a marriage so odious to him, and to involve his minister in ruin, who had been the innocent author of it. The fall of Cromwell was hastened by other causes. All the nobility hated a man who, being of such low extraction, had not only mounted above them by his station of vicar-general, but had engrossed many of the other considerable offices of the crown, besides enjoying that commission which gave him a high and most absolute authority over the clergy, and even over the laity. He was privy seal, chamberlain, and master of the wards. He had also obtained the order of the garter, a dignity which had ever been conferred only on men of illustrious families, and which seemed to be profaned by its being communicated to so mean a person. The people were averse to him as the supposed author of the violence on the monasteries, establishments which were still revered and beloved by the commonality. The Catholics regarded him as the concealed enemy of their religion. The Protestants, observing his exterior concurrence with all the persecutions exercised against them, were inclined to bear him as little favor, and reproached him with the timidity, if not treachery, of his conduct. And the king, who found that great clamors had on all hands arisen against the administration, was not displeased to throw on Cromwell the load of public hatred, and he hoped by making so easy a sacrifice to regain the affections of his subjects. But there was another cause which suddenly set all these motives in action, and brought about an unexpected revolution in the ministry. The king had fixed his affection on Catherine Howard, niece to the Duke of Norfolk, and being determined to gratify this new passion, he could find no expedient but by procuring a divorce from his present consort, to raise Catherine to his bed and throne. The duke, who had long been engaged in enmity with Cromwell, made the same use of her insinuations to ruin this minister that he had formerly done of Anne Boleyn's against Wolsey. And when all engines were prepared, he obtained a commission from the king to arrest Cromwell at the council table on an accusation of high treason, and to commit him to the tower. Immediately after, a bill of attainder was framed against him, and the House of Peers thought proper, without trial, examination, or evidence, to condemn to death a man whom a few days before they had declared worthy to be vicar-general of the universe. The House of Commons passed the bill, though not without some opposition. Cromwell was accused of heresy and treason, but the proofs of his treasonable practices are utterly improbable, and even absolutely ridiculous. The only circumstance of his conduct by which he seems to have merited this fate was his being the instrument of the king's tyranny in conducting like iniquitous bills in the preceding session against the Countess of Salisbury and others. Cromwell endeavoured to soften the king by the most humble supplications, but all to no purpose. It was not the practice of that prince to ruin his ministers and favourites by halves. And though the unhappy prisoner once wrote to him in so moving a strain as even to draw tears from his eyes, he hardened himself against all movements of pity and refused his pardon. The conclusion of Cromwell's letter ran in these words. I, a most woeful prisoner, am ready to submit to death when it shall please God and your majesty. And yet the frail flesh incites me to call to your grace for mercy and pardon of mine offences. Written at the tower with the heavy heart and trembling hand of your highness's most miserable prisoner, and poor slave Thomas Cromwell, and a little below, 
Most gracious prince, I cry for mercy, mercy, mercy. When brought to the place of execution, he avoided all earnest protestations of his innocence, and all complaints against the sentence pronounced upon him. He knew that Henry would resent on his son those symptoms of opposition to his will, and that his death alone would not terminate that monarch's vengeance. He was a man of prudence, industry, and abilities, worthy of a better master and of a better fate. Though raised to the summit of power from a low origin, he betrayed no insolence or contempt towards his inferiors, and he was careful to remember all the obligations which, during his more humble fortune, he had owed to any one. He had served as a private sentinel in the Italian wars, when he received some good offices from a Lucchese merchant, who had entirely forgotten his person, as well as the service which he had rendered him. Cromwell, in his grandeur, happened at London to cast his eye on his benefactor, now reduced to poverty by misfortunes. He immediately sent for him, reminded him of their ancient friendship, and by his grateful assistance reinstated him in his former prosperity and opulence. The measures for divorcing Henry from Anne of Cleves were carried on at the same time with the bill of attainder against Cromwell. The House of Peers, in conjunction with the Commons, applied to the King by petition, desiring that he would allow his marriage to be examined, and orders were immediately given to lay the matter before the convocation. Anne had formerly been contracted by her father to the Duke of Lorraine, but she, as well as the Duke, were at that time under age, and the contract had been afterwards annulled by consent of both parties. The king, however, pleaded this pre-contract as a ground of divorce, and he added two reasons more, which may seem a little extraordinary, that when he espoused Anne he had not inwardly given his consent, and that he had not thought proper to consummate the marriage. The convocation was satisfied with these reasons, and solemnly annulled the marriage between the king and queen. The Parliament ratified the decision of the clergy, and the sentence was soon after notified to the princess. Anne was blessed with a happy insensibility of temper, ever in the points which the most nearly affected her sex, and the king's aversion towards her, as well as his prosecution of the divorce, had never given her the least uneasiness. She willingly hearkened to terms of accommodation with him, and when he offered to adopt her as his sister, to give her place next to the queen and his own daughter, and to make a settlement of three thousand pounds a year upon her, she accepted of the conditions, and gave her consent to the divorce. She even wrote to her brother, for her father was now dead, that she had been very well used in England, and desired him to live on good terms with the king. The only instance of pride which she betrayed was that she refused to return to her own country after the affront which she had received, and she lived and died in England. Notwithstanding Anne's moderation, this incident produced a great coldness between the king and the German princes, but as the situation of Europe was now much altered, Henry was the more indifferent about their resentment. The close intimacy which had taken place between Francis and Charles had subsisted during a very short time. The dissimilarity of their characters soon renewed, with greater violence than ever, their former jealousy and hatred. While Charles remained at Paris, Francis had been imprudently engaged by his open temper and by that satisfaction which a noble mind naturally feels in performing generous actions, to make in confidence some dangerous discoveries to that interested monarch. And having now lost all suspicion of his rival, he hoped that the emperor and he, supporting each other, 
might neglect every other alliance. He not only communicated to his guest the state of his negotiations with Sultan Soliman and the Venetians, he also laid open the solicitations which he had received from the court of England to enter into a confederacy against him. Charles had no sooner reached his own dominions than he showed himself unworthy of the friendly reception which he had met with. He absolutely refused to fulfil his promise, and put the Duke of Orleans in possession of the Milanese. He informed Solomon and the Senate of Venice of the treatment which they had received from their ally, and he took care that Henry should not be ignorant how readily Francis had abandoned his ancient friend, to whom he owed such important obligations, and had sacrificed him to a new confederate. He even poisoned and misrepresented many things which the unsuspecting heart of the French monarch had disclosed to him. Had Henry possessed true judgment and generosity, this incident alone had been sufficient to guide him in the choice of his ally. But his domineering pride carried him immediately to renounce the friendship of Francis, who had so unexpectedly given the preference to the emperor. And as Charles invited him to a renewal of ancient amity, he willingly accepted of the offer, and thinking himself secure in this alliance, he neglected the friendship both of France and of the German princes. The new turn which Henry had taken with regard to foreign affairs was extremely agreeable to his Catholic subjects, and as it had perhaps contributed, among other reasons, to the ruin of Cromwell, it made them entertain hopes of a final prevalence over their antagonists. The marriage of the king with Catherine Howard, which followed soon after his divorce from Anne of Cleves, was also regarded as a favourable incident to their party, and the subsequent events corresponded to their expectations. The king's counsels being now directed by Norfolk and Gardiner, a furious persecution commenced against the Protestants, and the law of the six articles was executed with rigour. Dr. Barnes, who had been the cause of Lambert's execution, felt in his turn the severity of the persecuting spirit, and, by a bill which passed in Parliament, he was, without trial, condemned to the flames, together with Jerome and Gerard. He discussed theological questions even at the stake, and as the dispute between him and the sheriff turned upon the invocation of saints, he said that he doubted whether the saints could pray for us, but if they could, he hoped in half an hour to be praying for the sheriff and all the spectators. He next entreated the sheriff to carry to the king his dying request, which he fondly imagined would have authority with that monarch who had sent him to the stake. The purport of his request was that Henry, besides repressing superstitious ceremonies, should be extremely vigilant in preventing fornication and common swearing. End of section 29, chapter 32, part 2. Section 30 of Volume 1C of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume, Volume 1C, Section 30, Chapter 32, Part 3. While Henry was exerting this violence against the Protestants, he spared not the Catholics who denied his supremacy, and a foreigner at that time in England had reason to say that those who were against the Pope were burned, and those who were for him were hanged. The king even displayed in an ostentatious manner this tyrannical impartiality, which reduced both parties to subjection, 
and infused terror into every breast. Barnes, Gerard, and Jerome had been carried to the place of execution on three hurdles, and along with them was placed on each hurdle a Catholic, who was also executed for his religion. These Catholics were Abel, Featherstone, and Powell, who declared that the most grievous part of their punishment was the being coupled to such heretical miscreants as suffered with them. Though the spirit of the English seemed to be totally sunk under the despotic power of Henry, there appeared some symptoms of discontent. An inconsiderable rebellion broke out in Yorkshire, headed by Sir John Neville, but it was soon suppressed, and Neville, with other ringleaders, was executed. The rebels were supposed to have been instigated by the intrigues of Cardinal Pole, and the king was instantly determined to make the Countess of Salisbury, who already lay under sentence of death, suffer for her son's offences. He ordered her to be carried to execution, and this venerable matron maintained still in these distressful circumstances, the spirit of that long race of monarchs from whom she was descended. She refused to lay her head on the block, or submit to a sentence where she had received no trial. She told the executioner that if he would have her head, he must win it the best way he could, and thus, shaking her venerable grey locks, she ran about the scaffold, and the executioner followed with his axe, aiming many fruitless blows at her neck before he was able to give the fatal stroke. Thus perished the last of the line of Plantagenet, which, with great glory but still greater crimes and misfortunes, had governed England for the space of three hundred years. Lord Leonard Grey, a man who had formerly rendered service to the crown, was also beheaded for treason soon after the Countess of Salisbury. We know little concerning the grounds of his prosecution. The insurrection in the north engaged Henry to make a progress thither, in order to quiet the minds of his people, to reconcile them to his government, and to abolish the ancient superstitions to which those parts were much addicted, he had also another motive for this journey. He purposed to have a conference at York with his nephew the King of Scotland, and if possible to cement a close and indissoluble union with that kingdom. The same spirit of religious innovation which had seized other parts of Europe had made its way into Scotland, and had begun before this period to excite the same jealousies fears and persecutions. About the year 1527, Patrick Hamilton, a young man of a noble family, having been created abbot of Fiene, was sent abroad for his education, but had fallen into company with some reformers, and he returned into his own country very ill disposed towards that church, on which his birth and his merit entitled him to attain the highest dignities. The fervour of youth and his zeal for novelty made it impossible for him to conceal his sentiments, and Campbell, prior of the Dominicans, who under colour of friendship and a sympathy in opinion, had insinuated himself into his confidence, accused him before beaten Archbishop of St. Andrews. Hamilton was invited to St. Andrews in order to maintain with some of the clergy a dispute concerning the controverted points, and after much reasoning with regard to justification, free will, original sin, and other topics of that nature, the conference ended with their condemning Hamilton to be burned for his errors. The young man, who had been deaf to the insinuations of ambition, was less likely to be shaken with the fears of death, while he proposed to himself both the glory of bearing testimony to the truth and the immediate reward attending his martyrdom. The people, who compassioned his youth, his virtue, 
and his noble birth, were much moved at the constancy of his end, and an incident which soon followed still more confirmed them in their favourable sentiments towards him. He had cited Campbell, who still insulted him at the stake, to answer before the judgment seat of Christ, and as that persecutor, either astonished with these events, or overcome with remorse, or perhaps seized casually with a distemper, soon after lost his senses, and fell into a fever of which he died, the people regarded Hamilton as a prophet, as well as a martyr. Among the disciples converted by Hamilton was one friar Forrest, who became a zealous preacher, and who, though he did not openly discover his sentiments, was suspected to lean towards the new opinions. His diocesan, the Bishop of Dunkel, enjoined him when he met with a good epistle or good gospel, which favoured the liberties of Holy Church, to preach on it and let the rest alone. Forrest replied that he had read both Old and New Testament, and had not found an ill epistle or ill gospel in any part of them. The extreme attachment to the scriptures was regarded in those days as a sure characteristic of heresy, and Forrest was soon after brought to trial and condemned to the flames. While the priests were deliberating on the place of his execution, a bystander advised them to burn him in a cellar, for that the smoke of Mr. Patrick Hamilton had infected all those on whom it blew. The clergy were at that time reduced to great difficulties, not only in Scotland but all over Europe, as the reformers aimed at a total subversion of ancient establishments, which they represented as idolatrous, impious, detestable. The priests, who found both their honours and properties at stake, thought that they had a right to resist by every expedient these dangerous invaders, and that the same simple principles of equity which justified a man in killing a pirate or a robber, would acquit them for the execution of such heretics. A toleration, though it is never acceptable to ecclesiastics, might, they said, be admitted in other cases, but seemed an absurdity where fundamentals were shaken, and where the possessions and even the existence of the established clergy were brought in danger. But though the church was thus carried by policy as well as inclination to kindle the fires of persecution, they found the success of this remedy very precarious, and observed that the enthusiastic zeal of the reformers, inflamed by punishment, was apt to prove contagious on the compassionate minds of the spectators. The new doctrine, amidst all the dangers to which it was exposed, secretly spread itself everywhere, and the minds of men were gradually disposed to a revolution in religion. But the most dangerous symptom for the clergy in Scotland was, that the nobility from the example of England had cast a wishful eye on the church revenues, and hoped, if a reformation took place, to enrich themselves by the plunder of the ecclesiastics. James himself, who was very poor, and was somewhat inclined to magnificence, particularly in building, had been swayed by like motives, and began to threaten the clergy with the same fate that had attended them in the neighbouring country. Henry also never ceased exhorting his nephew to imitate his example, and being moved, both by the pride of making proselytes, and the prospect of security, should Scotland embrace a close union with him, he solicited the King of Scots to meet him at York, and he obtained a promise to that purpose. The ecclesiastics were alarmed at this resolution of James, and they employed every expedient in order to prevent the execution of it. They represented the danger of innovation, the pernicious consequences of aggrandizing the nobility already too powerful, 
the hazard of putting himself into the hands of the English, his hereditary enemies, the dependence on them which must ensue upon his losing the friendship of France, and of all foreign powers. To these considerations they added the prospect of immediate interest by which they found the king to be much governed. They offered him a present gratuity of fifty thousand pounds. They promised him that the church should always be ready to contribute to his supply, and they pointed out to him the confiscation of heretics as the means of filling his exchequer, and of adding a hundred thousand pounds a year to the crown revenues. The insinuations of his new queen, to whom youth, beauty, and address had given a powerful influence over him, seconded all these reasons, and James was at last engaged, first to delay his journey, then to send excuses to the King of England, who had already come to York in order to be present at the interview. Henry, vexed with the disappointment and enraged at the affront, vowed vengeance against his nephew, and he began, by permitting piracies at sea and incursions at land, to put his threats in execution. But he received soon after in his own family an affront to which he was much more sensible, and which touched him in a point where he always showed an extreme delicacy. He had thought himself very happy in his new marriage. The agreeable person and disposition of Catherine had entirely captivated his affections, and he made no secret of his devoted attachment to her. He had even publicly, in his chapel, returned solemn thanks to heaven for the felicity which the conjugal state afforded him, and he directed the Bishop of Lincoln to compose a form of prayer for that purpose. But the Queen's conduct very little merited this tenderness. One Lascelles brought intelligence of her dissolute life to Cranmer, and told him that his sister, formerly a servant in the family of the old Duchess of Norfolk, with whom Catherine was educated, had given him a particular account of her licentious manners. Derham and Manock, both of them servants to the Duchess, had been admitted to her bed, and she had even taken little care to conceal her shame from the other servants of the family. The primate, struck with this intelligence which it was equally dangerous to conceal or to discover, communicated the matter to the Earl of Hertford and to the Chancellor. They agreed that the matter should by no means be buried in silence, and the Archbishop himself seemed the most proper person to disclose it to the King. Cranmer, unwilling to speak on so delicate a subject, wrote a narrative of the whole and conveyed it to Henry, who was infinitely astonished at the intelligence. So confident was he of the fidelity of his consort, that at first he gave no credit to the information, and he said to the privy seal, to Lord Russell, High Admiral, Sir Anthony Brown, and Riothersley, that he regarded the whole as a falsehood. Cranmer was now in a very perilous situation, and had not full proof been found, certain and inevitable destruction hung over him. The king's impatience, however, and jealousy prompted him to search the matter to the bottom. The privy seal was ordered to examine Lascelles, who persisted in the information he had given, and still appealed to his sister's testimony. That nobleman next made a journey under pretense of hunting, and went to Sussex, where the woman at that time resided. He found her both constant in her former intelligence, and particular as to the facts, and the whole bore but too much the face of probability. Manock and Derham, who were arrested at the same time and examined by the Chancellor, made the Queen's guilt entirely certain by their confession, and discovered other particulars which redounded still more to her dishonour. 
three maids of the family were admitted into her secrets and some of them had even passed the night in bed with her and her lovers all the examinations were laid before the king who was so deeply affected that he remained a long time speechless and at last burst into tears he found to his surprise that his great skill in distinguishing a true maid of which he boasted in the case of anne of cleves had failed him in that of his present consort the queen being next questioned denied her guilt but when informed that a full discovery was made she confessed that she had been criminal before marriage and only insisted that she had never been false to the king's bed but as there was evidence that one culpepper had passed the night with her alone since her marriage and as it appeared that she had taken derham her old paramour into her service she seemed to deserve little credit in this asseveration and the king besides was not of a humour to make any difference between these degrees of guilt henry found that he could not by any means so fully or expeditiously satiate his vengeance on all these criminals as by assembling a parliament the usual instrument of his tyranny the two houses having received the queen's confession made an address to the king they entreated him not to be vexed with this untoward accident to which all men were subject but to consider the frailty of human nature and the mutability of human affairs and from these views to derive a subject of consolation they desired leave to pass a bill of attainder against the queen and her accomplices and they begged him to give his assent to this bill not in person which would renew his vexation and might endanger his health but by commissioners appointed for that purpose and as there was a law in force making it treason to speak ill of the queen as well as of the king they craved his royal pardon if any of them should on the present occasion have transgressed any part of the statute having obtained a gracious answer to these requests the parliament proceeded to vote a bill of attainder for treason against the queen and the viscountess of rochford who had conducted her secret amours and in this bill culpepper and derham were also comprehended at the same time they passed a bill of attainder for miss prisian of treason against the old duchess of norfolk catherine's grandmother her uncle lord william howard and his lady together with the countess of bridgewater and nine persons more because they knew the queen's vicious course of life before her marriage and had concealed it this was an effect of henry's usual extravagance to expect that parents should so far forget the ties of natural affection and the sentiments of shame and decency as to reveal to him the most secret disorders of their family he himself seems to have been sensible of the cruelty of this proceeding for he pardoned the duchess of norfolk and most of the others condemned for misprision of treason however to secure himself for the future as well as his successors from this fatal accident he engaged the parliament to pass a law somewhat extraordinary it was enacted that any one who knew or vehemently suspected any guilt in the queen might within twenty days disclose it to the king or council without incurring the penalty of any former law against defaming the queen but prohibiting every one at the same time from spreading the matter abroad or even privately whispering it to others it was also enacted that if the king married any woman who had been incontinent taking her for a true maid she should be guilty of treason if she did not previously reveal her guilt to him 
The people made merry with this singular clause, and said that the king must henceforth look out for a widow, for no reputed maid would ever be persuaded to incur the penalty of the state. After all these laws were passed, the queen was beheaded on Tower Hill, together with Lady Rochford. They behaved in a manner suitable to their dissolute life. And as Lady Rochford was known to be the chief instrument in bringing Anne Boleyn to her end, she died unpitied, and men were further confirmed by the discovery of this woman's guilt in the favourable sentiments which they had entertained of that unfortunate queen. The king made no demand of any subsidy from this parliament, but he found means of enriching his exchequer from another quarter. He took further steps towards the dissolution of colleges, hospitals, and other foundations of that nature. The courtiers had been practising on the presidents and governors to make a surrender of their revenues to the king, and they had been successful with eight of them. But there was an obstacle to their further progress. It had been provided by the local statutes of most of these foundations, that no president or any number of fellows could consent to such a deed without the unanimous vote of all the fellows, and this vote was not easily obtained. All such statutes were annulled by Parliament, and the revenues of these houses were now exposed to the rapacity of the king and his favourites. The church had been so long their prey that nobody was surprised at any new inroads made upon her, from the regular, Henry now proceeded to make devastations on the secular clergy. He extorted from many of the bishops a surrender of chapter lands, and by this device he pillaged the sees of Canterbury, York, and London, and enriched his greedy parasites and flatterers with their spoils. The clergy have been commonly so fortunate as to make a concern for their temporal interests go hand in hand with the jealousy for orthodoxy, and both these passions be regarded by the people, ignorant and superstitious, as proofs of zeal for religion. But the violent and headstrong character of Henry now disjoined these objects. His rapacity was gratified by plundering the church, his bigotry and arrogance, by persecuting heretics. Though he engaged the Parliament to mitigate the penalties of the six articles, so far as regards the marriage of priests, which was now only subjected to a forfeiture of goods, chattels, and lands during life, he was still equally bent on maintaining a rigid purity in speculative principles. He had appointed a commission consisting of the two archbishops and several bishops of both provinces, together with a considerable number of doctors of divinity, and by virtue of his ecclesiastical supremacy, he had given them in charge to choose a religion for his people. Before the commissioners had made any progress in this arduous undertaking, the Parliament in 1541 had passed a law by which they ratified all the tenets which these divines should thereafter establish with the king's consent. And they were not ashamed of thus expressly declaring that they took their religion upon trust, and had no other rule in spiritual as well as temporal concerns than the arbitrary will of their master. There is only one clause of the statute which may seem at first sight to savour somewhat of the spirit of liberty. It was enacted that the ecclesiastical commissioners should establish nothing repugnant to the laws and statutes of the realm. But in reality this proviso was inserted by the king to serve his own purposes. By introducing a confusion and contradiction into the laws, he became more master of every one's life and property. And as the ancient independence of the church still gave him jealousy, he was well pleased, under cover of such a clause, to introduce appeals from the spiritual to the civil courts. 
it was for a like reason that he would never promulgate a body of canon law and he encouraged the judges on all occasions to interpose in ecclesiastical causes wherever they thought the law of royal prerogative concerned a happy innovation though at first invented for arbitrary purposes the king armed by the authority of parliament or rather by their acknowledgment of that spiritual supremacy which he believed inherent in him employed his commissioners to select a system of tenets for the assent and belief of the nation a small volume was soon after published called the institution of a christian man which was received by the convocation and voted to be the standard of orthodoxy all the delicate points of justification faith free will good works and grace are there defined with a leaning towards the opinion of the reformers. The sacraments, which a few years before were only allowed to be three, were now increased to the number of seven, conformable to the sentiments of the Catholics. The king's caprice is discernible throughout the whole, and the book is in reality to be regarded as his composition. For Henry, while he made his opinion a rule for the nation, would tie his hands by no canon or authority, not even by any which he himself had formerly established. The people had occasion soon after to see a further instance of the king's inconstancy. He was not long satisfied with his institution of a Christian man he ordered a new book to be composed, called The Erudition of a Christian Man, and without asking the assent of the convocation, he published by his own authority and that of Parliament this new model of orthodoxy. It differs from the institution, but the king was no less positive in his new creed than he had been in the old, and he required the belief of the nation to veer about at his signal in both these compositions he was particularly careful to inculcate the doctrine of passive obedience and he was equally careful to retain the nation in the practice while the king was spreading his own books among the people he seems to have been extremely perplexed as were also the clergy what course to take with the scriptures a review had been made by the synod of the new translation of the bible and gardiner had proposed that instead of employing english expressions throughout several latin words should still be preserved because they contained as he pretended such peculiar energy and significance that they had no correspondent terms in the vulgar tongue among these were Ecclesia, Poenitentia, Pontiflex, Contritus, Holocausta, Sacramentum, Elementa, Ceremonia, Mysterium, Presbyter, Sacrificium, Humilitas Satisfactio, Peccatum, Gratia, Hostia, Charitos, etc., but as this mixture would have appeared extremely barbarous, and was plainly calculated for no other purpose than to retain the people in their ancient ignorance, the proposal was rejected. The knowledge of the people, however, at least their disputative turn, seemed to be an inconvenience still more dangerous, and the king and parliament soon after the publication of the scriptures retracted the concession which they had formerly made and prohibited all but gentlemen and merchants from perusing them even that liberty was not granted without an apparent hesitation and a dread of the consequences these persons were allowed to read so it be done quietly and with good order and the preamble to the Acts sets forth that many seditious and ignorant persons had abused the liberty granted them of reading the Bible, 
and that great diversity of opinion, animosities, tumults, and schisms had been occasioned by perverting the sense of the scriptures. It seemed very difficult to reconcile the king's model for uniformity with the permission of free inquiry. The mass book also passed under the king's revisal, and little alteration was as yet made in it. Some doubtful or fictitious saints only were struck out, and the name of the Pope was erased. This latter precaution was likewise used with regard to every new book that was printed, or even old book that was sold. The word Pope was carefully omitted or blotted out, as if that precaution could abolish the term from the language, or as if such a persecution of it did not rather imprint it more strongly in the memory of the people. The king took care about this time to clear the churches from another abuse which had crept into them. Plays, interludes, and farces were there often acted in derision of the former superstitions, and the reverence of the multitude for ancient principles and modes of worship was thereby gradually effaced. We do not hear that the Catholics attempted to retaliate by employing this powerful engine against their adversaries, or endeavoured by the like arts to expose that fanatical spirit by which it appears the reformers were frequently actuated. Perhaps the people were not disposed to relish a jest on that side. Perhaps the greater simplicity and the more spiritual abstract worship of the Protestants gave less hold to ridicule, which is commonly founded on sensible representations. It was, therefore, a very agreeable concession which the king made to the Catholic party to suppress entirely these religious comedies. Thus Henry laboured incessantly by arguments, creeds, and penal statutes to bring his subjects to a uniformity in their religious sentiments. But as he entered himself with the greatest earnestness into all these scholastic disputes, he encouraged the people by his example to apply themselves to the study of theology, and it was in vain afterwards to expect however present fear might restrain their tongues or pens, that they would cordially agree in any set of tenets or opinions prescribed to them. End of section 30, chapter 32, part 3. Section 31 of Volume 1C of History of England, From the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I'm Drew Nelson. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1C, Section 31, Chapter 33, Part 1. Henry VIII. Henry, being determined to avenge himself on the King of Scots for slighting the advances which he had made him, would gladly have obtained a supply from Parliament in order to prosecute that enterprise but as he did not think it prudent to discover his intentions, that assembly, conformably to their frugal maxims, would understand no hints, and the king was disappointed in his expectations. He continued, however, to make preparations for war, and as soon as he thought himself in a condition to invade Scotland, he published a manifesto by which he endeavored to justify hostilities, he complained of James's breach of word in declining the promised interview, which was the real ground of the quarrel, but in order to give a more specious coloring to the enterprise, he mentioned other injuries, namely, that his nephew had granted protection to some English rebels and fugitives, and had detained some territory which, Henry pretended, belonged to England. 
he even revived the old claim to the vassalage of Scotland, and he summoned James to do homage to him as his liege, lord, and superior. He employed the Duke of Norfolk, whom he called the Scourge of the Scots, to command in the war, and though James sent the Bishop of Aberdeen and Sir James Learmont of Darcy to appease his uncle, he would hearken to no terms of accommodation. While Norfolk was assembling his army at Newcastle, Sir Robert Bowes, attended by Sir Ralph Sadler, Sir Ralph Evers, Sir Brian Latoon, and others, made an incursion into Scotland, and advanced towards Jedburgh, with an intention of pillaging and destroying that town. The Earl of Angus and George Douglas, his brother, who had been many years banished their country, and had subsisted by Henry's bounty, joined the English army in this incursion, and the forces commanded by Bowes exceeded four thousand men. James had not been negligent in his preparations for defense, and had posted a considerable body under the command of the Earl of Huntley for the protection of the borders. Lord Hume, at the head of his vassals, was hastening to join Huntley when he met with the English army, and an action immediately ensued. And during the engagement, the forces under Huntley began to appear, and the English, afraid of being surrounded and overpowered, took flight and were pursued by the enemy. Evers, Latoon, and some other persons of distinction were taken prisoners. A few of only small note fell in the skirmish. The Duke of Norfolk, meanwhile, began to move from his camp at Newcastle, and being attended by the earls of Shrewsbury, Derby, Cumberland, Surrey, Hertford, Rutland, with many others of the nobility, he advanced to the borders. His forces amounted to above twenty thousand men, and it required the utmost efforts of Scotland to resist such a formidable armament. James had assembled his whole military force at Fala and Sautry, and was ready to advance as soon as he should be informed of Norfolk's invading his kingdom. The English passed the Tweed at Berwick, and marched along the banks of the river as far as Kelso, but hearing that James had collected nearly thirty thousand men, they repassed the river at that village, and retreated into their own country. The King of Scots, inflamed with a desire of military glory, and of revenge on his invaders, gave the signal for pursuing them, and carrying the war into England. He was surprised to find that his nobility, who were in general disaffected on account of the preference which he had given to the clergy, opposed this resolution and refused to attend him in his projected enterprise. Enraged at this mutiny, he reproached them with cowardice and threatened vengeance. But still resolved, with the forces which adhered to him, to make an impression on the enemy, he sent ten thousand men to the western borders, who entered England at Solway Frith, and he himself followed them at a small distance, ready to join them upon occasion. Disgusted, however, at the refractory disposition of his nobles, he sent a message to the army depriving Lord Maxwell, their general, of his commission, and conferring the command on Oliver Sinclair, a private gentleman, who was his favorite. The army was extremely disgusted with this alteration, and was ready to disband when a small body of English appeared, not exceeding five hundred men, under the command of Dacres and Musgrave. A panic seized the Scots, who immediately took to flight, and were pursued by the enemy. Few were killed in this rout, for it was no action, but a great many were taken prisoners, and some of the principal nobility, among these the earls of Cassilis and Glencairn, the lords Maxwell, Fleming, Somerville, Oliphant, Grey, who were all sent to London, and given in custody to different noblemen. The King of Scots, hearing of this disaster, was astonished, and being naturally of a melancholic disposition, as well as endowed with a high spirit, he lost all command of his temper on this dismal occasion. Rage against his nobility, who, he believed, had betrayed him, shame for a defeat by such unequal numbers, regret for the past, fear of the future, all these passions so wrought upon him, 
that he would admit of no consolation, but abandoned himself wholly to despair. His body was wasted by sympathy with his anxious mind, and even his life began to be thought in danger. He had no issue living, and hearing that his queen was safely delivered, he asked whether she had brought him a male or a female child. Being told the latter, he turned himself in his bed. Quote, the crown came with a woman, said he, and it will go with one. Many miseries await this poor kingdom. Henry will make it his own, either by force of arms or by marriage. End quote. A few days after, he expired in the flower of his age, a prince of considerable virtues and talents, well fitted by his vigilance and personal courage, for repressing those disorders to which his kingdom, during that age, was so much exposed. He executed justice with impartiality and rigor, but as he supported the commonality and the church against the rapine of nobility, he escaped not the hatred of that order. The Protestants also, whom he opposed, having endeavored to throw many stains on his memory, but have not been able to fix any considerable imputation upon him. Henry was no sooner informed of his victory and the death of his nephew than he projected, as James had foreseen, the scheme of uniting Scotland to be his own dominions by marrying his son Edward to the heiress of that kingdom. He called together the Scottish nobles who were his prisoners, and after reproaching them, in severe terms, for their pretended breach of treaty, he began to soften his tone, and proposed to them this expedient by which, he hoped, those disorders so prejudicial to both states would for the future be prevented. He offered to bestow on them their liberty without ransom, and only required of them engagements to favor the marriage of the Prince of Wales with their young mistress. They were easily prevailed on to give their assent to a proposal which seemed so natural and advantageous to both kingdoms, and being conducted to Newcastle, they delivered the Duke of Norfolk hostages for their return, in case the intended nuptials were not completed, and they thence proceeded to Scotland, where they found affairs in some confusion. The Pope, observing his authority in Scotland to be in danger from the spreading of the new opinions, had bestowed on Beaton, the primate, the dignity of cardinal, in order to confer more influence upon him, and that prelate had long been regarded as prime minister to James, and as the head of that party which defended the ancient privileges and property of the ecclesiastics. Upon the death of his master, this man, apprehensive of the consequences both to his party and to himself, endeavored to keep possession of power, and for that purpose he is accused of executing a deed which required a high degree of temerity. He forged, it is said, a will for the king, appointing himself and three noblemen more regents of the kingdom during the minority of the infant princess, at least, for historians are not well agreed in the circumstances of the fact, he had read to James a paper of that import, to which that monarch, during the delirium which preceded his death, had given an imperfect assent and approbation. By virtue of this will, Beaton had put himself in possession of the government, and having united his interests with those of the Queen Dowager, he obtained the consent of the Convention of States, and excluded the pretensions of the Earl of Arran. James, Earl of Arran, of the name Hamilton, was next heir to the crown by his grandmother, daughter of James the Third and on that account seemed best entitled to possess that high office into which the cardinal had intruded himself. The prospect also of his succession after a princess who was in such tender infancy procured him many partisans, and though his character indicated little spirit, activity, or ambition, a propensity which he had discovered for the new opinions had attached to him, all the zealous promoters of those innovations. By means of these adherents, joined to the vassals of his own family, he had been able to make opposition to the cardinal's administration, and the suspicion of Beaton's forgery, with the accession of the noblemen who had been prisoners in England, assisted too by some money sent from England, 
was able to turn the balance in his favor. The Earl of Angus and his brother, having taken the present opportunity of returning into their native country, opposed the cardinal with all the credit of that powerful family, and the majority of the convention had now embraced opposite interests to those which formerly prevailed. Iran was declared governor. The cardinal was committed to custody under the care of Lord Seton, and a negotiation was commenced with Sir Ralph Sadler, the English ambassador, for the marriage of the infant queen with the Prince of Wales. The following conditions were quickly agreed on, that the queen should remain in Scotland till she should be ten years of age, that she should then be sent to England to be educated, that six Scottish noblemen should immediately be delivered as hostages to Henry, and that the kingdom, notwithstanding its union with England, should still retain its laws and privileges. By means of these equitable conditions, the war between the nations, which had threatened Scotland with such dismal calamities, seemed to be fully composed and to be changed into perpetual concord and amity. But the cardinal primate, having prevailed on Seton to restore him to his liberty, was able, by his intrigues, to confound all those measures which appeared so well concerted. He assembled the most considerable ecclesiastics, and having represented to them the imminent danger to which their revenues and privileges were exposed, he persuaded them to collect privately from the clergy a large sum of money, by which, if entrusted to his management, he engaged to overturn the schemes of their enemies. Besides the partisans whom he acquired by pecuniary motives, he roused up the zeal of those who were attached to the Catholic worship, and he represented the union with England as the sure forerunner of ruin to the church and to the ancient religion. The nation's antipathy of the Scots to their southern neighbors was also an infallible engine by which the cardinal wrought upon the people, and though the terror of Henry's arms, and their own inability to make resistance, had procured a temporary assent to the alliance and marriage proposed, the settled habits of the nation produced an extreme aversion to those measures. The English ambassador and his retinue received many insults from persons whom the cardinal had instigated to commit those violences, in hopes of bringing on a rupture, but Sadler prudently dissembled the matter, and waited patiently till the day appointed for the delivery of the hostages. He then demanded of the regent the performance of that important article, but received for answer that his authority was very precarious, that the nation had now taken a different impression, and that it was not in his power to compel any of the nobility to deliver themselves as hostages to the English. Sadler, foreseeing the consequences of this refusal, sent a summons to all those who had been prisoners in England, and required them to fulfill the promise which they had given of returning into custody. None of them showed so much sentiment of honor as to fulfill their engagements, except Gilbert Kennedy, Earl of Cassilis. Henry was so well pleased with the behavior of this nobleman, that he not only received him graciously, but honored him with presents, gave him his liberty, and sent him back to Scotland, with his two brothers, whom he had left as hostages. This behavior of the Scottish nobles, though it reflected dishonor on the nation, was not disagreeable to the cardinal, who foresaw that all these persons would now be deeply interested to maintain their enmity and opposition to England. And as a war was soon expected with that kingdom, he found it necessary immediately to apply to France and to crave the assistance of that ancient ally during the present distresses of the Scottish nation. Though the French king was fully sensible of his interests in supporting Scotland, a demand of aid could not have been made on him at a more unseasonable juncture. His pretensions on the Milanese and his resentment against Charles had engaged him in a war with that potentate, and having made great, though fruitless, efforts during the preceding campaign, he was the more disabled at present from defending his own dominions, much more from granting any succor to the Scots. Matthew Stuart, Earl of Lennox, a young nobleman of a great family, was at that time in the French court, 
and Francis being informed that he was engaged in ancient and hereditary enmity with the Hamiltons, who had murdered his father, sent him over to his native country as a support to the cardinal and the queen mother, and he promised that a supply of money, and, if necessary, even military succors, should soon be dispatched after him. Aran, the governor, seeing all these preparations against him, assembled his friends and made an attempt to get the person of the infant queen into his custody, but being repulsed, he was obliged to come to an accommodation with his enemies, and to entrust that precious charge to four neutral persons, the heads of potent families, the Grams, Oreskines, Lindsays, and the Levingstones. The arrival of Lennox, in the midst of these transactions, served to render the victory of the French party over the English still more undisputable. The opposition which Henry met with in Scotland from the French intrigues excited his resentment and further confirmed the resolution which he had already taken of breaking with France and of uniting his arms with those of the Emperor. He had other grounds of complaint against the French king, which, though not of great importance, yet being recent, were able to overbalance those great injuries which he had formerly received from Charles, he pretended that Francis had engaged to imitate his example in separating himself entirely from the See of Rome, and that he had broken his promise in that particular. He was dissatisfied that James, his nephew, had been allowed to marry, first Magdalene of France, then a princess of the House of Guise, and he considered these alliances as pledges which Francis gave of his intentions to support the Scots against the power of England. He had been informed of some railleries which the French king had thrown out against his conduct with regard to his wives. He was disgusted that Francis, after so many obligations which he owed him, had sacrificed him to the emperor, and, in the confidence of friendship, had rashly revealed his secrets to that subtle and interested monarch and he complained that regular payments were never made of the sums due to him by France, and of the pension which had been stipulated. Impelled by all these motives, he alienated himself from his ancient friend and confederate, and formed a league with the emperor, who earnestly courted his alliance. This league, besides stipulations for mutual defense, contained a plan for invading France, and the two monarchs agreed to enter Francis's dominions with an army each of 25,000 men, and to require that prince to pay Henry all the sums which he owed him, and to consign Bologna, Montreal, Terouen, and Ardres as a security for the regular payment of his pension for the future. In case these conditions were rejected, the Confederate princes agreed to challenge for Henry the crown of France, or, in default of it, the duchies of Normandy, Aquitaine, and Guienne, for Charles the duchy of Burgundy, and some other territories. That they might have a pretense for enforcing these claims, they sent a message to Francis requiring him to renounce his alliance with Sultan Soliman, and to make reparations for all the prejudice which Christendom had sustained from that unnatural confederacy. Upon the French king's refusal, war was declared against him by the Allies. It may be proper to remark that the partisans of France objected to Charles's alliance with the heretical King of England, and no less obnoxious than that which Francis had contracted with Soliman. And they observed that this league was a breach of the solemn promise which he had given to Clement the Seventh, never to make peace or alliance with England. While the treaty with the emperor was negotiating, the king summoned a new session of parliament in order to obtain supplies for his projected war with France. The parliament granted him a subsidy, to be paid in three years. It was levied in a peculiar manner, but exceeded not three shillings in the pound upon any individual. End of Section 31, Chapter 33, Part 1 I'm Drew Nelson in Atlanta, Georgia. Recording December 12th and 13th, 2012.
Section 32 of Volume 1C of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I'm Drew Nelson. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1C, Section 32, Chapter 33, Part 2. The convocation gave the king six shillings in the pound to be levied in three years. Greater sums were always, even during the establishment of the Catholic religion, exacted from the clergy than from the laity which made the Emperor Charles say, when Henry dissolved the monasteries and sold their revenues, or bestowed them on his nobility and courtiers, that he had killed the hen which brought him the golden eggs. The Parliament also facilitated the execution of the former law by which the king's proclamations were made equal to statutes. They appointed that any nine councillors should form a legal court for punishing all disobedience to proclamations. The total abolition of juries in criminal causes, as well as on all parliaments, seemed, if the king had so pleased, the necessary consequence of this enormous law. He might issue a proclamation enjoining the execution of any penal statute, and afterwards try the criminals, not for breach of the statute, but for disobedience to his proclamation. It is remarkable that Lord Mountjoy entered a protest against this law, and it is equally remarkable that that protest is the only one entered against any public bill during this whole reign. It was enacted this session that any spiritual person who preached or taught contrary to the doctrine contained in the king's book, the erudition of a Christian man, or contrary to any doctrine which he should thereafter promulgate, was to be admitted on the first conviction to renounce his error. On the second, he was required to carry a faggot, which, if he refused to do, or fell into a third offense, he was to be burnt. But the laity, for the third offense, were only to forfeit their goods and chattels, and be liable to perpetual imprisonment. Indictments must be laid within a year after the offense, and the prisoner was allowed to bring witnesses for his exculpation. These penalties were lighter than those which were formerly imposed on a denial of the real presence. It was, however, subjoined in this statute that the act of the six articles was still in force. But in order to make the king more entirely master of his people, it was enacted that he might hereafter at his pleasure change this act or any provision in it. By this clause, both parties were retained in subjection. So far as regarded religion, the king was invested in the fullest manner with the sole legislative authority in his kingdom, and all his subjects were, under the severest penalties, expressly bound to receive implicitly whatever doctrine he should please to recommend to them. The reformers began to entertain hopes that this great power of the crown might still be employed in their favor. The king married Catherine Parr, widow of Neville, Lord Latimer, a woman of virtue and somewhat inclined to the new doctrine. By this marriage, Henry confirmed what had formerly been foretold in jest, that he would be obligated to espouse a widow. The king's league with the emperor seemed a circumstance no less favorable to the Catholic party, and thus matters remained still nearly balanced between the factions. The advantages gained by this powerful confederacy between Henry and Charles were inconsiderable during the present year. The campaign was opened with a victory gained by the Duke of Cleves, Francis's ally, over the forces of the Emperor. Francis, in person, took the field early and made himself master, without resistance, of the whole Duchy of Luxembourg. 
He afterwards took Landrisi and added some fortifications to it. Charles, having at last assembled a powerful army, appeared in the Low Countries, and after taking almost every fortress in the Duchy of Cleves, he reduced the Duke to accept of the terms which he was pleased to prescribe to him. Being then joined by a body of six thousand English, he sat down before Landrisi and covered the siege with an army of above forty thousand men. Francis advanced at the head of an army not much inferior, as if he intended to give the emperor battle or oblige him to raise the siege. But while these two rival monarchs were facing each other, and all men were in expectation of some great event, the French king found means of throwing succor into Landrisi, and having thus effected his purpose, he skillfully made a retreat. Charles, finding the season far advanced, despaired of success in his enterprise, and found it necessary to go into winter quarters. The vanity of Henry was flattered by the figure which he made in the great transactions on the continent, but the interests of his kingdom were more deeply concerned in the event of affairs in Scotland. Oran, the governor, was of so indolent and unambitious character that, had he not been stimulated by his friend's independence, he never had aspired to any share in the administration. And when he often found himself overpowered by the party of the Queen Dowager, the Cardinal, and the Earl of Lennox, he was glad to accept of any terms of accommodation, however dishonorable. He even gave them a sure pledge of his sincerity by renouncing the principles of the Reformers and reconciling himself to the Romish communion in the Franciscan Church at Stirling. By this weakness and levity, he lost his credit with the whole nation and rendered the Protestants who were hitherto the chief support of his power, his mortal enemies. The cardinal acquired an entire ascendant in the kingdom. The queen dowager placed implicit confidence in him. The governor was obliged to yield to him in every pretension. Lennox alone was become an obstacle to his measures and reduced him to some difficulty. The inveterate enmity which had taken place between the families of Lennox and Iran made the interests of these two noblemen entirely incompatible, and as the cardinal and the French party, in order to engage Lennox the more in their cause, had flattered him with the hopes of succeeding to the crown after their infant sovereign. This rivalship had tended still further to rouse the animosity of the Hamiltons. Lennox, too, had been encouraged to aspire to the marriage of the Queen Dowager, which would have given him some pretensions to the regency and as he was become assuming, on account of the services which he had rendered the party, the cardinal found that, since he must choose between the friendship of Lennox and that of Iran, the latter nobleman, who was more easily governed, and who was invested with present authority, was in every respect preferable. Lennox, finding that he was not likely to succeed in his pretensions to the queen dowager, and that Iran, favored by the cardinal, had acquired the ascendant, retired to Dunbarton, the governor of which was entirely at his devotion. He entered into a secret correspondence with the English court, and he summoned his vassals and partisans to attend him. All those who were inclined to the Protestant religion, or were on any account discontented with the cardinal's administration, now regarded Lennox as the head of their party, and they readily made him a tender of their services. In a little time he had collected an army of ten thousand men, and he threatened his enemies with immediate destruction. The cardinal had no equal force to oppose him, but as he was a prudent man, he foresaw that Lennox could not long subsist so great an army, and he endeavored to gain time by opening a negotiation with him. He seduced his followers by various artifices. He prevailed on the Douglases to change party. He represented to the whole nation the danger of civil wars and commotions, and Lennox, observing the unequal contest in which he was engaged, was at last obliged to lay down his arms and to accept of an accommodation with the governor and the cardinal. 
present peace was restored, but no confidence took place between the parties. Lennox, fortifying his castles and putting himself in a posture of defense, waited the arrival of English succors, from whose assistance alone he expected to obtain the superiority over his enemies. While the winter season restrained Henry from military operations, he summoned a new parliament, in which a law was passed, such as he was pleased to dictate, with regard to the succession of the crown. After declaring that the Prince of Wales, or any of the king's male issue, were first and immediate heirs to the crown, the Parliament restored the two princesses, Mary and Elizabeth, to their right of succession. This seemed a reasonable piece of justice, and corrected what the king's former violence had thrown into confusion. But it was impossible for Henry to do anything, how laudable soever, without betraying, in some circumstance, his usual extravagance and caprice. Though he opened the way for these two princesses to mount the throne, he would not allow the acts to be reversed which had declared them illegitimate. He made the Parliament confer on him a power of still excluding them if they refused to submit to any conditions which he should be pleased to impose, and he required them to enact that, in default of his own issue, he might dispose of the crown as he pleased, by will or letters patent. He did not probably foresee that, in proportion as he degraded the Parliament by rendering it the passive instrument of his variable and violent inclinations, he taught the people to regard all its acts as invalid, and thereby defeated the purposes which he was so bent to attain. An act passed declaring that the king's usual style should be, quote, King of England, France, and Ireland, defender of the faith, and on earth the supreme head of the Church of England and Ireland, end quote. It seemed a palpable inconsistency to retain the title of defender of the faith, which the court of Rome had conferred on him for maintaining its cause against Luther, and yet subjoin his ecclesiastical supremacy in opposition to the claims of that court. An act also passed for the remission of the debt which the king had lately contracted by a general loan levied upon the people. It will easily be believed that after the former act of this kind, the loan was not entirely voluntary but there was a peculiar circumstance attending the present statute, which none but Henry would have thought of, namely, that those who had already gotten payment, either in whole or in part, should refund the money to the exchequer. The oaths which Henry imposed for the security of his ecclesiastical model were not more reasonable than his other measures, all his subjects of any distinction had already been obliged to renounce the Pope's supremacy, but as the clauses to which they swore had not been deemed entirely satisfactory, another oath was imposed, and it was added that all those who had taken the former oaths should be understood to have taken the new one, a strange supposition to represent men as bound by an oath which they had never taken. The most commendable law to which the Parliament gave their sanction was that by which they mitigated the law of the Six Articles, and enacted that no person should be put to his trial upon an accusation concerning any of the offenses comprised in that sanguinary statute, except on the oath of twelve persons before commissioners authorized for the purpose, and that no person should be arrested or committed to ward for any such offense before he was indicted. Any preacher accused of speaking in his sermon contrary to these articles must be indicted within forty days. The king always experienced the limits of his authority whenever he demanded subsidies, however moderate, from the parliament, and therefore not to hazard a refusal, he made no mention this session of a supply, but as his wars, both in France and Scotland, as well as his usual prodigality, had involved him in great expense, he had resource to other methods of filling his exchequer. Notwithstanding the former abolition of his debts, 
he yet required new loans from his subjects, and he enhanced gold from 45 shillings to 48 an ounce, and silver from 3 shillings and 9 pence to 4 shillings. His pretense for this innovation was to prevent the money from being exported, as if that expedient could any wise serve the purpose. He even coined some base money and ordered it to be current by proclamation. He named commissioners for levying a benevolence, and he extorted about 70,000 pounds by this expedience. Reed, alderman of London, a man of somewhat advanced in years, having refused to contribute, or not coming up to the expectation of the commissioners, was enrolled as a foot soldier in the Scottish wars, and was there taken prisoner. Roach, who had been equally refractory, was thrown into prison, and obtained not his liberty, but by paying a large composition. These powers of the prerogative, which at that time passed unquestioned, the compelling of any man to serve in any office, and the imprisoning of any man during pleasure, not to mention the practice of extorting loans, rendered the sovereign in a manner absolute master of person and property of every individual. Early this year, the king sent a fleet and army to invade Scotland. The fleet consisted of near 200 vessels and carried on board 10,000 men. Dudley, Lord Lyle, commanded the sea forces, the Earl of Hertford, the land. The troops were disembarked near Leith, and after dispersing a small body which opposed them, they took that town without resistance, and then marched to Edinburgh. The gates were soon beaten down, for little or no resistance was made, and the English first pillaged, and then set fire to the city. The regent and cardinal were not prepared to oppose so great a force, and they fled to Stirling. Hertford marched eastward, and being joined by a new body under Evers, warden of the east marches, he laid waste to the whole country, burned and destroyed Haddington and Dunbar, then retreated into England, having lost only forty men in the whole expedition. The Earl of Arran collected some forces, but finding that the English were already departed, he turned them against Lennox, who was justly suspected of a correspondence with the enemy. That nobleman, after making some resistance, was obligated to fly into England, where Henry settled a pension on him, and even gave him his niece, Lady Margaret Douglas, in marriage. In return, Lennox stipulated conditions by which, had he been able to execute them, he must have reduced his country to total servitude. Henry's policy was blamed in this sudden and violent incursion, by which he inflamed the passions of the Scots without subduing their spirit, and it was commonly said that he did too much if he intended to solicit an alliance, and too little if he meant a conquest. But the reason of recalling the troops so soon was his eagerness to carry on a projected enterprise against France, in which he intended to employ the whole force of his kingdom. He had concerted a plan with the emperor, which threatened the total ruin of that monarchy, and must, as a necessary consequence, have involved the ruin of England. These two princes had agreed to invade France with forces amounting to above a hundred thousand men. Henry engaged to set out from Calais, Charles from the Low Countries. They were to enter on no siege, but leaving all the frontier towns behind them to march directly to Paris, where they were to join their forces, and thence to proceed to the entire conquest of the kingdom. Francis could not oppose these formidable preparations much above 40,000 men. Henry, having appointed the queen regent during his absence, passed over to Calais with 30,000 men, accompanied by the Dukes of Norfolk and Suffolk, Fitzalan, Earl of Arundel, Vere, Earl of Oxford, the Earl of Surrey, Hollet, Lord St. John, Lord Ferrers of Chartley, Lord Mountjoy, Lord Grey of Wilton, Sir Anthony Brown, Sir Francis Bryan, 
and the most flourishing nobility and gentry of his kingdom. The English army was soon joined by the Count de Buren, Admiral of Flanders, with 10,000 foot and 4,000 horse, and the whole comprised an army which nothing on that frontier was able to resist. The chief force of the French armies was drawn to the side of Champagne in order to oppose the imperialists. The emperor, with an army of near 60,000 men, had taken the field much earlier than Henry, and not to lose the time while he waited for the arrival of his confederate, he sat down before Luxembourg, which was surrendered to him. He thence proceeded to Commercy, on the Meuse, which he took. Ligny met with the same fate. He next laid siege to St. Dissier on the Marne, which, through a weak place, made a brave resistance under the Count of Sancerre, the governor, and the siege was protracted beyond expectation. The emperor was employed before this town at the time the English forces were assembled in Picardy. Henry, either tempted by the defenseless condition of the French frontier, or thinking that the emperor had first broken his engagement by forming sieges, or perhaps foreseeing at last the dangerous consequences of entirely subduing the French power, instead of marching forward to Paris, sat down before Montreal and Bologna. The Duke of Norfolk commanded the army before Montreal, the king himself that before Bologna. Vervin was governor of the latter place, and under him Philip Corse, a brave old soldier who encouraged the garrison to defend themselves to the last extremity against the English. He was killed during the course of the siege, and the town was immediately surrendered to Henry by the cowardice of Vervin, who was afterwards beheaded for this dishonorable capitulation. End of Section 32 Chapter 33 Part 2 I'm Drew Nelson Recording December 7, 2012 In Atlanta, Georgia Section 33 of Volume 1C of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 This is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I'm Drew Nelson. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume, Volume 1C, Section 33, Chapter 33, Part 3. During the course of this siege, Charles had taken St. Dissier, and finding the season much advanced, he began to hearken to treaty of peace with France, since all his schemes for subduing that kingdom were likely to prove abortive. In order to have a pretense for deserting his ally, he sent a messenger to the English camp, requiring Henry immediately to fulfill his engagements, and to meet him with his army before Paris. Henry replied that he was too far engaged in the siege of Bologna to raise it with honor, and that the emperor himself had first broken the concert by besieging St. Dissier. This answer served Charles as a sufficient reason for concluding a peace with Francis at Crepy, where no mention was made of England. He stipulated to give Flanders as a dowry to his daughter, whom he agreed to marry to the Duke of Orleans. Francis's second son, and Francis, in return, withdrew his troops from Piedmont and Savoy, and renounced all claim to Milan, Naples, and other territories in Italy. This peace, so advantageous to Francis, was procured partly by the decisive victory obtained in the beginning of the campaign by the Count of Anguillen over the imperialists at Sarasole in Piedmont partly by the emperor's greatest desire to turn his arms against the Protestant princes in Germany. Charles ordered his troops to separate from the English in Picardy, and Henry, finding himself obliged to raise the siege of Montreal, returned into England. This campaign served to the populace as a matter of great triumph, but all men of sense concluded that the king had, 
as in all his former military enterprises, made, at a great expense, an acquisition which was of no importance. The war with Scotland, meanwhile, was conducted feebly and with various success. Sir Ralph Evers, now Lord Evers, and Sir Brian Latoon made an inroad into that kingdom, and having laid waste to the counties of Tiviotdale and the Merse, they proceeded to the Abbey of Cottingham, which they took possession of and fortified. The governor assembled an army of 8,000 men in order to dislodge them from this post, but he had no sooner opened his batteries before the place than a sudden panic seized him. He left the army and fled to Dunbar. He complained of the mutiny of his troops and pretended apprehensions lest they should deliver him into the hands of the English. But his own unwarlike spirit was generally believed to have been the motive of this dishonorable flight. The Scottish army, upon the departure of their general, fell into confusion, and had not Angus, with a few of his retainers, brought off the cannon and protected their rear, the English might have gained great advantages over them. Evers, elated with this success, boasted to Henry that he had conquered all Scotland to the fourth, and he claimed a reward for this important service. The Duke of Norfolk, who knew with what difficulty such acquisitions would be maintained against a warlike enemy, advised the king to grant him, as his reward, the conquests of which he boasted so highly. The next inroad made by the English showed the vanity of Evers' hopes. This general led about 5,000 men into Tiviotdale and was employed in ravaging that country when intelligence was brought to him that some Scottish forces appeared near the Abbey of Melross. Angus had roused the governor to more activity, and a proclamation being issued for assembling the troops of the neighboring counties. A considerable body had repaired thither to oppose the enemy. Norman Leslie, son of the Earl of Roths, had also joined the army with some volunteers from Fife, and he inspired courage into the whole, as well by this accession of force, as by his personal bravery and intrepidity. In order to bring their troops to the necessity of a steady defense, the Scottish leaders ordered all their cavalry to dismount, and they resolved to wait, on some high grounds near Ancrum, the assault of the English. The English, whose past successes had taught them too much to despise the enemy, thought, when they saw the Scottish horses led off the field, that the whole army was retiring, and they hastened to attack them. The Scots received them in good order, and being favored by the advantage of the ground, as well as by the surprise of the English, who expected no resistance, they soon put them to flight, and pursued them with considerable slaughter. Evers and Latoon were both killed, and above a thousand men were made prisoners. In order to support the Scots in this war, Francis some time after sent over a body of auxiliaries to the number of 3,500 men, under the command of Montgomery, Lord of Lorges. Reinforced by these succors, the governor assembled an army of 15,000 men at Haddington, and marched thence to ravage the east borders of England, he laid all waste wherever he came, and having met with no considerable resistance, he retired into his own country and disbanded his army. The Earl of Hertford, in revenge, committed ravages on the Middle and West marches, and the war on both sides was signalized rather by the ills inflicted on the enemy than by any considerable advantage gained by either party. The war likewise between France and England was not distinguished this year by any memorable event. Francis had equipped a fleet of above two hundred sail, besides galleys, and having embarked some land forces on board, he sent them to make a descent in England. They sailed to the Isle of Wight, where they found the English fleet lying at anchor in St. Helens. It consisted not of above a hundred sail and the admiral thought it most advisable to remain in that road in hopes of drawing the French into the narrow channels and the rocks which were unknown to them. 
The two fleets cannonaded each other for two days, and except the sinking of the Mary Rose, one of the largest ships of the English fleet, the damage on both sides was inconsiderable. Francis's chief intention in equipping so great a fleet was to prevent the English from throwing succors into Bologna, which he resolved to besiege, and for that purpose he ordered a fort to be built, by which he intended to block up the harbor. After a considerable loss of time and money, the fort was found so ill-constructed that he was obliged to abandon it, and though he had assembled on that frontier an army of near forty thousand men, he was not able to effect any considerable enterprise. Henry, in order to defend his possessions in France, had levied fourteen thousand Germans who, having marched into Florines in the bishopric of Liege, found that they could advance no farther. The emperor would not allow them a passage through his dominions. They received intelligence of a superior army on the side of France ready to intercept them. Want of occupation and of pay soon produced a mutiny among them, and having seized the English commissaries as a security for arrears, they retreated into their own country. There seems to have been some want of foresight in this expensive armament. The great expenses of these two wars maintained by Henry obliged him to summon a new parliament. The commons granted him a subsidy, payable in two years of two shillings a pound on land. The spirituality voted him six shillings a pound, but the parliament, apprehensive lest more demands should be made upon them, endeavored to save themselves by a very extraordinary liberality of other people's property. By one vote they bestowed on the king all the revenues of the universities, as well as of the chantries, free chapels, and hospitals. Henry was pleased with this concession, as it increased his power, but he had no intention to rob learning of all her endowments, and he soon took care to inform the universities that he meant not to touch their revenues. Thus these ancient and celebrated establishments owe their existence to the generosity of the king, not to the protection of the servile and prostitute parliament. The prostitute spirit of the Parliament further appeared in the preamble of a statute, in which they recognized the king to have always been, by the word of God, supreme head of the Church of England, and acknowledged that archbishops, bishops, and other ecclesiastical persons have no manner of jurisdiction but by his royal mandate. To him alone, say they, and such persons as he shall appoint, full power and authority is given from above to hear and determine all manner of causes ecclesiastical, and to correct all manner of heresies, errors, vices, and sins whatsoever. No mention is here made of the concurrence of a convocation, or even of a parliament. His proclamations are in effect acknowledged to have not only the force of law, but the authority of revelation, and by his royal power he might regulate the actions of men, control their words, and even direct their inward sentiments and opinions. The king made in person a speech to the Parliament on proroguing them, in which, after thanking them for their loving attachment to him, which, he said, equaled what was ever paid by their ancestors to any king of England, he complained of their dissensions, disputes, and animosities in religion. He told them that the several pulpits were become a kind of batteries against each other, and that one preacher called another heretic an Anabaptist, which was retaliated by the opprobrious appellations of papist and hypocrite, that he had permitted his people the use of the scriptures, not in order to furnish them with materials for disputing and railing, but that he might enable them to inform their consciences and instruct their children and families, that it grieved his heart to find how that precious jewel was prostituted by being introduced into the conversation of every alehouse and tavern, and employed as a pretense for decrying the spiritual and legal pastors, and that he was sorry to observe that the word of God, while it was the object of so much anxious speculation, had very little influence on their practice, and that, though an imaginary knowledge so much abounded, charity was daily going to decay. 
The king gave good advice, but his own example, by encouraging speculation and dispute, was ill-fitted to promote that peaceable submission of opinion which he recommended. Henry employed in military preparations the money granted by Parliament, and he sent over the Earl of Hertford and Lord Lyle, the Admiral, to Calais, with a body of nine thousand men, two-thirds of which consisted of foreigners. Some skirmishes of small moment ensued with the French, and no hopes of any considerable progress could be entertained by either party. Henry, whose animosity against Francis was not violent, had given sufficient vent to his humor by this short war, and, finding that, from his great increase in corpulence and decay in strength, he could not hope for much longer life, he was desirous of ending a quarrel which might provide dangerous to his kingdom during a minority. Francis, likewise on his part, was not averse to peace with England, because, having lately lost his son, the Duke of Orleans, he revived his ancient claim upon Milan, and foresaw that hostilities must soon, on that account, break out between him and the emperor. Commissioners, therefore, having met at Campe, a small place between Ardra and Guine, the articles were soon agreed on, and the peace signed by them. The chief conditions were that Henry should retain Bologna during eight years, or till the former debt due by Francis should be paid. This debt was settled at two millions of livres. Besides a claim of five hundred thousand livres, which was afterwards to be adjusted. Francis took care to comprehend Scotland in the treaty. Thus all that Henry obtained by a war which cost him above one million three hundred and forty thousand pounds sterling was a bad and a chargeable security for a debt, which was not a third of the value. The king, now freed from all foreign wars, had leisure to give his attention to domestic affairs, particularly to the establishment of uniformity in opinion, on which he was so intent. Though he allowed an English translation of the Bible, he had hitherto been very careful to keep the Mass in Latin, but he was at last prevailed on to permit that the litany, a considerable part of the service, should be celebrated in the vulgar tongue, and by this innovation he excited anew the hopes of the reformers, who had been somewhat discouraged by the severe law of the six articles. One petition of the new litany was a prayer to save us, quote, from the tyranny of the bishop of Rome, and from all his detestable enormities, end quote. Cranmer employed his credit to draw Henry into further innovations, and he took advantage of Gardiner's absence, who was sent on an embassy to the emperor. But Gardiner, having written to the king that, if he carried his opposition against the Catholic religion to greater extremities, Charles threatened to break off all commerce with him, the success of Cranmer's projects was for some time retarded. Cranmer lost this year the most sincere and powerful friend that he possessed at court, Charles Brandon, Duke of Suffolk, the Queen Dowager of France, consort to Suffolk, had died some years before. This nobleman is one instance that Henry was not altogether incapable of a cordial and steady friendship, Suffolk seems to have been worthy of the favor which, from his earliest youth, he had enjoyed with his master. The king was sitting in council when informed of Suffolk's death, and he took the opportunity both to express his own sorrow for the loss and to celebrate the merits of the deceased. He declared that during the whole course of their friendship, his brother-in-law had never made one attempt to injure an adversary, and had never whispered a word to the disadvantage of any person. Quote, Is there any of you, my lords, who can say as much? End quote. When the king subjoined these words, he looked around in all their faces, and saw that confusion which the consciousness of secret guilt naturally threw upon them. Cranmer himself, when bereaved of this support, was the more exposed to these cabals, which the opposition in party and religion, joined to the usual motives of interest, rendered so frequent among Henry's ministers and counselors. 
the Catholics took hold of the king by his passion for orthodoxy, and they represented to him that if his laudable zeal for enforcing the truth met with no better success, it was altogether owing to the primate, whose example and encouragement were, in reality, the secret supports of heresy. Henry, seeing the point at which they aimed, feigned compliance, and desired the council to make inquiry into Cranmer's conduct, promising that, if he were found guilty, he should be committed to prison and brought to condign punishment. Everybody now considered the primate as lost, and as his old friends from interested views, as well as the opposite party from animosity, began to show him marks of neglect and disregard, he was obliged to stand several hours among the lackeys at the door of the council chamber before he could be admitted, and when he was at last called in, he was told that they had determined to send him to the tower. Cranmer said that he appealed to the king himself, and finding his appeal disregarded, he produced a ring, which Henry had given him as a pledge of favor and protection. The council were confounded, and when they came before the king, he reproved them in the severest terms, and told them that he was well acquainted with Cranmer's merit, as well as with their malignity and envy, but he was determined to crush all their cabals, and to teach them by the severest discipline, since gentle methods were ineffectual, a more dutiful concurrence in promoting his service. Norfolk, who was Cranmer's capital enemy, apologized for their conduct, and said that their only intention was to set the primate's innocence in a full light by bringing him to an open trial, and Henry obliged them all to embrace him as a sign of their cordial reconciliation. The mild temper of Cranmer rendered this agreement more sincere on his part than is usual in such forced compliances. But though Henry's favor for Cranmer rendered fruitless all accusations against him, his pride and peevishness, irritated by his declining state of health, impelled him to punish with fresh severity all others who presumed to entertain a different opinion from himself, particularly in the capital point of the real presence. And Askew, a young woman of merit as well as beauty, who had great connections with the chief ladies at court and with the queen herself, was accused of dogmatizing on that delicate article, and Henry, instead of showing indulgence to the weakness of her sex and age, was but the more provoked that a woman should dare to oppose his theological sentiments. She was prevailed on by Bonner's menaces to make a seeming recantation, but she qualified it with some reserves, which did not satisfy that zealous prelate. She was thrown into prison, and she there employed herself in composing prayers and discourses by which she fortified her resolution to endure the utmost extremity rather than relinquish her religious principles. She even wrote to the king and told him that as to the Lord's Supper, she believed as much as Christ himself had said of it, and as much of his divine doctrine as the Catholic Church had required, but while she could not be brought to acknowledge an assent to the king's explications, this declaration availed her nothing, and was rather regarded as a fresh insult. The Chancellor Riothesley, who had succeeded oddly, and who was much attached to the Catholic party, was sent to examine her with regard to her patrons at court, and the great ladies who were in correspondence with her, but she maintained a laudable fidelity to her friends and would confess nothing. She was put to the torture in the most barbarous manner and continued still resolute in preserving secrecy. Some authors add an extraordinary circumstance that the chancellor who stood by ordered the lieutenant of the tower to stretch the rack still farther, but that officer refused compliance. The chancellor menaced him, but met with a new refusal upon which that magistrate, who was otherwise a person of merit, but intoxicated with religious zeal, put his own hand to the rack, and drew it so violently that he almost tore her body asunder. Her constancy still surpassed the barbarity of her persecutors, and they found all their efforts to be baffled. She was then condemned to be burned alive, 
and being so dislocated by the rack that she could not stand, she was carried to the stake in a chair. Together with her were conducted Nicholas Belenian, a priest, John Lassels of the king's household, and John Adams, a tailor, who had been condemned for the same crime to the same punishment. They were all tied to the stake, and in that dreadful situation the chancellor sent to inform them that their pardon was ready drawn and signed, and should instantly be given them if they would merit it by a recantation. They only regarded this offer as a new ornament to their crown of martyrdom, and they saw with tranquility the executioner kindle the flames which consumed them. Raya Thessaly did not consider that this public and noted situation interested their honor the more to maintain a steady perseverance. End of Section 33 Chapter 33 Part 3 I'm Drew Nelson in Atlanta, Georgia. Recording December 12, 2012. Section 34 of Volume 1C of History of England, From the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. I'm Drew Nelson. History of England, From the Invasion of Julius Caesar... To the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume, Volume 1C, Section 34, Chapter 33, Part 4. Though the secrecy and fidelity of Anne Askew saved the Queen from this peril, that princess soon after fell into a new danger, from which she narrowly escaped. An ulcer had broken out in the king's leg, which, added to his extreme corpulency and his bad habit of body, began both to threaten his life and to render him even more than usually peevish and passionate. The queen attended him with the most tender and dutiful care, and endeavored by every soothing art and compliance to allay those gusts of humor to which he was become so subject. His favorite topic of conversation was theology, and Catherine, whose good sense enabled her to discourse on any subject, was frequently engaged in the argument, and being secretly inclined to the principles of the reformers, she unwarily betrayed too much of her mind on these occasions. Henry, highly provoked that she should presume to differ from him, complained of her obstinacy to Gardiner who gladly laid hold of the opportunity to inflame the quarrel. He praised the king's anxious concern for preserving the orthodoxy of his subjects, and represented that the more elevated the person was who was chastised, and the more near to his person, the greater terror would the example strike into every one, and the more glorious would the sacrifice appear to posterity." The Chancellor, being consulted, was engaged by religious zeal to second these topics, and Henry, hurried on by his own impetuous temper and encouraged by his counsellors, went so far as to order articles of impeachment to be drawn up against his consort. Raya Thessaly executed his commands, and soon after brought the paper to him to be signed, for, as it was high treason to throw slander upon the Queen, he might otherwise have been questioned for his temerity. By some means this important paper fell into the hands of one of the queen's friends, who immediately carried the intelligence to her. She was sensible of the extreme danger to which she was exposed, but did not despair of being able, by her prudence and address, still to elude the efforts of her enemies. She paid her usual visit to the king, and found him in a more serene disposition than she had reason to expect. He entered on the subject which was so familiar to him, and he seemed to challenge her to an argument in divinity. She gently declined the conversation, and remarked that such profound speculations were ill-suited to the natural imbecility of her sex. Women, she said, by their first creation, were made subject to men. The male was created after the image of God, the female after the image of the male, 
it belonged to the husband to choose principles for his wife. The wife's duty was, in all cases, to adopt implicitly the sentiments of her husband. And as to herself, it was doubly her duty, being blessed with a husband who was qualified by his judgment and learning not only to choose principles for his own family, but for the most wise and knowing of every nation. Quote, not so, by St. Mary, replied the king. You are now become a doctor, Kate, and better fitted to give than receive instruction, end quote. She meekly replied that she was sensible how little she was entitled to these praises, that though she usually declined not any conversation, however sublime, when proposed by his majesty, she well knew that her conceptions could serve no other purpose than to give him a little momentary amusement, that she found the conversation apt to languish when not revived by some opposition, and she had ventured sometimes to feign a contrariety of sentiments in order to give him the pleasure of refuting her, and that she also purposed, by this innocent artifice, to engage him into topics whence she had observed, by frequent experience, that she reaped profit and instruction. Quote, and is it so, sweetheart, replied the king, then are we perfect friends again, end quote. He embraced her with great affection and sent her away with assurances of his protection and kindness. Her enemies, who knew nothing of this sudden change, prepared next day to convey her to the tower pursuant to the king's warrant. Henry and Catherine were conversing amicably in the garden when the chancellor appeared with forty of the pursuivants. The king spoke to him at some distance from her and seemed to expostulate with him in the severest manner. She even overheard the appellations of knave, fool, and beast, which he liberally bestowed on that magistrate, and then ordered him to depart his presence." She afterwards interposed to mitigate his anger. He said to her, quote, Poor soul, you know not how ill-entitled this man is to your good offices, end quote. Thenceforth the queen, having narrowly escaped so great a danger, was careful not to offend Henry's humor by any contradiction, and Gardiner, whose malice had endeavored to widen the breach, could never afterwards regain his favor and good opinion. But Henry's tyrannical disposition, soured by ill health, burst out soon after to the destruction of a man who possessed a much superior rank to that of Gardiner, the Duke of Norfolk and his father during this whole reign, and even a part of the foregoing, had been regarded as the greatest subjects in the kingdom, and had rendered considerable service to the crown. The Duke himself had, in his youth, acquired reputation by naval enterprises, he had much contributed to the victory gained over the Scots at Flouden. He had suppressed a dangerous rebellion in the north, and he had always done his part with honor in all the expeditions against France. Fortune seemed to conspire with his own industry in raising him to the greatest elevation. From the favors heaped on him by the crown, he had acquired an immense estate, the king had successively been married to two of his nieces, and the king's natural son, the Duke of Richmond, had married his daughter. Besides his descent from the ancient family of the Moubrays, by which he was allied to the throne, he had espoused a daughter of the Duke of Buckingham, who was descended by a female from Edward III. And as he was believed still to adhere secretly to the ancient religion, he was regarded both abroad and at home as the head of the Catholic party. But all these circumstances, in proposition as they exalted the duke, provoked the jealousy of Henry, and he foresaw danger during his son's minority, both to the public tranquility and to the new ecclesiastical system from the attempts of so potent a subject." but nothing tended more to expose Norfolk to the king's displeasure than the prejudices by which Henry had entertained against the Earl of Surrey, son of that nobleman. Surrey was a young man of the most promising hopes, and had distinguished himself by every accomplishment which became a scholar, a courtier, and a soldier. He excelled in all the military exercises which were then in request, 
He encouraged the fine arts by his patronage and example. He had made some successful attempts in poetry, and being smitten with the romantic gallantry of the age, he celebrated the praises of his mistress by his pen and his lance, in every mask and tournament. His spirit and ambition were equal to his talents and his quality, and he did not always regulate his conduct by the caution and reserve which his situation required. He had been left governor of Bologna when that town was taken by Henry, but though his personal bravery was unquestioned, he had been unfortunate in some re-encounters with the French. The king, somewhat displeased with his conduct, had sent over Hertford to command in his place, and Surrey was so imprudent as to drop some menacing expressions against the ministers on account of this affront which was put on him. And as he had refused to marry Hertford's daughter, and even waived every other proposal of marriage, Henry imagined that he had entertained views of espousing the Lady Mary, and he was instantly determined to repress, by the most severe expedients, so dangerous an ambition. Actuated by all these motives, and perhaps influenced by that old disgust with which the ill conduct of Catherine Howard had inspired him against her whole family, he gave private orders to arrest Norfolk and Surrey, and they were on the same day confined in the tower. Surrey being a commoner, his trial was the more expeditious, and as to proofs, neither parliaments nor juries seem ever to have given the least attention to them in any cause of the crown during this whole reign. He was accused of entertaining in his family some Italians who were suspected to be spies. A servant of his had paid a visit to Cardinal Pole in Italy, whence he was suspected of holding a correspondence with that obnoxious prelate. He had quartered the arms of Edward the Confessor on his scutcheon, which made him be suspected of aspiring to the crown, though both he and his ancestors had openly, during the course of many years, maintained that practice, and the heralds had even justified it by their authority. These were the crimes for which a jury, notwithstanding his eloquent and spirited defense, condemned the Earl of Surrey for high treason, and their sentence was soon after executed upon him. The innocence of the Duke of Norfolk was still, if possible, more apparent than that of his son, and his services to the crown had been greater. His duchess, with whom he lived on bad terms, had been so base as to carry intelligence to his enemies of all she knew against him. Elizabeth Holland, a mistress of his, had been equally subservient to the designs of the court, Yet, with all these advantages, his accusers discovered no greater crime than his once saying that the king was sickly and could not hold out long, and the kingdom was likely to fall into disorders through the diversity of religious opinions. He wrote a pathetic letter to the king, pleading his past services and protesting his innocence. Soon after, he embraced a more proper expedient for appeasing Henry by making a submission and confession such as his enemies required. But nothing could mollify the unrelenting temper of the king. He assembled a parliament as the surest and most expeditious instrument of his tyranny, and the House of Peers, without examining the prisoner, without trial or evidence, passed a bill of attainder against him and sent it down to the commons. Cranmer, though engaged for many years in an opposite party to Norfolk, and though he had received many and great injuries from him, would have no hand in so unjust a prosecution, and he retired to his seat at Croydon. The kingdom was now approaching fast towards his end, and fearing lest Norfolk should escape him, he sent a message to the commons by which he desired them to hasten the bill, on pretense that Norfolk enjoyed the dignity of Earl Marshal and it was necessary to appoint another who might officiate at the ensuing ceremony of installing his son, Prince of Wales. The obsequious commons obeyed his directions, though founded on so frivolous a pretense, and the king, having affixed the royal assent to the bill by commissioners, issued orders for the execution of Norfolk on the morning of the 29th of January, but news being carried to the tower that the king himself had expired that night, 
the lieutenant deferred obeying the warrant, and it was not thought advisable by the council to begin a new reign by the death of the greatest nobleman in the kingdom who had been condemned by a sentence so unjust and tyrannical. The king's health had long been in a declining state, but for several days all those near him plainly saw his end approaching. He was becoming so froward that no one durst inform him of his condition, and as some persons during this reign had suffered as traitors for foretelling the king's death, everyone was afraid lest, in the transports of his fury, he might on this pretense punish capitally the author of such friendly intelligence. At last Sir Anthony Denny ventured to disclose to him the fatal secret, and exhorted him to prepare for the fate which was awaiting him. He expressed his resignation, and desired that Cramer might be sent for, but before the prelate arrived, he was speechless, though he still seemed to retain his senses. Cranmer desired to give him some sign of his dying in the faith of Christ. He squeezed the prelate's hand, and immediately expired after a reign of thirty-seven years and nine months, and in the fifty-sixth year of his age. The king had made his will near a month before his demise, in which he confirmed the designation of Parliament by leaving the crown first to Prince Edward, then to the Lady Mary, next to the Lady Elizabeth. The two princesses he obliged, under the penalty of forfeiting their title to the crown, not marry without consent of the council which he appointed for the government of his minor son. After his own children, he settled the succession on Francis Brandon, Marchioness of Dorset, eldest daughter of his sister, the French Queen, then on Eleanor, Countess of Cumberland, the second daughter, in passing over the posterity of the Queen of Scots, his eldest sister, he made use of the power obtained from Parliament. But as he subjoined that, after the failure of the French Queen's posterity, the crown should descend to the next lawful heir, it always became a question whether these words could be applied to the Scottish line. It was thought that these princes were not the next heirs after the house of Suffolk, but before that house, and that Henry, by expressing himself in this manner, meant entirely to exclude them. The late injuries which he had received from the Scots had irritated him extremely against that nation, and he maintained to the last that character of violence and caprice by which his life had been so much distinguished. Another circumstance of his will may suggest the same reflection with regard to the strange contrarieties of his temper and conduct. He left money for masses to be saved for delivering his soul from purgatory, and though he destroyed all those institutions established by his ancestors and others for the benefit of their souls, and had even left the doctrine of purgatory doubtful in all the articles of faith which he promulgated during his later years, he was determined, when the hour of death was approaching, to take care at least of his own future repose, and to adhere to the safer side of the question. It is difficult to give a just summary of this prince's qualities. He was so different from himself in different parts of his reign that, as well remarked by Lord Herbert, his history is his best character and description. The absolute uncontrolled authority which he maintained at home and the regard which he acquired among foreign nations are circumstances which entitle him in some degree to the appellation of a great prince, while his tyranny and barbarity exclude him from the character of a good one. He possessed, indeed, a great vigor of mind, which qualified him for exercising dominion over men, courage, intrepidity, vigilance, inflexibility, and though these qualities lay not always under the guidance of a regular and solid judgment, they were accompanied with good parts and an extensive capacity, and every one who dreaded a contest with a man who was known never to yield or forgive, and who, in every controversy, was determined either to ruin himself or his antagonist. A catalogue of his vices would comprehend many of the worst qualities incident to human nature. Violence, cruelty, profusion, rapacity, injustice, obstinacy, arrogance, bigotry, presumption, caprice. But neither was he subject to all these vices in the most extreme degree, nor was he at intervals altogether destitute of virtues. 
He was sincere, open, gallant, liberal, and capable at least of a temporary friendship and attachment. In this respect, he was unfortunate that the incidents of his reign served to display his faults in their full light. The treatment which he met with from the court of Rome provoked him to violence. The danger of a revolt from his superstitious subjects seemed to require the most extreme severity. But it must at the same time be acknowledged that his situation tended to throw an additional luster on what was great and magnanimous in his character. The emulation between the emperor and the French king rendered his alliance, notwithstanding his impolitic conduct, of great importance in Europe. The extensive powers of his prerogative and the submissive, not to say slavish, disposition of his parliaments, made it the more easy for him to assume and maintain that entire dominion by which his reign is so much distinguished in the English history. It may seem a little extraordinary that, notwithstanding his cruelty, his extortion, his violence, his arbitrary administration, this prince not only acquired the regard of his subjects, but never was the object of their hatred. He seems even, in some degree, to have possessed to the last their love and affection. His exterior qualities were advantageous and fit to captivate the multitude. His magnificence and personal bravery rendered him illustrious in vulgar eyes. And it may be said with truth that the English in that age were so thoroughly subdued that, like eastern slaves, they were inclined to admire those acts of violence and tyranny which were exercised over themselves and at their own expense. With regard to foreign states, Henry appears long to have supported an intercourse of friendship with Francis, more sincere and disinterested than usually takes place between neighboring princes. Their common jealousy of the Emperor Charles, and some resemblance in their characters, though the comparison sets the French monarch in a very superior and advantageous light, served as the cement of their mutual amity. Francis is said to have been affected with the king's death and to have expressed much regret for the loss. His own health began to decline. He foretold that he should not long survive his friend, and he died in about two months after him. End of Section 34, Chapter 33, Part 4 I'm Drew Nelson, recording December 7, 2012, in Atlanta, Georgia. Section 35 of History of England, Volume 1C This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chris Chapman History of England, from the invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688, by David Hume. Volume 1C, Section 35, Chapter 33, Part 5 There were ten parliaments summoned by Henry VIII and twenty-three sessions held. The whole time in which these parliaments sat during this long reign exceeded not three years and a half. It amounted not to a twelve-month during the first twenty years. The innovations in religion obliged the king afterwards to call these assemblies more frequently, but though these were the most important transactions that ever fell under the cognizance of Parliament, their devoted submission to Henry's will added to their earnest desire of soon returning to their country seats, produced a quick dispatch of the bills, and made the sessions of short duration. All the king's caprices were indeed blindly complied with, and no regard was paid to the safety or liberty of the subject. Besides the violent prosecution of whatever he was pleased to term heresy, the laws of treason were multiplied beyond all former precedent. Even words to the disparagement of the king, queen, or royal issue 
were subjected to that penalty, and so little care was taken in framing these rigorous statutes that they contain obvious contradictions, insomuch that, had they been strictly executed, every man, without exception, must have fallen under the penalty of treason. By one statute, for instance, it was declared treason to assert the validity of the king's marriage, either with Catherine of Aragon or Anne Boleyn. By another, it was treason to say anything to the disparagement or slander of the princesses Mary and Elizabeth, and to call them spurious would, no doubt, have been construed to their slander. Nor would even a profound silence with regard to these delicate points be able to save a person from such penalties. For by the former statute, whoever refused to answer upon oath to any point contained in that act, was subjected to the pains of treason. The king, therefore, needed only propose to any one a question with regard to the legality of either of his first marriages. If the person was silent, he was a traitor by law. If he answered, either in the negative or in the affirmative, he was no less a traitor. So monstrous were the inconsistencies which arose from the furious passions of the king and the slavish submission of his parliaments. It is hard to say whether these contradictions were owing to Henry's precipitancy or to a formed design of tyranny. It may not be improper to recapitulate whatever is memorable in the statutes of this reign, whether with regard to government or commerce. Nothing can better show the genius of the age than such a review of the laws. The abolition of the ancient religion much contributed to the regular execution of justice. While the Catholic superstition subsisted, there was no possibility of punishing any crime in the clergy. The church would not permit the magistrate to try the offences of her members, and she could not herself inflict any civil penalties upon them. But Henry restrained these pernicious immunities, the privilege of clergy was abolished for the crimes of petty treason, murder, and felony, to all under the degree of a subdeacon. But the former superstition not only protected crimes in the clergy, it exempted also the laity from punishment by affording them shelter in the churches and sanctuaries. The Parliament abridged these privileges. It was first declared that no sanctuaries were allowed in cases of high treason. Next, in those of murder, felony, rapes, burglary, and petty treason. And it limited them in other particulars. The further progress of the Reformation removed all distinction between the clergy and other subjects, and also abolished entirely the privileges of sanctuaries. These consequences were implied in the neglect of the canon law. The only expedient employed to support the military spirit during this age was the reviving and extending of some old laws enacted for the encouragement of archery, on which the defense of the kingdom was supposed much to depend. Every man was ordered to have a bow, butts were ordered to be erected in every parish, and every bowyer was ordered for each bow of yew which he made, to make two of elm or witch, for the service of the common people. The use of crossbows and handguns was also prohibited. What rendered the English bowmen more formidable was that they carried halberts with them, by which they were enabled, upon occasion, to engage in close fight with the enemy. Frequent musters or arrays were also made of the people, even during time of peace, and all men of substance were obliged to have a complete suit of armour, or harness as it was called. The martial spirit of the English, during that age, rendered this precaution, it was thought, sufficient for the defence of the nation, and as the king had then an absolute power of commanding the service of all his subjects, he could instantly, in case of danger, appoint new officers and levy regiments, and collect an army as numerous as he pleased. When no faction or division prevailed among the people, 
there was no foreign power that ever thought of invading England. The city of London alone could muster fifteen thousand men. Discipline, however, was an advantage wanting to those troops. Though the garrison of Calais was a nursery of officers, and Tournay first, Boulogne afterwards, served to increase the number. Everyone who served abroad was allowed to alienate his lands without paying any fees. A general permission was granted to dispose of land by will. The Parliament was so little jealous of its privileges, which indeed were, at that time, scarcely worth preserving, that there is an instance of one Strode who, because he had introduced into the lower house some bill regarding tin, was severely treated by the stannery courts in Cornwall. Heavy fines were imposed on him, and upon his refusal to pay, he was thrown into a dungeon, loaded with irons, and used in such a manner as brought his life in danger. Yet all the notice which the Parliament took of this enormity, even in such a paltry court, was to enact that no man could afterwards be questioned for his conduct in Parliament. This prohibition, however, must be supposed to extend only to the inferior courts, for as to the king and privy council and star chamber, they were scarcely bound by any law. There is a bill of tonnage and poundage, which shows what uncertain ideas the Parliament had formed both of their own privileges and of the rights of the sovereign. This duty had been voted to every king since Henry the Fourth, during the term of his own life only. Yet Henry the Eighth had been allowed to levy it six years without any law, and though there had been four parliaments assembled during that time, no attention had been given either to grant it to him regularly or restrain him from levying it. At last the parliament resolved to give him that supply, but even in this concession they plainly show themselves at a loss to determine whether they grant it or whether he has a right of himself to levy it. They say that the imposition was made to endure during the natural life of the late king, and no longer. They yet blame the merchants who had not paid it to the present king. They observe that the law for tonnage and poundage was expired, yet make no scruple to call that imposition the king's due. They affirm that he had sustained great and manifold losses by those who had defrauded him of it, and to provide a remedy, they vote him that supply during his lifetime, and no longer. It is remarkable that, notwithstanding this last clause, all his successors for more than a century persevered in the like irregular practice, if a practice may deserve that epithet, in which the whole nation acquiesced, and which gave no offence. But when Charles I attempted to continue in the same course which had now received the sanction of many generations, so much were the opinions of men altered that a furious tempest was excited by it, and historians, partial or ignorant, still represent this measure as a most violent and unprecedented enormity in that unhappy prince. The king was allowed to make laws for Wales without consent of Parliament. It was forgotten that, with regard both to Wales and England, the limitation was abolished by the statute which gave to the royal proclamations the force of laws. The foreign commerce of England during this age was mostly confined to the Netherlands. The inhabitants of the Low Countries bought the English commodities, and distributed them into other parts of Europe. Hence the mutual dependence of those countries on each other, and the great loss sustained by both in case of a rupture. During all the variations of politics, the sovereigns endeavoured to avoid coming to this extremity, and though the king usually bore a greater friendship to Francis, the nation always leaned towards the emperor. In 1528, Hostilities commenced between England and the Low Countries, and the inconvenience was soon felt on both sides. While the Flemings were not allowed to purchase cloth in England, the English merchants could not buy it from the clothiers, 
and the clothiers were obliged to dismiss their workmen, who began to be tumultuous for want of bread. The cardinal, to appease them, sent for the merchants and ordered them to buy cloth as usual. They told him that they could not dispose of it as usual, and, notwithstanding his menaces, he could get no other answer from them. An agreement was at last made to continue the commerce between the states, even during war. It was not till the end of this reign that any salads, carrots, turnips, or other edible roots were produced in England. The little of these vegetables that was used was formerly imported from Holland and Flanders. Queen Catherine, when she wanted a salad, was obliged to dispatch a messenger thither on purpose. The use of hops, and the planting of them, was introduced from Flanders about the beginning of this reign, or end of the preceding. Foreign artificers, in general, much surpass the English, in dexterity, industry, and frugality. Hence the violent animosity which the latter, on many occasions, expressed against any of the former who were settled in England. They had the assurance to complain that all their customers went to foreign tradesmen, and in the year 1517, being moved by the seditious sermons of one Dr. Beale and the intrigues of Lincoln, a broker, they raised an insurrection. The apprentices and others of the poorer sort in London began by breaking open the prisons, where some persons were confined for insulting foreigners. They next proceeded to the house of Mutas, a Frenchman, much hated by them, where they committed great disorders, killed some of his servants, and plundered his goods. The mayor could not appease them, nor Sir Thomas More, late under sheriff, though much respected in the city. They also threatened Cardinal Wolsey with some insult, and he thought it necessary to fortify his house and put himself on his guard. Tired at last with these disorders, they dispersed themselves, and the earls of Shrewsbury and Surrey seized some of them. A proclamation was issued that women should not meet together to babble and talk, and that all men should keep their wives in their houses. Next day the Duke of Norfolk came into the city, at the head of thirteen hundred armed men, and made inquiry into the tumult. Beale and Lincoln, and several others, were sent to the tower, and condemned for treason. Lincoln and thirteen more were executed. The other criminals, to the number of four hundred, were brought before the king with ropes around their necks, fell upon their knees, and cried for mercy. Henry knew at that time how to pardon. He dismissed them without further punishment. So great was the number of foreign artisans in the city, that at least fifteen thousand Flemings alone were at one time obliged to leave it by an order of council when Henry became jealous of their favour for Queen Catherine. Henry himself confesses, in an edict of the Star Chamber printed among the statutes, that the foreigners starved the natives and obliged them from idleness to have recourse to theft, murder, and other enormities. He also asserts that the vast multitude of foreigners raised the price of grain and bread, and to prevent an increase of the evil, all foreign artificers were prohibited from having above two foreigners in their house, either journeymen or apprentices. A like jealousy arose against the foreign merchants, and to appease it, a law was enacted obliging all denizens to pay the duties imposed upon aliens. The Parliament had done better to have encouraged foreign merchants and artisans to come over in greater numbers to England, which might have excited the emulation of the natives and have improved their skill. The prisoners in the kingdom for debts and crimes are asserted in an act of Parliament to be 60,000 persons and above, which is scarcely credible. Harrison asserts that 72,000 criminals were executed during this reign for theft and robbery, which would amount nearly to 2,000 a year. He adds that in the latter end of Elizabeth's reign, 
there were not punished capitally four hundred in a year. It appears that, in all England, there are not at present fifty executed for those crimes. If these facts be just, there has been a great improvement in morals since the reign of Henry the Eighth, and this improvement has been chiefly owing to the increase of industry and of the arts, which have given maintenance, and what is almost of equal importance, occupation to the lower classes. There is a remarkable clause in a statute passed near the beginning of this reign, by which we might be induced to believe that England was extremely decayed from the flourishing condition which it had attained in preceding times. It had been enacted in the reign of Edward the Second that no magistrate in town or borough who by his office ought to keep a size should, during the continuance of his magistracy, sell, either in wholesale or retail, any wine or victuals. This law seemed equitable in order to prevent fraud or private views in fixing the assize. Yet the law is repealed in this reign. The reason assigned is that since the making of that statute and ordinance, many and the most part of all the cities, boroughs, and towns corporate within the realm of England are fallen in ruin and decay, and are not inhabited by merchants, and men of such substance as at the time of making that statute. For at this day the dwellers and inhabitants of the same cities and boroughs are commonly bakers, vintners, fishmongers, and other victuallers, and there remain few others to bear the offices. Men have such a propensity to exalt past times above the present, that it seems dangerous to credit this reasoning of the Parliament without further evidence to support it. So different are the views in which the same object appears, that some may be inclined to draw an opposite inference from this fact. A more regular police was established in the reign of Henry the Eighth than in any former period, and a stricter administration of justice, an advantage which induced the men of landed property to leave the provincial towns and to retire into the country. Cardinal Wolsey, in a speech to Parliament, represented it as a proof of the increase of riches, that the customs had increased beyond what they were formerly. But if there were really a decay of commerce and industry and populousness in England, the statutes of this reign, except by abolishing monasteries and retrenching holy days, circumstances of considerable moment, were not in other respects well calculated to remedy the evil. The fixing of the wages of artificers was attempted. Luxury in apparel was prohibited by repeated statutes, and probably without effect. The Chancellor and other ministers were empowered to fix the price of poultry, cheese, and butter. A statute was even passed to fix the price of beef, pork, mutton, and veal. Beef and pork were ordered to be sold at a half-penny a pound, mutton and veal at a half-penny half a farthing, money of that age. The preamble of the statute says that these four species of butcher's meat were the food of the poorer sort. This act was afterwards repealed. The practice of depopulating the country by abandoning tillage and throwing the lands into pasturage still continued, as appears by the new laws which were from time to time enacted against that practice. The king was entitled to half the rents of the land where any farmhouses were allowed to fall to decay. The unskillful husbandry was probably the cause why the proprietors found no profit in tillage. The number of sheep allowed to be kept in one flock was restrained to two thousand. Sometimes, says the statute, one proprietor or farmer would keep a flock of twenty-four thousand. It is remarkable that the Parliament ascribes the increasing price of mutton to this increase of sheep, because, say they, the commodity being gotten into few hands, the price of it is raised at pleasure. It is more probable that the effect proceeded from the daily increase of money. 
for it seems almost impossible that such a commodity could be engrossed. In the year 1544, it appears that an acre of good land in Cambridgeshire was let at a shilling, or about fifteen pence of our present money. This is ten times cheaper than the usual rent at present. But commodities were not above four times cheaper, a presumption of the bad husbandry in that age. Some laws were made with regard to beggars and vagrants. One of the circumstances in government, which humanity would most powerfully recommend to a benevolent legislator, which seems at first sight the most easily adjusted, and which is yet the most difficult to settle in such a manner as to attain the end without destroying industry. The convents formerly were a support to the poor, but at the same time tended to encourage idleness and beggary. In 1546, a law was made for fixing the interest of money at 10%, the first legal interest known in England. Formerly, all loans of that nature were regarded as usurious. The preamble of this very law treats the interest of money as illegal and criminal, and the prejudices still remain so strong that the law permitting interest was repealed in the following reign. This reign, as well as many of the foregoing and even subsequent reigns, abounds with monopolizing laws, confining particular manufactures to particular towns, or excluding the open country in general. There remain still too many traces of similar absurdities, in the subsequent reign, the corporations which had been opened by a former law and obliged to admit tradesmen of different kinds were again shut up by act of parliament, and every one was prohibited from exercising any trade who was not of the corporation. Henry, as he possessed himself some talent for letters, was an encourager of them in others. He founded Trinity College in Cambridge, and gave it ample endowments. Wolsey founded Christ Church in Oxford, and intended to call it Cardinal College, but upon his fall, which happened before he had entirely finished his scheme, the king seized all the revenues, and this violence, above all the other misfortunes of that minister, is said to have given him the greatest concern. But Henry afterwards restored the revenues of the college and only changed the name. The cardinal founded in Oxford the first chair for teaching Greek, and this novelty rent that university into violent factions, which frequently came to blows. The students divided themselves into parties, which bore the names of Greeks and Trojans, and sometimes fought with as great animosity as was formerly exercised by those hostile nations. A new and more correct method of pronouncing Greek being introduced, it also divided the Grecians themselves into parties, and it was remarked that the Catholics favoured the former pronunciation, the Protestants gave countenance to the new. Gardiner employed the authority of the king and council to suppress innovations in this particular, and to preserve the corrupt sound of the Greek alphabet. So little liberty was then allowed of any kind. The penalties inflicted upon the new pronunciation were no less than whipping, degradation, and expulsion, and the bishop declared that rather than permit the liberty of innovating in the pronunciation of the Greek alphabet, it were better that the language itself were totally banished the universities. The introduction of the Greek language into Oxford excited the emulation of Cambridge. Wolsey intended to have enriched the library of his college at Oxford with copies of all the manuscripts that were in the Vatican. The countenance given to letters by this king and his ministers contributed to render learning fashionable in England. Erasmus speaks with great satisfaction of the general regard paid by the nobility and gentry to men of knowledge. It is needless to be particular in mentioning the writers of this reign, or of the preceding. There is no man of that age who has the least pretension to be ranked among our classics. 
Sir Thomas More, though he wrote in Latin, seems to come the nearest to the character of a classical author. End of section 35, chapter 33, part 5. Section 36 of Volume 1C of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rebecca Shertuti History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume Volume 1C, Section 36, Chapter 34, Part 1 Edward the Sixth. The late king by the regulations which he imposed on the government of his infant son, as well as by the limitations of the succession, had projected to reign even after his decease. And he imagined that his ministers, who had always been so obsequious to him during his lifetime, would never afterwards depart from the plan which he had traced out to them. He fixed the majority of the prince at the completion of his eighteenth year, and as Edward was then only a few months past nine, he appointed sixteen executors, to whom, during the minority, he entrusted the government of the king and kingdom. Their names were Cranmer, Archbishop of Canterbury, Lord Ryothesley, Chancellor, Lord St. John, Great Master, Lord Russell, Privy Seal, the Earl of Hertford, Chamberlain, Viscount Lyle, Admiral, Tonstall, Bishop of Durham, Sir Anthony Brown, Master of Horse, Sir William Paget, Secretary of State, Sir Edward North, Chancellor of the Court of Augmentations, Sir Edward Montague, Chief Justice of the Common Pleas, Judge Bromley, Sir Anthony Denny, and Sir William Herbert, Chief Gentleman of the Privy Chamber, Sir Edward Wotton, Treasurer of Calais, Dr. Wotton, Dean of Canterbury. To these executors, with whom was entrusted the whole regal authority, were appointed twelve councillors, who possessed no immediate power, and could only assist with their advice when any affair was laid before them. The council was composed of the earls of Arundel and Essex, Sir Thomas Cheney, treasurer of the household, Sir John Gage, comptroller, Sir Anthony Wingfield, vice-chamberlain, Sir William Peter, secretary of state, Sir Richard Rich, Sir John Baker, Sir Ralph Sadler, Sir Thomas Seymour, Sir Richard Southwell, and Sir Edmund Peckham. The usual caprice of Henry appears somewhat in this nomination. While he appointed several persons of inferior station among his executors, and gave only the place of counsellor to a person of such high rank as the Earl of Arundel, and to Sir Thomas Seymour, the king's uncle. But the first act of the executors and counsellors was to depart from the destination of the late king in a material article. No sooner were they met than it was suggested that the government would lose its dignity for want of some head who might represent the royal majesty, who might receive addresses from foreign ambassadors, to whom despatches from English ministers abroad might be carried, and whose name might be employed in all orders and proclamations. And as the king's will seemed to labor under a defect in this particular, it was deemed necessary to supply it by choosing a protector, who, 
though he should possess all the exterior symbols of royal dignity, should yet be bound, in every act of power, to follow the opinion of the executors. This proposal was very disagreeable to Chancellor Ryothsley. That magistrate, a man of an active spirit and high ambition, found himself by his office entitled to the first rank in the regency after the primate, and as he knew that this prelate had no talent or inclination for state affairs, he hoped that the direction of public business would, of course, devolve in a great measure upon himself. He opposed, therefore, the proposal of choosing a protector, and represented that innovation as an infringement of the late king's will, which, being corroborated by act of parliament, ought in everything to be a law to them, and could not be altered but by the same authority which had established it but he seems to have stood alone in the opposition. The executors and counsellors were mostly courtiers who had been raised by Henry's favour, not men of high birth or great hereditary influence, and as they had been sufficiently accustomed to submission during the reign of the late monarch, and had no pretensions to govern the nation by their own authority— they acquiesced the more willingly in a proposal which seemed calculated for preserving public peace and tranquillity. It being therefore agreed to name a protector, the choice fell, of course, on the Earl of Hertford, who, as he was the king's maternal uncle, was strongly interested in his safety and possessing no claims to inherit the crown, could never have any separate interest which might lead him to endanger Edward's person or his authority. The public was informed by proclamation of this change in the administration, and despatches were sent to all foreign courts to give them intimation of it. All those who were possessed of any office resigned their former commissions, and accepted new ones in the name of the young king. The bishops themselves were constrained to make a like submission. Care was taken to insert in their new commissions that they held their office during pleasure, and it is there expressly affirmed that all manner of authority and jurisdiction, as well ecclesiastical as civil, is originally derived from the crown. The executors, in their next measure, showed a more submissive deference to Henry's will, because many of them found their account in it. The late king had intended, before his death, to make a new creation of nobility in order to supply the place of those peerages which had fallen by former attainders or the failure of issue, and that he might enable the new peers to support their dignity, he had resolved either to bestow estates on them or advance them to higher offices. He had even gone so far as to inform them of this resolution, and in his will he charged his executors to make good all his promises. That they might ascertain his intentions in the most authentic manner, Sir William Paget, Sir Antony Denny, and Sir William Herbert, with whom Henry had always conversed in a familiar manner, were called before the Board of Regency, and having given evidence of what they knew concerning the King's promises, their testimony was relied on, and the executors proceeded to the fulfilling of these engagements. Hertford was created Duke of Somerset, Mariscal, and Lord Treasurer. Ryothesley, Earl of Southampton, the Earl of Essex, Marquis of Northampton, Viscount Lyle, Earl of Warwick, Sir Thomas Seymour, Lord Seymour of Sudley, and Admiral, Sir Richard Rich, Sir William Willoughby, Sir Edward Sheffield, accepted the title of Baron. Several, to whom the same dignity was offered, refused it, 
because the other part of the king's promise, the bestowing of estates on these new noblemen, was deferred till a more convenient opportunity. Some of them, however, as also Somerset, the protector, were, in the meantime, endowed with spiritual preferments, deaneries, and prebends. For, among many other invasions of ecclesiastical privileges and property, this irregular practice of bestowing spiritual benefices on laymen began now to prevail. The Earl of Southampton had always been engaged in an opposite party to Somerset, and it was not likely that factions which had secretly prevailed even during the arbitrary reign of Henry should be suppressed in the weak administration that usually attends a minority. The former nobleman, that he might have the greater leisure for attending to public business, had, of himself and from his own authority, put the great seal in commission, and had empowered four lawyers, Southwell, Tregonel, Oliver, and Bellasis, to execute in his absence the office of Chancellor. This measure seemed very exceptionable, and the more so as, two of the commissioners being canonists, the lawyers suspected that, by this nomination, the Chancellor had intended to discredit the common law. Complaints were made to the council, who, influenced by the protector, gladly laid hold of the opportunity to depress Southampton. They consulted the judges with regard to so unusual a case, and received for answer that the commission was illegal, and that the Chancellor, by his presumption in granting it, had justly forfeited the great seal, and was even liable to punishment. The council summoned him to appear before them. He maintained that he held his office by the late king's will, founded on an act of Parliament, and could not lose it without a trial in Parliament, that if the commission which he had granted were found illegal, it might be cancelled, and all the ill consequences of it be easily remedied, and that the depriving him of his office for an error of this nature was a precedent by which any other innovation might be authorized. But the council, notwithstanding these topics of defense, declared that he had forfeited the great seal, that a fine should be imposed upon him, and that he should be confined to his own house during pleasure. The removal of Southampton increased the protector's authority, as well as tended to suppress faction in the regency. Yet was not Somerset contented with this advantage. His ambition carried him to seek still further acquisitions. On pretense that the vote of the executors choosing his protector was not a sufficient foundation for his authority— he procured a patent from the young king, by which he entirely overturned the will of Henry the Eighth, produced a total revolution in the government, and may seem even to have subverted all the laws of the kingdom. He named himself protector with full regal power, and appointed a council consisting of all the former councillors and all the executors, except Southampton. He reserved a power of naming any other counselors at pleasure, and he was bound to consult with such only as he thought proper. The protector and his council were likewise empowered to act at discretion and to execute whatever they deemed for the public service, without incurring any penalty or forfeiture from any law, statute, proclamation, or ordinance whatsoever. Even had this patent been more moderate in its concessions, and had it been drawn by directions from the executors appointed by Henry, its legality might justly be questioned, since it seems essential to a trust of this nature to be exercised by the persons entrusted, and not to admit of a delegation to others. But as the patent, by its very tenor, where the executors are not so much as mentioned— appears to have been surreptitiously obtained from a minor king, 
the protectorship of Somerset was a plain usurpation, which it is impossible by any arguments to justify. The connivance, however, of the executors, and their present acquiescence in the new establishment, made it be universally submitted to. And as the young king discovered an extreme attachment to his uncle, who was also, in the main, a man of moderation and probity, no objections were made to his power and title. All men of sense, likewise, who saw the nation divided by the religious zeal of the opposite sects, deemed it the more necessary to entrust the government to one person who might check the exorbitancies of faction and ensure the public tranquillity. And though some clauses of the patent seemed to imply a formal subversion of all limited government, so little jealousy was then usually entertained on that head that no exception was ever taken at bare claims or pretensions of this nature, advanced by any person possessed of sovereign power. The actual exercise alone of arbitrary administration, and that in many and great and flagrant and unpopular instances, was able sometimes to give some umbrage to the nation. The extensive authority and imperious character of Henry had retained the partisans of both religions in subjection. But upon his demise, the hopes of the Protestants and the fears of the Catholics began to revive, and the zeal of these parties produced everywhere disputes and animosities, the usual preludes to more fatal divisions. The protector had long been regarded as a secret partisan of the reformers, and being now freed from restraint, he scrupled not to discover his intention of correcting all abuses in the ancient religion, and of adopting still more of the Protestant innovations. He took care that all persons entrusted with the king's education should be attached to the same principles— and as the young prince discovered a zeal for every kind of literature, especially the theological, far beyond his tender years, all men foresaw, in the course of his reign, the total abolition of the Catholic faith in England, and they early began to declare themselves in favor of those tenets which were likely to become, in the end, entirely prevalent. After Southampton's fall, Few members of the council seemed to retain any attachment to the Romish communion, and most of the councillors appeared even sanguine in forwarding the progress of the Reformation. The riches which most of them had acquired from the spoils of the clergy induced them to widen the breach between England and Rome, and by establishing a contrariety of speculative tenets as well as of discipline and worship, to render a coalition with the Mother Church altogether impracticable. Their rapacity also, the chief source of their reforming spirit, was excited by the prospect of pillaging the secular, as they had already done the regular clergy, and they knew that while any share of the old principles remained, or any regard to the ecclesiastics, they could never hope to succeed in that enterprise. The numerous and burdensome superstitions with which the Romish church was loaded had thrown many of the reformers by the spirit of opposition into an enthusiastic strain of devotion, and all rites, ceremonies, pomp, order, and exterior observances were zealously proscribed by them as hindrances to their spiritual contemplations and obstructions to their immediate converse with heaven. Many circumstances concurred to inflame this daring spirit. The novelty itself of their doctrines, the triumph of making proselytes, the furious persecutions to which they were exposed— their animosity against the ancient tenets and practices, 
and the necessity of procuring the concurrence of the laity by depressing the hierarchy and by tendering to them the plunder of the ecclesiastics. Wherever the Reformation prevailed over the opposition of civil authority, this genius of religion appeared in its full extent and was attended with consequences which, though less durable, were, for some time, not less dangerous than those which were connected with the ancient superstition. But as the magistrate took the lead in England, the transition was more gradual. Much of the ancient religion was still preserved, and a reasonable degree of subordination was retained in discipline, as well as some pomp, order, and ceremony in public worship. The protector, in his schemes for advancing the Reformation, had always recourse to the councils of Cranmer, who, being a man of moderation and prudence, was averse to all violent changes, and determined to bring over the people by insensible innovations to that system of doctrine and discipline which he deemed the most pure and perfect. He probably also foresaw that a system which carefully avoided the extremes of reformation was likely to be most lasting, and that a devotion merely spiritual was fitted only for the first fervors of a new sect, and upon the relaxation of these naturally gave place to the inroads of superstition. He seems, therefore, to have intended the establishment of a hierarchy, which, being suited to a great and settled government, might stand as a perpetual barrier against Rome, and might retain the reverence of the people, even after their enthusiastic zeal was diminished or entirely evaporated. The person who opposed with greatest authority any further advances towards reformation was Gardiner, Bishop of Winchester, who, though he had not obtained a place in the Council of Regency on account of late disgusts which he had given to Henry, was entitled, by his age, experience, and capacity, to the highest trust and confidence of his party. This prelate still continued to magnify the great wisdom and learning of the late king, which indeed were generally and sincerely revered by the nation, and he insisted on the prudence of persevering at least till the young king's majority, in the ecclesiastical model established by that great monarch. He defended the use of images, which were now openly attacked by the Protestants, and he represented them as serviceable in maintaining a sense of religion among the illiterate multitude. He even deigned to write an apology for holy water, which Bishop Ridley had decried in a sermon and he maintained that, by the power of the Almighty, it might be rendered an instrument of doing good as much as the shadow of St. Peter, the hem of Christ's garment, or the spittle and clay laid upon the eyes of the blind. Above all, he insisted that the laws ought to be observed, that the Constitution ought to be preserved inviolate, and that it was dangerous to follow the will of the sovereign in opposition to an act of Parliament. But though there remained at that time in England an idea of laws and a constitution, sufficient at least to furnish a topic of argument to such as were discontented with any immediate exercise of authority, this plea could scarcely, in the present case, be maintained with any plausibility by Gardiner. An act of Parliament had invested the Crown with the legislative power, and royal proclamations, even during a minority, were armed with the force of laws. The Protector, finding himself supported by this statute, was determined to employ his authority in favor of the Reformers, and having suspended, during the interval, the jurisdiction of the bishops, he appointed a general visitation to be made in all the dioceses of England. 
the visitors consisted of a mixture of clergy and laity, and had six circuits assigned them. The chief purport of their instructions was, besides correcting immoralities and irregularities in the clergy, to abolish the ancient superstitions, and to bring the discipline and worship somewhat nearer the practice of the reformed churches. The moderation of Somerset and Cranmer is apparent in the conduct of this delicate affair. The visitors were enjoined to retain for the present all images which had not been abused to idolatry, and to instruct the people not to despise such ceremonies as were not yet abrogated, but only to beware of some particular superstitions, such as the sprinkling of their beds with holy water, and the ringing of bells or using of consecrated candles, in order to drive away the devil. But nothing required more the correcting hand of authority than the abuse of preaching, which was now generally employed throughout England in defending the ancient practices and superstitions. The Court of Augmentation, in order to ease the exchequer of the annuities paid to monks, had commonly placed them in the vacant churches, and these men were led by interest, as well as by inclination, to support those principles which had been invented for the profit of the clergy. Orders, therefore, were given to restrain the topics of theft sermons. Twelve homilies were published, which they were enjoined to read to the people, and all of them were prohibited, without express permission, from preaching anywhere but in their parish churches. The purpose of this injunction was to throw a restraint on the Catholic divines, while the Protestant, by the grant of particular licenses, should be allowed unbounded liberty. Bonner made some opposition to these measures, but soon after retracted and acquiesced. Gardner was more high-spirited and more steady. He represented the peril of perpetual innovations and the necessity of adhering to some system. "'Tis a dangerous thing," said he, "'to use too much freedom in researches of this kind. "'If you cut the old canal, "'the water is apt to run farther than you have a mind to. "'If you indulge the humor of novelty, "'you cannot put a stop to people's demands, "'nor govern their indiscretions at pleasure. "'For my part,' said he on another occasion, "'my sole concern is to manage the third and last act of my life with decency, and to make a handsome exit off the stage. Provided this point is secured, I am not solicitous about the rest. I am already by nature condemned to death. No man can give me a pardon from the sentence, nor so much as procure me a reprieve. To speak my mind, and to act as my conscience directs, are two branches of liberty which I can never part with. Sincerity in speech and integrity in action are entertaining qualities. They will stick by a man when everything else takes its leave, and I must not resign them upon any consideration. The best on it is, if I do not throw them away myself, no man can force them from me. But if I give them up, then am I ruined by myself, and deserve to lose all my preferments. This opposition of Gardiner drew on him the indignation of the council, and he was sent to the fleet, where he was used with some severity. End of Section 36 Chapter 34 Part 1 Recording by Rebecca Shertuti Section 37 of Volume 1C of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by Rebecca Shertuti. History of England from the invasion of Julius Caesar to the revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1C, section 37, chapter 34, part 2. One of the chief objections urged by Gardner against the new homilies was that they defined with the most metaphysical precision the doctrines of grace and of justification by faith, points, he thought, which it was superfluous for any man to know exactly, and which certainly much exceeded the comprehension of the vulgar. A famous martyrologist calls Gardner on account of this opinion— an insensible ass, and one that had no feeling of God's spirit in the matter of justification. The meanest Protestant imagined at that time that he had a full comprehension of all those mysterious doctrines, and he heartily despised the most learned and knowing person of the ancient religion who acknowledged his ignorance with regard to them. It is indeed certain that the Reformers were very fortunate in their doctrine of justification, and might venture to foretell its success in opposition to all the ceremonies, shows, and superstitions of popery. By exalting Christ and his sufferings, and renouncing all claim to independent merit in ourselves, it was calculated to become popular." and coincided with those principles of panegyric and of self-abasement which generally have place in religion. Tonstall, Bishop of Durham, having as well as Gardner made some opposition to the new regulations, was dismissed by the council. But no further severity was for the present exercised against him. He was a man of great moderation, and of the most unexceptionable character in the kingdom. The same religious zeal which engaged Somerset to promote the Reformation at home led him to carry his attention to foreign countries, where the interests of the Protestants were now exposed to the most imminent danger. The Roman pontiff, with much reluctance, and after long delays, had at last summoned a general council which was assembled at Trent, and was employed both in correcting the abuses of the church and in ascertaining her doctrines. The emperor, who desired to repress the power of the court of Rome as well as gain over the Protestants, promoted the former object of the council. The pope, who found his own greatness so deeply interested, desired rather to employ them in the latter. He gave instructions to his legates, who presided in the council, to protract the debates, and to engage the theologians in argument, and altercation, and dispute concerning the nice points of faith canvassed before them, a policy so easy to be executed that the legates soon found it rather necessary to interpose in order to appease the animosity of the divines, and bring them at last to some decision. The more difficult task for the legates was to moderate or divert the zeal of the council for reformation, and to repress the ambition of the prelates who desired to exalt the episcopal authority on the ruins of the sovereign pontiff. Finding this humor become prevalent, the legates, on pretense that the plague had broken out at Trent, transferred of a sudden the council to Bologna, where they hoped it would be more under the direction of his holiness. The emperor, no less than the pope, had learned to make religion subservient to his ambition and policy. He was resolved to employ the imputation of heresy as a pretense for subduing the Protestant princes and oppressing the liberties of Germany, but found it necessary to cover his intentions under deep artifice and to prevent the combination of his adversaries. He separated the Palatine and the Elector of Brandenburg from the Protestant Confederacy. He took arms against the Elector of Saxony and the Landgrave of Hesse. 
By the fortune of war he made the former prisoner. He employed treachery and prevarication against the latter, and detained him captive by breaking a safe conduct which he had granted him. He seemed to have reached the summit of his ambition, and the German princes, who were astonished with his success, were further discouraged by the intelligence which they had received of the death, first of Henry the Eighth, then of Francis the First, their usual resources in every calamity. Henry the Second, who succeeded to the crown of France, was a prince of vigor and abilities but less hasty in his resolutions than Francis, and less inflamed with rivalship and animosity against the Emperor Charles. Though he sent ambassadors to the princes of the small Caldic League, and promised them protection, he was unwilling, in the commencement of his reign, to hurry into a war with so great a power as that of the Emperor and he thought that the alliance of those princes was a sure resource which he could at any time lay hold of. He was much governed by the Duke of Guise and the Cardinal of Lorraine, and he hearkened to their counsel in choosing rather to give immediate assistance to Scotland, his ancient ally, which, even before the death of Henry the Eighth, had loudly claimed the protection of the French monarchy. The hatred between the two factions, the partisans of the ancient and those of the new religion, became every day more violent in Scotland, and the resolution which the cardinal primate had taken to employ the most rigorous punishments against the reformers brought matters to a quick decision. There was one Wishart, a gentleman by birth, who employed himself with great zeal in preaching against the ancient superstitions, and began to give alarm to the clergy, who were justly terrified with the danger of some fatal revolution in religion. This man was celebrated for the purity of his morals, and for his extensive learning. But these praises cannot be much depended on, because we know that, among the reformers, Severity of manners supplied the place of many virtues, and the age in general so ignorant that most of the priests in Scotland imagined the New Testament to be a composition of Luther's, and asserted that the old alone was the word of God. But however the case may have stood with regard to those estimable qualities ascribed to Wishart, he was strongly possessed with the desire of innovation, and he enjoyed those talents which qualified him for becoming a popular preacher, and for seizing the attention and affections of the multitude. The magistrates of Dundee, where he exercised his mission, were alarmed with his progress, and being unable or unwilling to treat him with rigor, they contented themselves with denying him the liberty of preaching, and with dismissing him the bounds of their jurisdiction. Wishart, moved with indignation that they had dared to reject him, together with the word of God, menaced them, in imitation of the ancient prophets, with some imminent calamity, and he withdrew to the west country, where he daily increased the number of his proselytes. Meanwhile, a plague broke out in Dundee, and all men exclaimed that the town had drawn down the vengeance of heaven by banishing the pious preacher, and that the pestilence would never cease till they had made him atonement for their offense against him. No sooner did Wishart hear of this change in their disposition than he returned to them and made them a new tender of his doctrine— but lest he should spread the contagion by bringing them together, he erected his pulpit on the top of a gate. The infected stood within, the others without. And the preacher failed not, in such a situation, to take advantage of the immediate terrors of the people, and to enforce his evangelical mission. The assiduity and success of Wishart became an object of attention to Cardinal Beaton, and he resolved, by the punishment of so celebrated a preacher, to strike a terror into all other innovators. He engaged the Earl of Bothwell to arrest him, and to deliver him into his hands, contrary to a promise given by Bothwell to that unhappy man. 
and, being possessed of his prey, he conducted him to St. Andrew's, where, after a trial, he condemned him to the flames for heresy. Aaron, the governor, was irresolute in his temper, and the cardinal, though he had gained him over to his party, found that he would not concur in the condemnation and execution of Wishart. He determined, therefore, without the assistance of the secular arm, to bring that heretic to punishment, and he himself beheld from his window the dismal spectacle. Wishart suffered with the usual patience, but could not forbear remarking the triumph of his insulting enemy. He foretold that, in a few days, he should, in the very same place, lie as low as now he was exalted aloft in opposition to true piety and religion. This prophecy was probably the immediate cause of the event which it foretold. The disciples of this martyr, enraged at the cruel execution, formed a conspiracy against the cardinal, and having associated to them Norman Leslie, who was disgusted on account of some private quarrel, they conducted their enterprise with great secrecy and success. Early in the morning they entered the cardinal's palace, which he had strongly fortified, and though they were not above sixteen persons, they thrust out a hundred tradesmen and fifty servants, whom they seized separately, before any suspicion arose of their intentions. And having shut the gates, they proceeded very deliberately to execute their purpose on the cardinal. That prelate had been alarmed with the noise which he heard in the castle, and had barricaded the door of his chamber. But finding that they had brought fire in order to force their way, and having obtained, as is believed, a promise of life, he opened the door, and reminding them that he was a priest, he conjured them to spare him. Two of the assassins rushed upon him with drawn swords, but a third, James Melville, more calm and more considerate in villainy, stopped their career, and bade them reflect that this sacrifice was the work and judgment of God, and ought to be executed with becoming deliberation and gravity. Then, turning the point of his sword towards Beaton, he called to him, Repent thee, thou wicked cardinal, of all thy sins and iniquities, especially of the murder of Wishart, that instrument of God for the conversion of these lands. It is his death which now cries vengeance upon thee. We are sent by God to inflict the deserved punishment. For here, before the Almighty, I protest that it is neither hatred of thy person, nor love of thy riches, nor fear of thy power which moves me to seek thy death, but only because thou hast been, and still remainest, an obstinate enemy to Christ Jesus and his holy gospel. Having spoken these words, without giving Beaton time to finish that repentance to which he exhorted him, he thrust him through the body, and the cardinal fell dead at his feet. This murder was executed on the 28th of May, 1546. The assassins, being reinforced by their friends to the number of a hundred and forty persons, prepared themselves for the defense of the castle, and sent a messenger to London craving assistance from Henry. That prince, though Scotland was comprehended in his peace with France, would not forego the opportunity of disturbing the government of a rival kingdom, and he promised to take them under his protection. It was the peculiar misfortune of Scotland that five short reigns had been followed successively by as many long minorities, and the execution of justice, which the prince was beginning to introduce, had been continually interrupted by the cabals, factions, and animosities of the great. But besides these inveterate and ancient evils, a new source of disorder had arisen— the disputes and contentions of theology which were sufficient to disturb the most settled government, 
and the death of the cardinal, who was possessed of abilities and vigor, seemed much to weaken the hands of the administration. But the queen dowager was a woman of uncommon talents and virtue, and she did as much to support the government and supply the weakness of Arun, the governor, as could be expected in her situation. The protector of England, as soon as the state was brought to some composure, made preparations for war with Scotland, and he was determined to execute, if possible, that project of uniting the two kingdoms by marriage on which the late king had been so intent, and which he had recommended with his dying breath to his executors. He levied an army of eighteen thousand men, and equipped a fleet of sixty sail, one half of which were ships of war, the other laden with provisions and ammunition. He gave the command of the fleet to Lord Clinton. He himself marched at the head of the army, attended by the Earl of Warwick. These hostile measures were covered with a pretense of revenging some depredations committed by the borderers. But besides that, Somerset revived the ancient claim of the superiority of the English crown over that of Scotland. He refused to enter into negotiation on any other condition than the marriage of the young queen with Edward. The protector, before he opened the campaign, published a manifesto in which he enforced all the arguments for that measure. He said, that nature seemed originally to have intended this island for one empire, and having cut it off from all communication with foreign states, and guarded it by the ocean, she had pointed out to the inhabitants the road to happiness and to security, that the education and customs of the people concurred with nature, and by giving them the same language and laws and manners, had invited them to a thorough union and coalition that fortune had at last removed all obstacles, and had prepared an expedient by which they might become one people, without leaving any place for that jealousy either of honor or of interest to which rival nations are naturally exposed. That the crown of Scotland had devolved on a female, that of England on a male, and happily the two sovereigns, as of a rank, were also of an age the most suitable to each other, that the hostile dispositions which prevailed between the nations and which arose from past injuries would soon be extinguished after a long and secure peace had established confidence between them, that the memory of former miseries which at present inflamed their mutual animosity would then serve only to make them cherish with more passion a state of happiness and tranquillity so long unknown to their ancestors, that when hostilities had ceased between the kingdoms, the Scottish nobility, who were at present obliged to remain perpetually in a warlike posture, would learn to cultivate the arts of peace, and would soften their minds to a love of domestic order and obedience that as this situation was desirable to both kingdoms, so particularly to Scotland, which had been exposed to the greatest miseries from intestine and foreign wars, and saw herself every moment in danger of losing her independency by the efforts of a richer and more powerful people, that though England had claims of superiority, she was willing to resign every pretension for the sake of future peace, and desired a union which would be the more secure as it would be concluded on terms entirely equal, and that, besides all these motives, positive engagements had been taken for completing this alliance, and the honor and good faith of the nation were pledged to fulfill what her interest and safety so loudly demanded. Somerset soon perceived that these remonstrances would have no influence, and that the Queen Dowager's attachment to France and to the Catholic religion would render ineffectual all negotiations for the intended marriage. He found himself, therefore, 
obliged to try the force of arms, and to constrain the Scots by necessity to submit to a measure for which they seemed to have entertained the most incurable aversion. He passed the borders at Berwick, and advanced towards Edinburgh, without meeting any resistance for some days, except from some small castles which he obliged to surrender at discretion. The protector intended to have punished the governor and garrison of one of these castles for their temerity in resisting such unequal force, but they eluded his anger by asking only a few hours' respite till they should prepare themselves for death, after which they found his ears more open to their applications for mercy. The governor of Scotland had summoned together the whole force of the kingdom, and his army, double in number to that of the English, had taken post on advantageous ground, guarded by the banks of the Eska, about four miles from Edinburgh. The English came within sight of them at Fosside, and after a skirmish between the horse, where the Scots were worsted, and Lord Hume dangerously wounded, Somerset prepared himself for a more decisive action. But having taken a view of the Scottish camp with the Earl of Warwick, he found it difficult to make an attempt upon it with any probability of success. He wrote, therefore, another letter to Arran, and offered to evacuate the kingdom, as well as to repair all the damages which he had committed, provided the Scots would stipulate not to contract the queen to any foreign prince, but to detain her at home till she reached the age of choosing a husband for herself. So moderate a demand was rejected by the Scots merely on account of its moderation, and it made them imagine that the protector must either be reduced to great distress or be influenced by fear that he was now contented to abate so much of his former pretensions. Inflamed also by their priests, who had come to the camp in great numbers, they believed that the English were detestable heretics, abhorred of God, and exposed to divine vengeance, and that no success could ever crown their arms. They were confirmed in this fond conceit when they saw the protector change his ground and move towards the sea, nor did they any longer doubt that he intended to embark his army and make his escape on board the ships which at that very time moved into the bay opposite to him. Determined, therefore, to cut off his retreat, they quitted their camp, and passing the river Eska, advanced into the plain. They were divided into three bodies. Angus commanded the vanguard, Arran the main body, Huntley the rear. Their cavalry consisted only of light horse, which were placed on their left flank, strengthened by some Irish archers whom Argyle had brought over for this service. Somerset was much pleased when he saw this movement of the Scottish army, and as the English had usually been superior in pitched battles, he conceived great hopes of success. He ranged his van on the left, farthest from the sea, and ordered them to remain on the high grounds on which he placed them till the enemy should approach. He placed his main battle in his rear towards the right, and beyond the van he posted Lord Grey at the head of the men-at-arms, and ordered him to take the Scottish van in flank, but not till they should be engaged in close fight with the van of the English. While the Scots were advancing on the plain, they were galled with the artillery from the English ships. The eldest son of Lord Graham was killed. The Irish archers were thrown into disorder, and even the other troops began to stagger. When Lord Grey, perceiving their situation, neglected his orders, left his ground, and at the head of his heavy-armed horse made an attack on the Scottish infantry in hopes of gaining all the honor at the victory. On advancing, he found a slough and ditch in his way, and behind were ranged the enemy armed with spears, and the field on which they stood was fallow ground, broken with ridges which lay across their front and disordered the movements of the English cavalry. From all these accidents, the shock of this body of horse was feeble and irregular, and as they were received on the points of the Scottish spears, 
which were longer than the lances of the English horsemen, they were in a moment pierced, overthrown, and discomfited. Grey himself was dangerously wounded. Lord Edward Seymour, son of the Protector, had his horse killed under him. The standard was near being taken, and had the Scots possessed any good body of cavalry who could have pursued the advantage, the whole English army had been exposed to great danger. End of Section 37 Chapter 34 Part 3 Recording by Rebecca Shertuti Section 38 of Volume 1C of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rebecca Shertuti History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume Volume 1C, Section 38, Chapter 34, Part 3 The Protector, meanwhile, assisted by Sir Ralph Sadler and Sir Ralph Bain, employed himself with diligence and success in rallying the cavalry. Warwick showed great presence of mind in maintaining the ranks of the foot on which the horse had recoiled. He made Sir Peter Mutis advance, captain of the foot harquebusiers, and Sir Peter Gamboa, captain of some Italian and Spanish harquebusiers on horseback, and ordered them to ply the Scottish infantry with their shot. They marched to the slough and discharged their pieces full in the face of the enemy. The ships galled them from the flank. The artillery, planted on a height, infested them from the front. The English archers poured in a shower of arrows upon them, and the vanguard, descending from the hill, advanced leisurely and in good order towards them. Dismayed with all these circumstances, the Scottish van began to retreat, the retreat soon changed into a flight which was begun by the Irish archers. The panic of the van communicated itself to the main body, and passing thence to the rear, rendered the whole field a scene of confusion, terror, flight, and consternation. The English army perceived from the heights the condition of the Scots, and began the pursuit with loud shouts and acclamations, which added still more to the dismay of the vanquished. The horse in particular, eager to revenge the affront which they had received in the beginning of the day, did the most bloody execution on the flying enemy, and from the field of battle to Edinburgh, for the space of five miles, the whole ground was strowed with dead bodies. The priests, above all, and the monks, received no quarter, and the English made sport of slaughtering men who, from their extreme zeal and animosity, had engaged in an enterprise so ill-befitting their profession. Few victories have been more decisive or gained with smaller loss to the conquerors. There fell not two hundred of the English, and according to the most moderate computation, there perished above ten thousand of the Scots. About fifteen hundred were taken prisoners. This action was called the Battle of Pinky, from a nobleman's seat of that name in the neighborhood. The Queen Dowager and Arran fled to Stirling, and were scarcely able to collect such a body of forces as could check the incursions of small parties of the English. About the same time, the Earl of Lennox and Lord Wharton entered the West Marches at the head of five thousand men, and after taking and plundering Anan, they spread devastation over all the neighboring counties. Had Somerset prosecuted his advantages, he might have imposed what terms he pleased on the Scottish nation, but he was impatient to return to England, where, he heard, some counsellors, and even his own brother, the admiral, 
were carrying on cabals against his authority. Having taken the castles of Hume, Dunglass, Eymouth, Fastcastle, Roxborough, and some other small places, and having received the submission of some counties on the borders, he retired from Scotland. The fleet, besides destroying all the shipping along the coast, took Broughty in the Frith of Tay, and having fortified it, they there left a garrison. Arran desired leave to send commissioners in order to treat of a peace, and Somerset, having appointed Berwick for the place of conference, left Warwick with full powers to negotiate. But no commissioners from Scotland ever appeared. The overture of the Scots was an artifice, to gain time till succors should arrive from France. The protector, on his arrival in England, summoned a parliament, and being somewhat elated with his success against the Scots, he procured from his nephew a patent, appointing him to sit on the throne, upon a stool or bench at the right hand of the king, and to enjoy the same honors and privileges that had usually been possessed by any prince of the blood, or uncle of the kings of England. In this patent the king employed his dispensing power by setting aside the statute of precedency enacted during the former reign. But if Somerset gave offense by assuming too much state, he deserves great praise on account of the laws passed this session, by which the rigor of former statutes was much mitigated, and some security given to the freedom of the Constitution. All laws were repealed which extended the crime of treason beyond the statute of the 25th of Edward III, all laws enacted during the late reign extending the crime of felony, all the former laws against lollardy or heresy, together with the statute of the six articles. None were to be accused for words but within a month after they were spoken. By these repeals, several of the most rigorous laws that ever had passed in England were annulled, and some dawn, both of civil and religious liberty, began to appear to the people. Heresy, however, was still a capital crime by the common law, and was subjected to the penalty of burning. Only there remained no precise standard by which that crime could be defined or determined, a circumstance which might either be advantageous or hurtful to public security, according to the disposition of the judges. A repeal also passed of that law, the destruction of all laws, by which the king's proclamation was made of equal force with a statute. That other law, likewise, was mitigated, by which the king was empowered to annul every statute passed before the four-and-twentieth year of his age. He could prevent their future execution, but could not recall any past effects which had ensued from them. It was also enacted that all who denied the king's supremacy or asserted the pope's should, for the first offense, forfeit their goods and chattels, and suffer imprisonment during pleasure. For the second offense, should incur the penalty of a praemunire, and for the third, be attainted of treason. But if any, after the first of March ensuing, endeavored, by writing, printing, or any overt act or deed, to deprive the king of his estate or titles, particularly of his supremacy, or to confer them on any other, he was to be adjudged guilty of treason. If any of the heirs of the crown should usurp upon another, or endeavor to break the order of succession, it was declared treason in them, their aiders and abettors. These were the most considerable acts passed during this session. The members in general discovered a very passive disposition with regard to religion, some few appeared zealous for the Reformation, others secretly harbored a strong propensity to the Catholic faith, but the greater part appeared willing to take any impression which they should receive from interest, authority, or the reigning fashion. The convocation met at the same time with the Parliament, 
and as it was found that their debates were at first cramped by the rigorous statute of the six articles, the king granted them a dispensation from that law before it was repealed by Parliament. The lower house of convocation applied to have liberty of sitting with the commons in Parliament, or if this privilege were refused them, which they claimed as their ancient right, they desired that no law regarding religion might pass in Parliament without their consent and approbation. But the principles which now prevailed were more favorable to the civil than to the ecclesiastical power, and this demand of the convocation was rejected. The protector had assented to the repeal of that law which gave to the king's proclamations the authority of statutes, but he did not intend to renounce that arbitrary or discretionary exercise of power in issuing proclamations, which had ever been assumed by the crown, and which it is difficult to distinguish exactly from a full legislative power. He even continued to exert this authority in some particulars, which were then regarded as the most momentous. Orders were issued by council that candles should no longer be carried about on Candlemas Day, ashes on Ash Wednesday, palms on Palm Sunday. These were ancient religious practices, now termed superstitions, though it is fortunate for mankind when superstition happens to take a direction so innocent and inoffensive. The severe disposition which naturally attends all reformers prompted likewise the council to abolish some gay and showy ceremonies which belonged to the ancient religion. An order was also issued by council for the removal of all images from the churches, an innovation which was much desired by the reformers, and which alone, with regard to the populace, amounted almost to a total change of the established religion. An attempt had been made to separate the use of images from their abuse, the reverence from the worship of them, but the execution of this design was found, upon trial, very difficult, if not wholly impracticable. As private masses were abolished by law, it became necessary to compose a new communion service, and the council went so far in the preface which they prefixed to this work as to leave the practice of auricular confession wholly indifferent. This was a prelude to the entire abolition of that invention, one of the most powerful engines that ever was contrived for degrading the laity and giving their spiritual guides an entire ascendant over them. And it may justly be said that, though the priest's absolution, which attends confession, serves somewhat to ease weak minds from the immediate agonies of superstitious terror, it operates only by enforcing superstition itself, and thereby preparing the mind for a more violent relapse into the same disorders. The people were at that time extremely distracted by the opposite opinions of their preachers, and as they were totally unable to judge of the reasons advanced on either side, and naturally regarded everything which they heard at church as of equal authority, a great confusion and fluctuation resulted from this uncertainty. The council had first endeavored to remedy the inconvenience by laying some restraints on preaching, but finding this expedient ineffectual, they imposed a total silence on the preachers, and thereby put an end at once to all the polemics of the pulpit. By the nature of things, this restraint could only be temporary, for in proportion as the ceremonies of public worship, it shows and exterior observances, were retrenched by the reformers. The people were inclined to contract a stronger attachment to sermons, whence alone they received any occupation or amusement. The ancient religion, by giving its votaries something to do, freed them from the trouble of thinking. Sermons were delivered only in the principal churches and at some particular fasts and festivals, and the practice of haranguing the populace, which, if abused, is so powerful an incitement to faction and sedition, had much less scope and influence during those ages. 
the greater progress was made towards a reformation in England, the farther did the protector find himself from all prospect of completing the union with Scotland, and the queen dowager, as well as the clergy, became the more averse to all alliance with a nation which had so far departed from all ancient principles. Somerset, having taken the town of Haddington, had ordered it to be strongly garrisoned and fortified by Lord Grey. He also erected some fortifications at Lauder, and he hoped that these two places, together with Broughty and some smaller fortresses which were in the hands of the English, would serve as a curb on Scotland, and would give him access into the heart of the country. Arran, being disappointed in some attempts on Broughty, relied chiefly on the succors expected from France for the recovery of these places, and they arrived at last in the Frith to the number of six thousand men, half of them Germans. They were commanded by Dessa, and under him by Andelo, Strozzi, Meire, and Count Heingrave. The Scots were at that time so sunk by their misfortunes that five hundred English horse were able to ravage the whole country without resistance, and make inroads to the gates of the capital. But on the appearance of the French succors, they collected more courage, and having joined Dessa with a considerable reinforcement, they laid siege to Haddington. This was an undertaking for which they were by themselves totally unfit, and even with the assistance of the French, they placed their chief hopes of success in starving the garrison. After some vain attempts to take the place by a regular siege, the blockade was formed, and the garrison was repulsed with loss in several sallies which they made upon the besiegers. The hostile attempts which the late king and the protector had made against Scotland, not being steady, regular, nor pushed to the last extremity, had served only to irritate the nation, and to inspire them with the strongest aversion to that union which was courted in so violent a manner. Even those who were inclined to the English alliance were displeased to have it imposed on them by force of arms, and the Earl of Huntley in particular said— pleasantly, that he disliked not the match, but he hated the manner of wooing. The Queen Dowager, finding these sentiments to prevail, called a Parliament in an abbey near Haddington, and it was there proposed that the young Queen, for her greater security, should be sent to France, and be committed to the custody of that ancient ally. Some objected that this measure was desperate, allowed no resource in case of miscarriage, exposed the Scots to be subjected by foreigners, involved them in perpetual war with England, and left them no expedient by which they could conciliate the friendship of that powerful nation. It was answered, on the other hand, that the Queen's presence was the very cause of war with England, that that nation would desist when they found that their views of forcing a marriage had become altogether impracticable, and that Henry, being engaged by so high a mark of confidence, would take their sovereign under his protection, and use his utmost efforts to defend the kingdom. These arguments were aided by French gold, which was plentifully distributed among the nobles. The governor had a pension conferred on him of twelve thousand livres a year, received the title of Duke of Chateauroux, and obtained for his son the command of a hundred men-at-arms. And as the clergy dreaded the consequences of the English alliance, they seconded this measure with all the zeal and industry which either principle or interest could inspire. It was accordingly determined to send the Queen to France, and, what was understood to be the necessary consequence, to marry her to the Dauphin. Villegagnon, commander of four French galleys lying in the Frith of Forth, set sail as if he intended to return home. But when he reached the open sea, he turned northwards, passed by the Orkneys, and came in on the west coast at Dunbarton, an extraordinary voyage for ships of that fabric. The young queen was there committed to him, and, being attended by the lords Erskine and Livingstone, she put to sea, and after meeting with some tempestuous weather, 
arrived safely at Brest when she was conducted to Paris, and soon after she was betrothed to the Dauphin. Somerset, pressed by many difficulties at home, and despairing of success in his enterprise against Scotland, was desirous of composing the differences with that kingdom, and he offered the Scots a ten years' truce. But as they insisted on his restoring all the places which he had taken, the proposal came to nothing. The Scots recovered the fortresses of Hume and Fastcastle by surprise, and put the garrisons to the sword. They repulsed with loss the English, who, under the command of Lord Seymour, made a descent, first in Fife, then at Montrose. In the former action, James Stuart, natural brother to the Queen, acquired honour. In the latter, Erskine of Dunn. An attempt was made by Sir Robert Bowes and Sir Thomas Palmer, at the head of a considerable body, to throw relief into Haddington. But these troops, falling into an ambuscade, were almost wholly cut in pieces. And though a small body of two hundred men escaped all the vigilance of the French, and arrived safely in Haddington with some ammunition and provisions— the garrison was reduced to such difficulties that the protector found it necessary to provide more effectually for their relief. He raised an army of 18,000 men, and adding 3,000 Germans, who, on the dissolution of the Protestant alliance, had offered their service to England, he gave the command of the whole to the Earl of Shrewsbury. Dessa raised the blockade on the approach of the English, and with great difficulty made good his retreat to Edinburgh, where he posted himself advantageously. Shrewsbury, who had lost the opportunity of attacking him on his march, durst not give him battle in his present situation, and contenting himself with the advantage already gained of supplying Haddington, he retired into England." Though the protection of France was of great consequence to the Scots in supporting them against the invasions of England, they reaped still more benefit from the distractions and divisions which had crept into the councils of this latter kingdom. Even the two brothers, the protector and admiral, not content with the high stations which they severally enjoyed, and the great eminence to which they had risen, had entertained the most violent jealousy of each other, and they divided the whole court and kingdom by their opposite cabals and pretensions. Lord Seymour was a man of insatiable ambition, arrogant, assuming, implacable, and though esteemed of superior capacity to the protector, he possessed not to the same degree the confidence and regard of the people." By his flattery and address, he had so insinuated himself into the good graces of the Queen Dowager, that, forgetting her usual prudence and decency, she married him immediately upon the demise of the late king, insomuch that, had she soon proved pregnant, it might have been doubtful to which husband the child belonged." The credit and riches of this alliance supported the ambition of the admiral, but gave umbrage to the Duchess of Somerset, who, uneasy that the younger brother's wife should have the precedency, employed all her credit with her husband, which was too great, first to create, then to widen the breach between the two brothers. The first symptoms of this misunderstanding appeared when the protector commanded the army in Scotland. Secretary Paget, a man devoted to Somerset, remarked that Seymour was forming separate intrigues among the councillors, was corrupting by presence the king's servants, and even endeavouring, by improper indulgences and liberalities, to captivate the affections of the young monarch. Paget represented to him the danger of this conduct, desired him to reflect on the numerous enemies whom the sudden elevation of their family had created, and warned him that any dissension between him and the protector would be greedily laid hold of to effect the ruin of both. Finding his remonstrances neglected, he conveyed intelligence of the danger to Somerset, and engaged him to leave the enterprise upon Scotland unfinished, in order to guard against the attempts of his domestic enemies. 
In the ensuing Parliament, the Admiral's projects appeared still more dangerous to public tranquillity, and as he had acquired many partisans, he made a direct attack upon his brother's authority. He represented to his friends that formerly, during a minority, the office of Protector of the Kingdom had been kept separate from that of Governor of the King's person, and that the present union of these two important trusts conferred on Somerset an authority which could not safely be lodged in any subject. The young king was even prevailed on to write a letter to the Parliament desiring that Seymour might be appointed his governor, and that nobleman had formed a party in the two houses by which he hoped to effect his purpose. The design was discovered before its execution, and some common friends were sent to remonstrate with him, but had so little influence that he threw out many menacing expressions, and rashly threatened that, if he were thwarted in his attempt, he would make this Parliament the blackest that ever sat in England. The council sent for him to answer for his conduct, but he refused to attend. They then began to threaten in their turn, and informed him that the king's letter, instead of availing him anything to the execution of his views, would be imputed to him as a criminal enterprise, and be construed as a design to disturb the government by forming a separate interest with a child and minor. They even let fall some menaces of sending him to the tower for his temerity, and the admiral, finding himself prevented in his design, was obliged to submit, and to desire a reconciliation with his brother. End of Section 38 Chapter 34 Part 3 Recording by Rebecca Shertuti Section 39 of Volume 1C of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1C, Section 39, Chapter 34, Part 4. The mild and moderate temper of Somerset made him willing to forget these enterprises of the admiral, but the ambition of that turbulent spirit could not be so easily appeased. His spouse, the Queen Dowager, died in childbed, but so far from regarding this event as a check to his aspiring views, he founded on it the scheme of a more extraordinary elevation. He made his addresses to the Lady Elizabeth, then in the sixteenth year of her age, and that princess, whom even the hurry of business and the pursuits of ambition could not, in her more advanced years, disengage entirely from the tender passions, seems to have listened to the insinuations of a man who possessed every talent proper to captivate the affections of the fair. But as Henry the Eighth had excluded his daughters from all hopes of succession if they married without the consent of his executors, which Seymour could never hope to obtain, it was concluded that he meant to effect his purpose by expedients still more rash and more criminal. All the other measures of the admiral tended to confirm this suspicion. He continued to attack, by presence, the fidelity of those who had more immediate access to the king's person. He endeavoured to seduce the young prince into his interest. He found means of holding a private correspondence with him. He openly decried his brother's administration, and asserted that, by enlisting Germans and other foreigners, he intended to form a mercenary army, which might endanger the king's authority and the liberty of the people. By promises and persuasion he brought over to his party many of the principal nobility, 
and had extended his interest all over England. He neglected not even the most popular persons of inferior rank, and had computed that he could, on occasion, muster an army of ten thousand men, composed of his servants, tenants, and retainers. He had already provided arms for their use, and having engaged in his interests Sir John Sherrington, a corrupt man, master of the mint at Bristol, he flattered himself that money would not be wanting. Somerset was well apprised of all these alarming circumstances, and endeavoured by the most friendly expedients, by entreaty, reason, and even by heaping new favours upon the admiral, to make him desist from his dangerous counsels. But finding all endeavours ineffectual, he began to think of more severe remedies. The Earl of Warwick was an ill instrument between the brothers, and had formed the design, by inflaming the quarrel, to raise his own fortune on the ruins of both. Dudley, Earl of Warwick, was the son of that Dudley, minister to Henry the Seventh, who, having by rapine, extortion, and perversion of law, incurred the hatred of the public, had been sacrificed to popular animosity in the beginning of the subsequent reign. The late king, sensible of the iniquity, at least illegality, of the sentence, had afterwards restored young Dudley's blood by act of Parliament, and finding him endowed with abilities, industry, and activity, he had entrusted him with many important commands, and had ever found him successful in his undertakings. He raised him to the dignity of Viscount Lyle, conferred on him the office of admiral, and gave him by his will a place among his executors. Dudley made still further progress during the minority, and having obtained the title of Earl of Warwick, and undermined the credit of Southampton, he bore the chief rank among the protector's counsellors. The victory gained at Pinckney was much ascribed to his courage and conduct and he was universally regarded as a man equally endowed with the talents of peace and of war. But all these virtues were obscured by still greater vices. An exorbitant ambition, an insatiable avarice, a neglect of decency, a contempt of justice, and as he found that Lord Seymour, whose abilities and enterprising spirit he chiefly dreaded, was involving himself in ruin by his rash counsels, he was determined to push him on the precipice, and thereby remove the chief obstacle to his own projected greatness. When Somerset found that the public peace was endangered by his brother's seditious, not to say rebellious, schemes, he was the more easily persuaded by Warwick to employ the extent of royal authority against him and after depriving him of the office of admiral, he signed a warrant for committing him to the tower. Some of his accomplices were also taken into custody, and three privy councillors. Being sent to examine them, made a report that they had met with very full and important discoveries. Yet still the protector suspended the blow, and showed a reluctance to ruin his brother. He offered to desist from the prosecution if Seymour would promise him a cordial reconciliation, and renouncing all ambitious hopes, be contented with a private life, and retire into the country. But as Seymour made no other answer to these friendly offers than menaces and defiances, he ordered a charge to be drawn up against him, consisting of thirty-three articles, and the whole to be laid before the Privy Council. It is pretended that every particular was so incontestably proved, both by witnesses and his own handwriting, that there was no room for doubt. Yet did the Council think proper to go in a body to the Tower, in order more fully to examine the prisoner. He was not daunted by the appearance. 
he boldly demanded a fair trial, required to be confronted with the witnesses, desired that the charge might be left with him in order to be considered, and refused to answer any interrogatories by which he might accuse himself. It is apparent that, notwithstanding what is pretended, there must have been some deficiency in the evidence against Seymour, when such demands, founded on the plainest principles of law and equity, were absolutely rejected. We shall indeed conclude, if we carefully examine the charge, that many of the articles were general, and scarcely capable of any proof. Many of them, if true, susceptible of a more favourable interpretation, and that though, on the whole, Seymour appears to have been a dangerous subject, he had not advanced far in those treasonable projects imputed to him. The chief part of his actual guilt seems to have consisted in some unwarrantable practices in the admiralty, by which pirates were protected and illegal impositions laid upon the merchants. But the administration had at that time an easy instrument of vengeance, to wit the Parliament, and needed not to give themselves any concern with regard either to the guilt of the persons whom they prosecuted, or the evidence which could be produced against them. A session of Parliament being held, it was resolved to proceed against Seymour by Bill of Attainder, and the young king being induced, after much solicitation, to give his consent to it, a considerable weight was put on his approbation. The matter was first laid before the upper house, and several peers, rising up in their places, gave an account of what they knew concerning Lord Seymour's conduct and his criminal words or actions. These narratives were received as undoubted evidence, and though the prisoner had formerly engaged many friends and partisans among the nobility, no one had either the courage or equity to move that he might be heard in his defence, that the testimony against him should be delivered in a legal manner, and that he should be confronted with the witnesses. A little more scruple was made in the House of Commons. There were even some members who objected against the whole method of proceeding by Bill of Attainder passed in absence, and insisted that a former trial should be given to every man before his condemnation. But when a message was sent by the King, enjoining the House to proceed, and offering that the same narratives should be laid before them which had satisfied the peers, they were easily prevailed on to acquiesce. The bill passed in a full house. Nearly four hundred voted for it, not above nine or ten against it. The sentence was soon after executed, and the prisoner was beheaded on Tower Hill. The warrant was signed by Somerset, who was exposed to much blame on account of the violence of these proceedings. The attempts of the admiral seem chiefly to have been levelled against his brother's usurped authority, and though his ambitious, enterprising character, encouraged by a marriage with the Lady Elizabeth, might have endangered the public tranquillity, the prudence of foreseeing evils at such a distance was deemed too great, and the remedy was plainly illegal. It could only be said that this bill of attainder was somewhat more tolerable than the preceding ones, to which the nation had been inured, for here at least some shadow of evidence was produced. All the considerable business transacted this session, besides the attainder of Lord Seymour, regarded ecclesiastical affairs, which were now the chief object of attention throughout the nation. A committee of bishops and divines had been appointed by the council to compose a liturgy, and they had executed the work committed to them. They proceeded with moderation in this delicate undertaking. They retained as much of the ancient mass as the principles of the reformers would permit. 
they indulged nothing to the spirit of contradiction which so naturally takes place in all great innovations and they flattered themselves that they had established a service in which every denomination of christians might without scruple concur the mass had always been celebrated in latin a practice which might have been deemed absurd had it not been found useful to the clergy by impressing the people with an idea of some mysterious unknown virtue in those rites and by checking all their pretensions to be familiarly acquainted with their religion but as the reformers pretended in some few particulars to encourage private judgment in the laity the translation of the liturgy as well as of the scriptures into the vulgar tongue seemed more conformable to the genius of their sect and this innovation with the retrenching of prayers to saints and of some superstitious ceremonies was the chief difference between the old mass and the new liturgy the parliament established this form of worship in all the churches and ordained a uniformity to be observed in all the rites and ceremonies there was another material act which passed this session the former canons had established the celibacy of the clergy and though this practice is usually ascribed to the policy of the court of rome who thought that the ecclesiastics would be more devoted to their spiritual head and less dependent on the civil magistrate when freed from the powerful tie of wives and children yet was this institution much forwarded by the principles of superstition inherent in human nature these principles had rendered the panegyrics on an inviolate chastity so frequently among the ancient fathers long before the establishment of celibacy and even this parliament though they enacted a law permitting the marriage of priests yet confess in the preamble that it were better for priests and the ministers of the church to live chaste and without marriage and it were much to be wished they would of themselves abstain the inconveniences which had arisen from the compelling of chastity and the prohibiting of marriage are the reasons assigned for indulging a liberty in this particular the ideas of penance also were so much retained in other particulars that an act of parliament passed forbidding the use of flesh meat during lent and other times of abstinence the principal tenets and practices of the catholic religion were now abolished and the reformation such as it is enjoyed at present was almost entirely completed in england but the doctrine of the real presence though tacitly condemned by the new communion service and by the abolition of many ancient rites still retained some hold on the minds of men and it was the last doctrine of popery that was wholly abandoned by the people the great attachment of the late king to that tenet might in part be the ground of this obstinacy but the chief cause was really the extreme absurdity of the principle itself and the profound veneration which of course it impressed on the imagination the priests likewise were much inclined to favour an opinion which attributed to them so miraculous a power, and the people who believed that they participated of the very body and blood of their Saviour were loath to renounce so extraordinary and, as they imagined, so salutary a privilege. The general attachment to this dogma was so violent that the Lutherans, notwithstanding their separation from Rome, had thought proper under another name still to retain it and the catholic preachers in england when restrained in all other particulars could not forbear on every occasion inculcating that tenet bonner for this offence among others had been tried by the council had been deprived of his see and had been committed to custody gardiner also who had recovered his liberty appeared anew refractory to the authority which established the late innovations 
and he seemed willing to countenance that opinion, much favoured by all the English Catholics, that the king was indeed supreme head of the church, but not the council during a minority. Having declined to give full satisfaction on this head, he was sent to the tower, and threatened with further effects of the council's displeasure. These severities, being exercised on men possessed of office and authority, seemed in that age a necessary policy, in order to enforce a uniformity in public worship and discipline. But there were other instances of persecution derived from no origin but the bigotry of theologians, a malady which seems almost incurable. Though the Protestant divines had ventured to renounce opinions deemed certain during many ages, they regarded in their turn the new system as so certain that they would suffer no contradiction with regard to it, and they were ready to burn in the same flames from which they themselves had so narrowly escaped every one that had the assurance to differ from them. A commission, by act of council, was granted to the primate and some others to examine and search after all Anabaptists, heretics, or contemners of the Book of Common Prayer. The commissioners were enjoined to reclaim them if possible, to impose penance on them, and to give them absolution, or, if these criminals were obstinate, to excommunicate and imprison them and to deliver them over to the secular arm, and in the execution of this charge they were not bound to observe the ordinary methods of trial. The forms of law were dispensed with, and if any statutes happened to interfere with the powers in the commission, they were overruled and abrogated by the council. Some tradesmen in London were brought before these commissioners, and were accused of maintaining, among other opinions, that a man regenerate could not sin, and that though the outward man might offend, the inward was incapable of all guilt. They were prevailed on to abjure, and were dismissed. But there was a woman accused of heretical pravity, called Joan Botcher, or Joan of Kent, who was so pertinacious that the commissioners could make no impression upon her doctrine, was that Christ was not truly incarnate of the Virgin, whose flesh, being the outward man, was sinfully begotten, and born in sin, and consequently he could take none of it. But the word, by the consent of the inward man of the Virgin, was made flesh." This opinion, it would seem, is not orthodox, and there was a necessity for delivering the woman to the flames for maintaining it. But the young king, though in such tender years, had more sense than all his counsellors and preceptors, and he long refused to sign the warrant for her execution. Cranmer was employed to persuade him to compliance, and he said that there was such a great difference between errors in other points of divinity and those which were in direct contradiction to the Apostles' Creed. These latter were impieties against God, which the Prince, being God's deputy, ought to repress in like manner as inferior magistrates were bound to punish offences against the King's person. Edward, overcome by importunity, at last submitted, though with tears in his eyes, and he told Cranmer that if any wrong were done, the guilt should lie entirely on his head. The primate, after making a new effort to reclaim the woman from her errors, and finding her obstinate against all his arguments, at last committed her to the flames. Some time after, a Dutchman, called Van Paris, accused of the heresy which has received the name of Arianism, was condemned to the same punishment. He suffered with so much satisfaction that he hugged and caressed the faggots that were consuming him, a species of frenzy of which there is more than one instance 
among the martyrs of that age. These rigorous methods of proceeding soon brought the whole nation to a conformity, seeming or real, with the new doctrine and the new liturgy. The Lady Mary alone continued to adhere to the Mass, and refused to admit the established modes of worship. When pressed and menaced on this head, she applied to the Emperor, who, using his interest with Sir Philip Hobby, the English ambassador, procured her a temporary connivance from the council. End of section 39, chapter 34, part 4. Section 40 of Volume 1C of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1C Section 40, Chapter 35, Part 1 Edward the Sixth. There is no abuse so great in civil society as not to be attended with a variety of beneficial consequence, and in the beginnings of Reformation the loss of these advantages is always felt very sensibly, while the benefit resulting from the change is the slow effect of time and is seldom perceived by the bulk of a nation. Scarce any institution can be imagined less favourable, in the main, to the interests of mankind than that of monks and friars. Yet was it followed by many good effects, which having seized by the suppression of monasteries, were much regretted by the people of England. The monks, always residing in their convents in the centre of their estates, spent their money in the provinces and among their tenants, afforded a ready market for commodities, were a sure resource to the poor and indigent, and though their hospitality and charity gave but too much encouragement to idleness and prevented the increase of public riches, yet did it provide to many a relief from the extreme pressures of want and necessity. It is also observable that as the friars were limited by the rules of their institution to a certain mode of living, they had not equal motives for extortion with other men, and they were acknowledged to have been in England, as they still are in Roman Catholic countries, the best and most indulgent landlords. The abbots and priors were permitted to give leases at an undervalue, and to receive in return a large present from the tenant, in the same manner as is still practised by the bishops and colleges. But when the abbey lands were distributed among the principal nobility and courtiers, they fell under a different management. The rents of farms were raised, while the tenants found not the same facility in disposing of the produce. The money was often spent in the capital, and the farmers living at a distance were exposed to oppression from their new masters, or to the still greater rapacity of the stewards. These grievances of the common people were at that time heightened by other causes. The arts of manufacture were much more advanced in other European countries than in England, and even in England these arts had made greater progress than the knowledge of agriculture, a profession which of all mechanical employments requires the most reflection and experience. A great demand arose for wool both abroad and at home. Pasturage was found more profitable than unskilled tillage. Whole estates were laid waste by enclosures. The tenants regarded as a useless burden, were expelled their habitations. Even the cottagers, deprived of the commons on which they formerly fed their cattle, were reduced to misery, and a decay of people, as well as a diminution of the former plenty, was remarked in the kingdom. 
This grievance was now of an old date, and Sir Thomas More, alluding to it, observes in his Utopia that a sheep had become in England a more ravenous animal than a lion or wolf, and devoured whole villages, cities, and provinces. The general increase, also, of gold and silver in Europe, after the discovery of the West Indies, had a tendency to inflame these complaints. The growing demand in the more commercial countries had heightened everywhere the price of commodities, which could easily be transported thither. But in England the labour of men who could not so easily change their habitation still remained nearly at the ancient rates, and the poor complained that they could no longer gain a subsistence by their industry. It was by an addition alone of toil and application they were enabled to procure a maintenance, and though this increase of industry was at last the effect of the present situation, and an effect beneficial to society, yet was it difficult for the people to shake off their former habits of indolence, and nothing but necessity could compel them to such an exertion of their faculties. It must also be remarked that the profusion of Henry the Eighth had reduced him, notwithstanding his rapacity to such difficulties, that he had been obliged to remedy a present necessity by the pernicious expedient of debasing the coin, and the wars in which the protector had been involved had induced him to carry still further the same abuse. The usual consequences ensued. The good specie was hoarded or exported, base metal was coined at home, or imported from abroad in great abundance. The common people, who received their wages in it, could not purchase commodities at the usual rates. A universal diffidence and stagnation of commerce took place, and loud complaints were heard in every part of England. The protector, who loved popularity and pitied the condition of the people, encouraged these complaints by his endeavours to address them. He appointed a commission for making inquiry concerning enclosures, and issued a proclamation ordering all late enclosures to be laid open by a day appointed. The populace, meeting with such countenance from government, began to rise in several places and to commit disorders, but were quieted by remonstrances and persuasion. In order to give them greater satisfaction, Somerset appointed new commissioners, whom he sent everywhere with an unlimited power to hear and determine all causes about enclosures, highways, and cottages, as this commission was disagreeable to the gentry and nobility, they stigmatized it as arbitrary and illegal, and the common people, fearing it would be eluded, and being impatient for immediate redress, could no longer contain their fury, but sought for a remedy by force of arms. The rising began at once in several parts of England, as if a universal conspiracy had been formed by the commonality. The rebels in Wiltshire were dispersed by Sir William Herbert. Those in the neighbouring counties, Oxford and Gloucester, by Lord Grey of Wilton. Many of the rioters were killed in the field. Others were executed by martial law. The commotions in Hampshire, Sussex, Kent, and other counties were quieted by gentler expedients, but the disorders in Devonshire and Norfolk threatened more dangerous consequences. The commonality in Devonshire began with the usual complaints against enclosures and against oppressions from the gentry, but the parish priest of Sampford Courtney had the address to give their discontent a direction towards religion, and the delicacy of the subject in the present emergency made the insurrection immediately appear formidable. In other counties the gentry had kept closely united with government, 
But here many of them took part with the populace, among others Humphrey Arundel, governor of St. Michael's Mount. The rioters were brought into the form of a regular army, which amounted to the number of ten thousand. Lord Russell had been sent against them at the head of a small force, but finding himself too weak to encounter them in the field, he kept at a distance and began to negotiate with them, in hopes of eluding their fury by delay, and of dispersing them by the difficulty of their subsisting in a body. Their demands were that the mass should be restored, half of the abbey lands resumed, the law of the six articles executed, holy water and holy bread respected, and all other particular grievances redressed. The council, to whom Russell transmitted these demands, sent a haughty answer, commanded the rebels to disperse, and promised them pardon upon their immediate submission. Enraged at this disappointment, they marched to Exeter, carrying before them crosses, banners, holy water, candlesticks, and other implements of ancient superstition, together with the host which they covered with a canopy. The citizens of Exeter shut their gates, and the rebels, as they had no cannon, endeavoured to take the place, first by scalade, then by mining, but were repulsed in every attempt. Russell, meanwhile, lay at Honiton till reinforced by Sir William Herbert and Lord Grey with some German horse, and some Italian arquebusiers under Battista Spinola. He then resolved to attempt the relief of Exeter, which was now reduced to extremities. He attacked the rebels, drove them from all their posts, did great execution upon them both in the action and pursuit, and took many prisoners. Arundel and the other leaders were sent to London, tried and executed. Many of the inferior sort were put to death by martial law. The vicar of St. Thomas, one of the principal incendiaries, was hanged on the top of his own steeple, arrayed in his popish weeds, with his beads at his girdle. The insurrection in Norfolk rose to a still greater height, and was attended with greater acts of violence. The populace were at first excited, as in other places, by complaints against enclosures. But finding their numbers amount to twenty thousand, they grew insolent, and proceeded to more exorbitant pretensions. They required the suppression of the gentry, the placing of new councillors about the king, and the re-establishment of the ancient rites. One Ket, a tanner, had assumed the government over them, and he exercised his authority with the utmost arrogance and outrage. Having taken possession of Mousehold Hill near Norwich, he erected his tribunal under an old oak, thence called the Oak of Reformation, and summoning the gentry to appear before him, he gave such decrees as might be expected from his character and situation. The Marquis of Northampton was first ordered against him, but met with a repulse in an action where Lord Sheffield was killed. The protector affected popularity, and cared not to appear in person against the rebels. He therefore sent the Earl of Warwick at the head of six thousand men, levied for the wars against Scotland, and he thereby afforded his mortal enemy an opportunity of increasing his reputation and character. Warwick, having tried some skirmishes with the rebels, at last made a general attack upon them, and put them to flight. Two thousand fell in the action and pursuit. Ket was hanged at Norwich Castle, nine of his followers on the boughs of the Oak of Reformation, and the insurrection was entirely suppressed. Some rebels in Yorkshire, learning the fate of their companions, accepted the offers of pardon, and threw down their arms. A general indemnity was soon after published by the protector. But though the insurrections were thus quickly subdued in England, 
and no traces of them seemed to remain, they were attended with bad consequences to the foreign interests of the nation. The forces of the Earl of Warwick, which might have made a great impression on Scotland, were diverted from that enterprise, and the French general had leisure to reduce that country to some settlement and composure. He took the fortress of Brawty, and put the garrison to the sword. He straitened the English at Haddington, and though Lord Dacres was unable to throw relief into the place, and to reinforce the garrison, it was found at last very chargeable, and even impracticable, to keep possession of that fortress. The whole country in the neighbourhood was laid waste by the inroads both of the Scots and English, and could afford no supply to the garrison. The place lay above thirty miles from the borders, so that a regular army was necessary to escort any provisions thither, and as the plague had broken out among the troops they perished daily, and were reduced to a state of great weakness. For these reasons orders were given to dismantle Haddington, and to convey the artillery and garrison to Berwick, and the Earl of Rutland, now created warden of the East Marches, executed the orders. The King of France also took advantage of the distractions among the English, and made an attempt to recover Boulogne and that territory which Henry the Eighth had conquered from France. On other pretenses he assembled an army, and falling suddenly upon the Boulonnois, took the castles of Selac, Blackness, and Ambletois, though well supported with garrisons, ammunition, and provisions. He endeavoured to surprise Bullenberg, and was repulsed, but the garrison, not thinking the place tenable after the loss of the other forces, destroyed the works, and retired to Boulogne. The rains, which fell in great abundance during the autumn, and a pestilential distemper which broke out in the French camp, deprived Henry of all hopes of success against Boulogne itself, and he retired to Paris. He left the command of the army to Gaspard del Coligny, Lord of Châtillon, so famous afterwards by the name of Admiral Coligny, and he gave him orders to form the siege early in the spring. The active disposition of this general engaged him to make, during the winter, several attempts against the place, but they all proved unsuccessful. Strozzi, who commanded the French fleet and galleys, endeavoured to make a descent on Jersey, but meeting there with an English fleet, he commenced an action which seems not to have been decisive, since the historians of the two nations differ in their account of the event. As soon as the French war broke out, the protector endeavoured to fortify himself with the alliance of the emperor, and he sent over Secretary Paget to Brussels, where Charles then kept court, in order to assist Sir Philip Hobby, the resident ambassador in this negotiation. But that prince had formed a design of extending his dominions by acting the part of champion for the Catholic religion, and though extremely desirous of accepting the English alliance against France, his capital enemy, he thought it unsuitable to his other pretensions to enter into strict confederacy with a nation which had broken off all connections with the Church of Rome. He therefore declined the advances of friendship from England, and eluded the applications of the ambassadors. An exact account is preserved of this negotiation in a letter of hobbies, and it is remarkable that the emperor, in a conversation with the English ministers, asserted that the prerogatives of a king of England were more extensive than those of a king of France. Burnet, who preserves this letter, subjoins as a parallel instance that one objection which the Scots made to marrying their queen with Edward was that all their privileges would be swallowed up by the great prerogative of the kings of England. Somerset, despairing of assistance from the emperor, was inclined to conclude a peace with France and Scotland, and besides that he was not in a condition to maintain such ruinous wars, 
he thought that there no longer remained any object of hostility. The Scots had sent away their queen, and could not, if ever so much inclined, complete the marriage contracted with Edward, and as Henry the Eighth had stipulated to restore Boulogne in 1554, it seemed a matter of small moment to anticipate a few years the execution of the treaty. But when he proposed these reasons to the council, he met with strong opposition from his enemies, who, seeing him unable to support the war, were determined for that very reason to oppose all proposals for a pacification. The factions ran high in the court of England, and matters were drawing to an issue fatal to the authority of the protector. After Somerset obtained the patent, investing him with regal authority, he no longer paid any attention to the opinion of the other executors and councillors, and being elated with his high dignity, as well as with his victory at Pinky, he thought that every one ought in every thing to yield to his sentiments. All those who were not entirely devoted to him were sure to be neglected. Whoever opposed his will received marks of anger or contempt, and while he showed a resolution to govern everything, his capacity appeared not in any respect proportioned to his ambition. Warwick, more subtle and artful, covered more exorbitant views under fairer appearances, and having associated himself with Southampton, who had been readmitted into the council, he formed a strong party who were determined to free themselves from the slavery imposed upon them by the protector. The malcontent councillors found the disposition of the nation favourable to their designs, the nobility and gentry were in general displeased with the preference which Somerset seemed to have given to the people, and as they ascribed all the insults to which they had been lately exposed to his procrastination and to the countenance shown to the multitude, they apprehended a renewal of the same disorders from his present affectation of popularity. He had erected a court of requests in his own house for the relief of the people, and he interposed with the judges in their behalf a measure which might be deemed illegal if any exertion of prerogative at that time could with certainty deserve that appellation, and this attempt, which was a stretch of power, seemed the more impolitic, because it disgusted the nobles the surest support of monarchical authority. But though Somerset courted the people, the interest which he had formed with them was in no degree answerable to his expectations. The Catholic party who retained influence with the lower ranks were his declared enemies, and took advantage of every opportunity to decry his conduct. The attainder and execution of his brother bore an odious aspect. The introduction of foreign troops into the kingdom was represented in invidious colours. The great estate which he had suddenly acquired at the expense of the church and of the crown rendered him obnoxious, and the palace which he was building in the Strand served by its magnificence and still more by other circumstances which attended it, to expose him to the censure of the public. The parish church of St. Mary, with three bishops' houses, was pulled down, in order to furnish ground and materials for this structure. Not content with that sacrilege, an attempt was made to demolish St. Margaret's Westminster, and to employ the stones to the same purpose, but the parishioners rose in a tumult and chased away the protector's tradesmen. He then laid his hands on a chapel in St. Paul's churchyard, with a cloister and charnel house belonging to it, and these edifices, together with a church of St. John and Jerusalem, were made use of to raise his palace. What rendered the matter more odious to the people was that the tombs and other monuments of the dead were defaced, and the bones being carried away were buried in unconsecrated ground. End of section 40
Chapter Thirty Five, Part One. Section Forty One of Volume One C of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of Sixteen Eighty Eight. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume, Volume 1C, Section 41, Chapter 35, Part 2. All these imprudences were remarked by Somerset's enemies, who resolved to take advantage of them. Lord St. John, President of the Council, the Earls of Warwick, Southampton and Arundel, with five members more, met at Ely House, and, assuming to themselves the whole power of the council, began to act independently of the protector, whom they represented as the author of every public grievance and misfortune. They wrote letters to the chief nobility and gentry in England, informing them of the present measures, and requiring their assistance. They sent for the mayor and aldermen of London, and enjoined them to obey their orders, without regard to any contrary orders which they might receive from the Duke of Somerset. They laid the same injunctions on the lieutenant of the tower, who expressed his resolution to comply with them. Next day, Rich, Lord Chancellor, the Marquis of Northampton, the Earl of Shrewsbury, Sir Thomas Cheney, Sir John Gage, Sir Ralph Sadler, and Chief Justice Montague, joined the malcontent councillors, and everything bore a bad aspect for the protector's authority. Secretary Peter, whom he had sent to treat with the council, rather chose to remain with them, the common council of the city being applied to, declared with one voice their approbation of the new measures, and their resolution of supporting them. As soon as the protector heard of the defection of the councillors, he removed the king from Hampton Court, where he then resided, to the castle of Windsor, and arming his friends and servants, seemed resolute to defend himself against all his enemies. But finding that no man of rank except Cranmer and Paget adhered to him, that the people did not rise at his summons, that the city and tower had declared against him, that even his best friends had deserted him, he lost all hopes of success, and began to apply to his enemies for pardon and forgiveness. No sooner was this despondency known than Lord Russell, Sir John Baker, Speaker of the House of Commons, and three councillors more, who had hitherto remained neuters, joined the party of Warwick, whom every one now regarded as master. The council informed the public by proclamation of their actions and intentions. They wrote to the princesses Mary and Elizabeth to the same purpose, and they made addresses to the king, in which, after the humblest protestations of duty and submission, they informed him that they were the council appointed by his father for the government of the kingdom during his minority, that they had chosen the Duke of Somerset protector under the express condition that he should guide himself by their advice and direction, that he had usurped the whole authority, and had neglected, and even in everything opposed their counsel, that he had proceeded to that height of presumption as to levy forces against them and place these forces about his majesty's person. They therefore begged that they might be admitted to his royal presence, that he would be pleased to restore them to his confidence, and that Somerset's servants might be dismissed. Their request was complied with, Somerset capitulated only for gentle treatment which was promised him. He was, however, sent to the tower with some of his friends and partisans, among whom was Cecil, afterwards so much distinguished. 
Articles of indictment were exhibited against him, of which the chief, at least the best founded, is his usurpation of the government, and his taking into his own hands the whole administration of affairs. The clause of his patent, which invested him with absolute power, unlimited by any law, was never objected to him, plainly because, according to the sentiments of those times, that power was in some degree involved in the very idea of regal authority. The Catholics were extremely elated with this revolution, and as they had ascribed all the late innovations to Somerset's authority, they hoped that his fall would prepare the way for the return of the ancient religion. But Warwick, who now bore chief sway in the council, was entirely indifferent with regard to all these points of controversy, and finding that the principles of the Reformation had sunk deeper into Edward's mind than to be easily eradicated, he was determined to comply with the young prince's inclinations, and not to hazard his new acquired power by any dangerous enterprise. He took care very early to express his intentions of supporting the Reformation, and he threw such discouragements on Southampton, who stood at the head of the Romanists, and whom he considered as a dangerous rival, that the high-spirited nobleman retired from the council, and soon after died from vexation and disappointment. The other councillors who had concurred in the revolution received their reward by promotions and new honours. Russell was created Earl of Bedford. The Marquis of Northampton obtained the office of Great Chamberlain, and Lord Wentworth, besides the office of Chamberlain of the Household, got two large manors, Stepney and Hackney, which were torn from the Sea of London. A Council of Regency was formed, not that which Henry's will had appointed for the government of the kingdom, and which, being founded on an act of Parliament, was the only legal one, but composed chiefly of members who had formerly been appointed by Somerset, and who derived their seat from an authority which was now declared usurped and illegal. But such niceties were, during that age, little understood, and still less regarded, in England. A session of Parliament was held, and as it was the usual maxim of that assembly to acquiesce in every administration which was established, the council dreaded no opposition from that quarter, and had more reason to look for a corroboration of their authority. Somerset had been prevailed upon to confess. On his knees, before the council, all the articles of charge against him, and he imputed these misdemeanours to his own rashness, folly, and indiscretion, not to any malignity of intention. He even subscribed this confession, and the paper was given in to Parliament, who, after sending a committee to examine him, and hear him acknowledge it to be genuine, passed a vote by which they deprived him of all his offices, and fined him two thousand pounds a year in land. Lord St. John was created treasurer in his place, and Warwick Earl Marshal. The prosecution against him was carried no further. His fine was remitted by the king. He recovered his liberty, and Warwick, thinking that he was now sufficiently humbled, and that his authority was much lessened by his late tame and abject behaviour, readmitted him into the council, and even agreed to an alliance between their families by the marriage of his own son, Lord Dudley, with the Lady Jane Seymour, daughter of Somerset. During this session, a severe law was passed against riots, it was enacted that if any to the number of twelve persons should meet together for any matter of state, and being required by a lawful magistrate should not disperse, it should be treason, and if any broke hedges or violently pulled up pails about enclosures without lawful authority, it should be felony. 
any attempt to kill a privy councillor was subjected to the same penalty. The bishops had made an application, complaining that they were deprived of all their power by the encroachments of the civil courts, and the present suspension of the canon law, that they could summon no offender before them, punish no vice, or exert the discipline of the church, from which diminution of their authority they pretended immorality had everywhere received great encouragement and increase. The design of some was to revive the penitentiary rules of the primitive church, but others thought that such an authority committed to the bishops would prove more oppressive than confession, penance, and all the clerical inventions of the Romish superstition. The Parliament, for the present, contented themselves with empowering the King to appoint thirty-two commissioners to compile a body of canon laws, which were to be valid, though never ratified by Parliament. Such implicit trust did they repose in the Crown, without reflecting that all their liberties and properties might be affected by these canons. The King did not live to affix the royal sanction to the new canons. Sir John Sharrington, whose crimes and malversations had appeared so egregious at the condemnation of Lord Seymour, obtained from Parliament a reversal of his attainder. This man sought favour with the more zealous reformers, and Bishop Latimer affirmed that though formerly he had been a most notorious knave, he was now so penitent that he had become a very honest man. When Warwick and the Council of Regency began to exercise their power, they found themselves involved in the same difficulties that had embarrassed the Protector. The wars with France and Scotland could not be supported by an exhausted exchequer, seemed dangerous to a divided nation, and were now acknowledged not to have any object which even the greatest and most uninterrupted success could attain. The project of peace entertained by Somerset had served them as a pretense for clamour against his administration. Yet after sending Sir Thomas Cheney to the Emperor, and making again a fruitless effort to engage him in the protection of Boulogne, they found themselves obliged to listen to the advances which Henry made them by the canal of Guidotti, a Florentine merchant. The Earl of Bedford, Sir John Mason, Paget and Peter, were sent over to Boulogne with full powers to negotiate. The French king absolutely refused to pay the two millions of crowns which his predecessor had acknowledged to be due to the crown of England as arrears of pensions, and said that he never would consent to render himself tributary to any prince. But he offered a sum for the immediate restitution of Boulogne, and four hundred thousand crowns were at last agreed on, one half to be paid immediately, the other in August following. Six hostages were given for the performance of this article. Scotland was comprehended in the treaty, the English stipulated to restore Lauder and Dunglas, and to demolish the fortress of Roxburgh and Eymouth. No sooner was peace concluded with France than a project was entertained of a close alliance with that kingdom, and Henry willingly embraced a proposal so suitable to both his interests and his inclinations. An agreement some time after was formed for a marriage between Edward and Elizabeth, a daughter of France, and all the articles were, after a little negotiation, fully settled. But this project never took effect. The intention of marrying the king to a daughter of Henry, a violent persecutor of the Protestants, was nowise acceptable to that party in England, but in all other respects the council was steady in promoting the Reformation, and in enforcing the laws against the Romanists. Several prelates were still addicted to that communion, and though they made some compliances in order to save their bishoprics, they retarded as much as they safely could the execution of the new laws, and gave countenance to such incumbents as were negligent or refractory. 
a resolution was therefore taken to seek pretenses for depriving those prelates and the execution of this intention was the more easy as they had all of them been obliged to take commissions in which it was declared that they held their sees during the king's pleasures only it was thought proper to begin with gardiner in order to strike a terror into the rest the method of proceeding against him was violent and had scarcely any colour of law or justice injunctions had been given him to inculcate in a sermon the duty of obedience to a king even during his minority and because he had neglected this topic he had been thrown into prison and had been detained there during two years without being accused of any crime except disobedience to this arbitrary command the duke of somerset secretary peter and some others of the council were now sent in order to try his temper and endeavour to find some grounds for depriving him he professed to them his intention of conforming to the government of supporting the king's laws and of officiating by the new liturgy this was not the disposition which they expected or desired a new deputation was therefore sent who carried him several articles to subscribe he was required to acknowledge his former misbehaviour, and to confess the justice of his confinement. He was likewise to own that the king was supreme head of the church, that the power of making and dispensing with holy days was part of the prerogative, that the book of common prayer was a godly and commendable form, that the king was a complete sovereign in his minority, that the law of the six articles was justly repealed, and that the king had full authority to correct and reform what was amiss in ecclesiastical discipline, government, or doctrine. The bishop was willing to set his hand to all the articles except the first. He maintained his conduct to have been inoffensive, and declared that he would not own himself guilty of faults which he had never committed. The council, finding that he had gone to such lengths, were determined to prevent his full compliance by multiplying the difficulties upon him, and sending him new articles to subscribe. A list was selected of such points as they thought would be the hardest of digestion, and, not content with this rigour, they also insisted on his submission and his acknowledgment of past errors. To make this subscription more mortifying, they demanded a promise that he would recommend and publish all these articles from the pulpit. But Gardiner, who saw that they intended either to ruin or dishonour him, or perhaps both, determined not to gratify his enemies by any further compliance. He still maintained his innocence, desired a fair trial, and refused to subscribe more articles till he should recover his liberty. For this pretended offence his bishopric was put under sequestration for three months, and as he then appeared no more compliant than before, a commission was appointed to try, or more properly speaking, to condemn him. The commissioners were the primate, the bishops of London, Eli and Lincoln, secretary peter sir james hales and some other lawyers gardiner objected to the legality of the commission which was not founded on any statute or precedent and he appealed from the commissioners to the king his appeal was not regarded sentence was pronounced against him he was deprived of his bishopric and committed to close custody his books and papers were seized he was secluded from all company, and it was not allowed him either to send or receive any letters or messages. Gardiner, as well as the other prelates, had agreed to hold his office during the king's pleasure. But the council, unwilling to make use of a concession which had been so illegally and arbitrarily extorted, chose rather to employ some forms of justice. 
a resolution which led them to commit still greater iniquities and severities. But the violence of the reformers did not stop there. Day, Bishop of Chichester, Heath of Worcester, and Voisy of Exeter were deprived of their bishoprics on pretense of disobedience. Even Kitchen of Landaff, Capon of Salisbury, and Sampson of Coventry, though they had complied in everything, yet not being supposed cordial in their obedience, were obliged to seek protection by sacrificing the most considerable revenues of their see to the rapacious courtiers. These plunderers neglected not even smaller profits. An order was issued by a council for purging the library at Westminster of all missals, legends, and other superstitious volumes, and delivering their garniture to Sir Anthony Orcher. Many of these books were plated with gold and silver, and curiously embossed, and this finery was probably the superstition that condemned them. Great havoc was likewise made on the libraries at Oxford. Books and manuscripts were destroyed without distinction, the volumes of divinity from the council books suffered for their rich binding. Those of literature were condemned as useless. Those of geometry and astronomy were supposed to contain nothing but necromancy. The university had not power to oppose these barbarous violences. They were in danger of losing their own revenues, and expected every moment to be swallowed up by the Earl of Warwick and his associates. Though every one besides yielded to the authority of the council, the Lady Mary could never be brought to compliance, and she still continued to adhere to the mass, and to reject the new liturgy. Her behaviour was, during some time, connived at, but at last her two chaplains, Mallet and Barclay, were thrown into prison, and remonstrances were made to the princess herself on account of her disobedience. The council wrote her a letter by which they endeavoured to make her change her sentiments, and to persuade her that her religious faith was very ill-grounded. They asked her what warrant there was in scripture for prayers in an unknown tongue, the use of images or offering up the sacrament for the dead, and they desired her to peruse St. Austin and the other ancient doctors who would convince her of the errors of the Romish superstition, and prove that it was founded merely on false miracles and lying stories. The Lady Mary remained obstinate against all this advice, and declared herself willing to endure death rather than relinquish her religion. She only feared, she said, that she was not worthy to suffer martyrdom in so holy a cause. And as for Protestant books, she thanked God that as she never had, so she hoped never to read any of them. Dreading further violence, she endeavoured to make an escape to her kinsman Charles, but her design was discovered and prevented. The emperor remonstrated in her behalf, and even threatened hostilities if liberty of conscience were refused her. But though the council, sensible that the kingdom was in no condition to support with honour such a war, was desirous to comply, they found great difficulty to overcome the scruples of the young king. He had been educated in such a violent abhorrence of the mass and other popish rites, which he regarded as impious and idolatrous, that he should participate, he thought, in the sin, if he allowed its commission. And when at last the importunity of Cranmer, Ridley, and Poinet prevailed somewhat over his opposition, he burst into tears, lamenting his sister's obstinacy, and bewailing his own hard fate, that he must suffer her to continue in such an abominable mode of worship. End of section 41 Chapter 35, Part 2
one c of history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen eighty eight this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org history of england from the invasion of julius caesar to the revolution of sixteen eighty eight by david hume volume one c section forty two Chapter thirty five, part three. The great object at this time of antipathy among the Protestant sects was popery, or more properly speaking, the papists. These they regarded as the common enemy, who threatened every moment to overwhelm the evangelical faith and destroy its partisans by fire and sword. They had not as yet had leisure to attend to the other minute differences among themselves, which afterwards became the object of such furious quarrels and animosities, and threw the whole kingdom into combustion. Several Lutheran divines who had reputation in those days, Bucer, Peter Martyr, and others, were induced to take shelter in England, from the persecutions which the emperor exercised in Germany, and they received protection and encouragement. John Alasco, a Polish nobleman, being expelled his country by the rigours of the Catholics, settled during some time at Embden in East Friesland, where he became preacher to a congregation of the Reformed. Foreseeing the persecutions which ensued, he removed to England and brought his congregation along with him. The council, who regarded them as industrious, useful people, and desired to invite over others of the same character, not only gave them the Church of Augustine Friars for the exercise of their religion, but granted them a charter, by which they were erected into a corporation consisting of a superintendent and four assisting ministers. This ecclesiastical establishment was quite independent of the Church of England, and differed from it in some rites and ceremonies. These differences among the Protestants were matter of triumph to the Catholics, who insisted that the moment men departed from the authority of the Church, they lost all criterion of truth and falsehood in matters of religion, and must be carried away by every wind of doctrine. The continual variations of every sect of Protestants afforded them the same topic of reasoning. The Book of Common Prayer suffered in England a new revisal, and some rites and ceremonies which had given offence were omitted. The speculative doctrines, or the metaphysics of religion, were also reduced to forty-two articles. These were intended to obviate further divisions and variations, and the compiling of them had been postponed till the establishment of the liturgy, which was justly regarded as a more material object to the people. The eternity of hell torments is asserted in this confession of faith, and care is also taken to inculcate not only that no heathen how virtuous soever, can escape an endless state of the most exquisite misery, but also that every one who presumes to maintain that any pagan can possibly be saved, is himself exposed to the penalty of eternal perdition. The theological zeal of the council, though seemingly fervent, went not so far as to make them neglect their own temporal concerns, which seem to have ever been uppermost in their thoughts. They even found leisure to attend to the public interest, nay, to the commerce of the nation, which was, at that time, very little the object of general study or attention. The trade of England had anciently been carried on altogether by foreigners, chiefly the inhabitants of the Hans towns, or Easterlings, as they were called, and in order to encourage these merchants to settle in England, they had been erected into a corporation by Henry the Third, 
had obtained a patent, were endowed with privileges, and were exempted from several heavy duties paid by other aliens. So ignorant were the English of commerce that this company, usually denominated the merchants of the still-yard, engrossed even down to the reign of Edward almost the whole foreign trade of the kingdom, and as they naturally employed the shipping of their own country, the navigation of England was also in a very languishing condition. It was therefore thought proper by the council to seek pretenses for annulling the privileges of this corporation, privileges which put them nearly on an equal footing with Englishmen in the duties which they paid, and as such patents were, during that age, granted by the absolute power of the king, men were the less surprised to find them revoked by the same authority. Several remonstrances were made against this innovation by Lubeck, Hamburg, and other Hans Towns, but the council persevered in their resolution, and the good effects of it soon became visible to the nation. The English merchants, by their very situation as natives, had advantages above foreigners in the purchase of cloth, wool, and other commodities, though these advantages had not hitherto been sufficient to rouse then industry, or engage them to become rivals to this opulent company. But when aliens' duty was also imposed upon all foreigners indiscriminately, the English were tempted to enter into commerce, and a spirit of industry began to appear in the kingdom. About the same time a treaty was made with Gustavus Eriksson, king of Sweden, by which it was stipulated that if he sent bullion into England, he might export English commodities without paying custom, that he should carry bullion to no other prince, that if he sent Ozemus, steel, copper, etc., he should pay custom for English commodities as an Englishman, and that if he sent other merchandise, he should have free intercourse, paying custom as a stranger. The bullion sent over by Sweden, though it could not be in great quantity, set the mint to work, good specie was coined, and much of the base metal formerly issued was recalled, a circumstance which tended extremely to the encouragement of commerce. But all these schemes for promoting industry were likely to prove abortive by the fear of domestic convulsions arising from the ambition of Warwick. That nobleman, not contented with the station which he had attained, carried further his pretensions, and had gained partisans who were disposed to second him in every enterprise. The last Earl of Northumberland died without issue, and as Sir Thomas Piercy, his brother, had been attainted on account of the share which he had in the Yorkshire insurrection during the late reign, the title was at present extinct, and the estate was vested in the crown. Warwick now procured to himself a grant of those ample possessions which lay chiefly in the north, the most warlike part of the kingdom, and was dignified with the title of Duke of Northumberland. His friend Paulet, Lord St. John, the treasurer, was created first Earl of Wiltshire, then Marquis of Winchester. Sir William Herbert obtained the title of Earl of Pembroke. But the ambition of Northumberland made him regard all increase of possessions and titles, either to himself or his artisans, as steps only to further acquisitions. Finding that Somerset, though degraded from his dignity, and even lessened in the public opinion by his spiritless conduct, still enjoyed a considerable share of popularity, he determined to ruin the man whom he regarded as the chief obstacle to the attainment of his hopes. The alliance which had been contracted between the families had produced no cordial union, and only enabled Northumberland to compass with more certainty the destruction of his rival. He secretly gained many of the friends and servants of that unhappy nobleman. 
He sometimes terrified him by the appearance of danger, sometimes provoked him by ill usage. The unguarded Somerset often broke out into menacing expressions against Northumberland. At other times he formed rash projects, which he immediately abandoned. His treacherous confidence carried to his enemy every passionate word which dropped from him. They revealed the schemes which they themselves had first suggested, and Northumberland, thinking that the proper season was now come, began to act in an open manner against him. In one night the Duke of Somerset, Lord Grey, David and John Seymour, Hammond and Newdigate, two of the Duke's servants, Sir Ralph Vane and Sir Thomas Palmer, were arrested and committed to custody. Next day the Duchess of Somerset, with her favourites Crane and his wife Sir Miles Partridge, Sir Michael Stanhope, Bannister and others, was thrown into prison. Sir Thomas Palmer, who had all along acted as a spy upon Somerset, accused him of having formed a design to raise an insurrection in the north, to attack the gendarmes on a muster day, to secure the tower and to raise a rebellion in London. But what was the only probable accusation he asserted, that Somerset had once laid a project for murdering Northumberland, Northampton and Pembroke at a banquet which was to be given them by Lord Paget Crane and his wife, confirmed Palmer's testimony with regard to this last design, and it appears that some rash scheme of that nature had really been mentioned, though no regular conspiracy had been formed, or means prepared for its execution, Hammond confessed that the Duke had armed men to guard him one night in his house at Greenwich. Somerset was brought to his trial before the Marquis of Winchester, created High Steward. Twenty-seven peers composed the jury, among whom were Northumberland, Pembroke, and Northampton, whom decency should have hindered from acting as judges in the trial of a man that appeared to be their capital enemy. Somerset was accused of high treason on account of the projected insurrections and of felony in laying a design to murder privy councillors. We have a very imperfect account of all state trials during that age, which is a sensible defect in our history, but it appears that some more regularity was observed in the management of this prosecution than had usually been employed in like cases. The witnesses were at least examined by the Privy Council, and though they were neither produced in court nor confronted with the prisoner, circumstances required by the strict principles of equity, their depositions were given in to the jury. The proof seems to have been lame with regard to the treasonable part of the charge, and Somerset's defence was so satisfactory that the peers gave verdict in his favour. The intention alone of assaulting the privy councillors was supported by tolerable evidence, and the jury brought him in guilty of felony. The prisoner himself confessed that he had expressed his intention of murdering Northumberland and the other lords, but had not formed any resolution on that head, and when he received sentence he asked pardon of those peers for the designs which he had hearkened to against them. The people, by whom Somerset was beloved, hearing the first part of his sentence by which he was acquitted from treason, expressed their joy by loud acclamations, but their satisfaction was suddenly damped on finding that he was condemned to death for felony. Care had been taken by Northumberland's emissaries to prepossess the young king against his uncle, and lest he should relent, no access was given to any of Somerset's friends, and the prince was kept from reflection by a continued series of occupations and amusements. At last the prisoner was brought to the scaffold on Tower Hill, amidst great crowds of spectators, who bore him such sincere kindness that they entertained to the last moment the fond hopes of his pardon. 
many of them rushed in to dip their handkerchiefs in his blood, which they long preserved as a precious relic, and some of them soon after, when Northumberland met with a like doom, upbraided him with this cruelty, and displayed to him these symbols of his crime. Somerset, indeed, though many actions of his life were exceptionable, seems in general to have merited a better fate, and the faults which he committed were owing to weakness, not to any bad intention. His virtues were better calculated for private than for public life, and by his want of penetration and firmness he was ill-fitted to extricate himself from those cabals and violences to which that age was so much addicted. Sir Thomas Arundel, Sir Michael Stanhope, Sir Miles Partridge, and Sir Ralph Vane, all of them Somerset's friends, were brought to their trial, condemned, and executed. Great injustice seems to have been used in their prosecution. Lord Paget, Chancellor of the Duchy, was on some pretense tried in the Star Chamber, and condemned in a fine of six thousand pounds, with the loss of his office. To mortify him the more, he was degraded from the order of the garter, as unworthy on account of his mean birth to share that honour. Lord Rich, Chancellor, was also compelled to resign his office, on the discovery of some marks of friendship which he had shown to Somerset. The day after the execution of Somerset, a session of Parliament was held, in which further advances were made towards the establishment of the Reformation. The new liturgy was authorized, and penalties were enacted against all those who absented themselves from public worship. To use the Mass had already been prohibited under severe penalties, so that the Reformers, it appears, whatever scope they had given to their own private judgment in disputing the tenets of the ancient religion, were resolved not to allow the same privilege to others. And the practice, nay, the very doctrine of toleration, was at that time equally unknown to all sects and parties. To dissent from the religion of the magistrate was universally conceived to be as criminal as to question his title, or rebel against his authority. A law was enacted against usury, that is, against taking any interest for money. This act was the remains of ancient superstition, but being found extremely iniquitous in itself, as well as prejudicial to commerce, it was afterwards repealed in the twelfth of Elizabeth. The common rate of interest, notwithstanding the law, was at this time fourteen per cent. A bill was introduced by the Ministry into the House of Lords, renewing those rigorous statutes of treason which had been abrogated in the beginning of this reign. And though the peers, by their high station, stood most exposed to these tempests of state, yet had they so little regard to public security, or even to their own true interest, that they passed the bill with only one dissenting voice. But the Commons rejected it, and prepared a new bill, that passed into a law by which it was enacted, that whoever should call the king, or any of his heirs named in the statute of the thirty-fifth of the last reign, heretic, schismatic, tyrant, infidel or usurper of the crown, should forfeit for the first offence their goods and chattels, and be imprisoned during pleasure. For the second should incur a premunir, for the third should be attainted for treason. But if any should unadvisedly utter such a slander in writing, printing, painting, carving or graving, he was, for the first offence, to be held a traitor. It may be worthy of notice that the king and his next heir, the Lady Mary, were professedly of different religions, 
and religions which threw on each other the imputation of heresy, schism, idolatry, profaneness, blasphemy, wickedness, and all the opprobrious epithets that religious zeal has invented. It was almost impossible, therefore, for the people, if they spoke at all on these subjects, not to fall into the crime so severely punished by the statute, and the jealousy of the commons for liberty, though it led them to reject the bill of treasons sent to them by the lords, appears not to have been very active, vigilant, or clear-sighted. End of section 42, chapter 35, part 3. Section 43 of Volume 1C of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1C Section 43, Chapter 35, Part 4 The Commons annexed to this bill a clause, which was of more importance than the bill itself, that no one should be convicted of any kind of treason unless the crimes were proved by the oaths of two witnesses, confronted with the prisoner. The Lords for some time scrupled to pass this clause, though conformable to the most obvious principles of equity, but the members of that house trusted for protection to their present personal interest and power, and neglected the noblest and most permanent security, that of laws. The House of Peers passed a bill, whose object was making a provision for the poor, but the Commons, not choosing that a money bill should begin in the upper house, framed a new act to the same purpose. By this act the church wardens were empowered to collect charitable contributions, and if any refused to give, or dissuaded others from that charity, the bishop of the diocese was empowered to proceed against them. Such large discretionary powers entrusted to the prelates seemed as proper an act of jealousy as the authority assumed by the peers. There was another occasion in which the Parliament reposed an unusual confidence in the bishops. They empowered them to proceed against such as neglected the Sundays and Holy Day. But these were unguarded concessions granted to the Church. The general humour of the age rather led men to bereave the ecclesiastics of all power and even to pillage them of their property. Many clergymen about this time were obliged for a subsistence to turn carpenters or tailors, and some kept alehouses. The bishops themselves were generally reduced to poverty, and held both their revenues and spiritual office by a very precarious and uncertain tenure. Tonstall, Bishop of Durham, was one of the most eminent prelates of that age, still less for the dignity of his see than for his own personal merit, his learning, moderation, humanity, and beneficence. He had opposed by his vote and authority all innovations in religion, but as soon as they were enacted he had always submitted and had conformed to every theological system which had been established. His known probity had made this compliance be ascribed not to an interested or time-serving spirit, but to a sense of duty, which led him to think that all private opinion ought to be sacrificed to the great concern of public peace and tranquillity. The general regard paid to his character had protected him from any severe treatment during the administration of Somerset, but when Northumberland gained the ascendant, he was thrown into prison, and as that rapacious nobleman had formed a design of seizing the revenues of the see of Durham, 
and of acquiring to himself a principality in the northern counties, he was resolved, in order to effect his purpose, to deprive Tonstall of his bishopric. A bill of attainder, therefore, on pretense of misprision of reason, was introduced into the House of Peers against the prelate, and it passed with the opposition only of Lord Stourton, a zealous Catholic, and of Cranmer, who always bore a cordial and sincere friendship to the Bishop of Durham. But when the bill was sent down to the Commons, they required that witnesses should be examined, that Tonstall should be allowed to defend himself, and that he should be confronted with his accusers, and when these demands were refused, they rejected the bill. This equity, so unusual in the Parliament during that age, was ascribed by Northumberland and his partisans, not to any regard for liberty and justice, but to the prevalence of Somerset's faction in a House of Commons, which, being chosen during the administration of that nobleman, had been almost entirely filled with his creatures. They were confirmed in this opinion when they found that a bill ratifying the attainder of Somerset and his accomplices was also rejected by the Commons, though it had passed the upper house. A resolution was therefore taken to dissolve the Parliament, which had sitten during this whole reign, and soon after to summon a new one. Northumberland, in order to ensure to himself a house of commons entirely obsequious to his will, ventured on an expedient which could not have been practised, or even imagined, in an age when there was any idea or comprehension of liberty. He engaged the king to write circular letters to all the sheriffs, in which he enjoined them to inform the freeholders that they were required to choose men of knowledge and experience for their representatives. After this general exhortation, the king continued in these words, And yet, nevertheless, our pleasure is, that where our privy council or any of them shall, in our behalf, recommend within their jurisdiction men of learning and wisdom, in such cases their directions shall be regarded and followed, as tending to the same end which we desire, that is, to have this assembly composed of the persons in our realm the best fitted to give advice and good counsel. Several letters were sent from the king, recommending members to particular counties, Sir Richard Cotton to Hampshire, Sir William Fitzwilliams and Sir Henry Neville to Berkshire, Sir William Drury and Sir Henry Benningfield to Suffolk, etc. But though some counties only received this species of congé de lire from the king, the recommendations from the Privy Council and the councillors we may fairly presume would extend to the greater part, if not the whole, of the kingdom. It is remarkable that this attempt was made during the reign of a minor king, when the royal authority is usually weakest, that it was patiently submitted to, and that it gave so little umbrage as scarcely to be taken notice of by any historian. The painful and laborious collector above cited, who never omits the most trivial matter, is the only person that has thought this memorable letter worthy of being transmitted to posterity. The Parliament answered Northumberland's expectations, as Tonstall had been in the interval deprived of his bishopric in an arbitrary manner by the sentence of lay commissioners appointed to try him. The see of Durham was by act of Parliament divided into two bishoprics, which had certain portions of the revenue assigned them. The regalities of the see, which included the jurisdiction of a Count Palatine, were given by the king to Northumberland, nor is it to be doubted but that nobleman had also purposed to make rich plunder of the revenue, as was then usual with the courtiers whenever a bishopric became vacant. 
The commons gave the ministry another mark of attachment, which was at that time the most sincere of any, the most cordial, and the most difficult to be obtained. They granted a supply of two subsidies and two fifteenths. To render this present the more acceptable, they voted a preamble containing a long accusation of Somerset for involving the king in wars, wasting his treasure, engaging him in much debt, embasing the coin, and giving occasion for the most terrible rebellion. The debts of the crown were at this time considerable. The king had received from France four hundred thousand crowns on delivering Boulogne. He had reaped profit from the sale of some chantry lands. The churches had been spoiled of all their plate and rich ornaments, which by a decree of council, without any pretense of law or equity, had been converted to the king's use. Yet such had been the rapacity of the courtiers, that the crown owed about three hundred thousand pounds, and great dilapidations were at the same time made of the royal domain. The young prince showed, among other virtues, a disposition to frugality, which, had he lived, would soon have retrieved these losses. But as his health was declining very fast, the present emptiness of the exchequer was a sensible obstacle to the execution of those projects which the ambition of Northumberland had founded on the prospect of Edward's approaching end. That nobleman represented to the prince, whom youth and an infirm state of health made susceptible of any impression, that his two sisters, Mary and Elizabeth, had both of them been declared illegitimate by act of Parliament, and though Henry by his will had restored them to a place in the succession, the nation would never submit to see the throne of England filled by a bastard. That they were the king's sisters by the half-blood only, and even if they were legitimate, could not enjoy the crown as his heirs and successors, that the Queen of Scots stood excluded by the late king's will, and being an alien had lost by law all right of inheriting, not to mention that, as she was betrothed to the Dauphin, she would by her succession render England, as she had already done Scotland, a province of France, that the certain consequence of his sister's Mary's succession, or that of the Queen of Scots was the abolition of the Protestant religion, and the repeal of the laws enacted in favour of the Reformation, and the re-establishment of the usurpation and idolatry of the Church of Rome, that fortunately for England the same order of succession which justice required was also the most conformable to public interest, and there was not on any side any just ground for doubt or deliberation, that when these three princesses were excluded by such solid reasons, the succession devolved on the Marchioness of Dorset, elder daughter of the French Queen and the Duke of Suffolk, that the next heir of the Marchioness was the Lady Jane Grey, a lady of the most amiable character, accomplished by the best education both in literature and religion, and every way worthy of a crown, and that even if her title by blood were doubtful, which there was no just reason to pretend, the king was possessed of the same power that his father enjoyed, and might leave her the crown by letters patent. These reasonings made impression on the young prince, and above all his zealous attachment to the Protestant religion made him apprehend the consequences if so bigoted a Catholic as his sister Mary should succeed to the throne and though he bore a tender affection to the Lady Elizabeth, who was liable to no such objection, means were found to persuade him that he could not exclude the one sister on account of illegitimacy, without giving also an exclusion to the other. Northumberland, finding that his arguments were likely to operate on the king, began to prepare the other parts of his scheme. 
two sons of the duke of suffolk by a second venter having died this season of the sweating sickness that title was extinct and northumberland engaged the king to bestow it on the marquis of dorset by means of this favour and of others which he conferred upon him he persuaded the new duke of suffolk and the duchess to give their daughter the lady jane in marriage to his fourth son the lord guildford dudley in order to fortify himself by further alliances he negotiated a marriage between the lady catherine gray second daughter of suffolk and lord herbert eldest son of the earl of pembroke he also married his own daughter to lord hastings eldest son of the earl of huntingdon these marriages were solemnized with great pomp and festivity and the people who hated northumberland could not forbear expressing their indignation at seeing such public demonstrations of joy during the languishing state of the young prince's health edward had been seized in the foregoing year first with the measles then with the smallpox but having perfectly recovered from both these distempers the nation entertained hopes that they would only serve to confirm his health and he had afterwards made a progress through some parts of the kingdom it was suspected that he had there overheated himself and exercised he was seized with a cough which proved obstinate and gave way neither to regimen nor medicines several fatal symptoms of consumption appeared and though it was hoped that as the season advanced his youth and temperance might get the better of the malady men saw with great concern his bloom and vigour insensibly decay the general attachment to the young prince joined to the hatred borne the dudleys made it be remarked that edward had every moment declined in health from the time that lord robert dudley had been put about him in quality of gentleman of the bedchamber the languishing state of edward's health made northumberland the more intent on the execution of his project he removed all except his own emissaries from about the king he himself attended him with the greatest assiduity he pretended the most anxious concern for his health and welfare by all these artifices he prevailed on the young prince to give his final consent to the settlement projected sir edward montague chief justice of the common pleas sir john baker and sir thomas bromley two judges with the attorney and solicitor general were summoned to the council where after the minutes of the intended deed were read to them the king required them to draw up in the form of letters patent they hesitated to obey and desired time to consider of it the more they reflected the greater danger they found in compliance the settlement of the crown by henry the eighth had been made in consequence of an act of parliament and by another act passed in the beginning of this reign it was declared treason in any of the heirs their aiders or abettors to attempt on the right of another or change the order of succession the judges pleaded these reasons before the council they urged that such a patent as was intended would be entirely invalid that it would subject not only the judges who drew it but every councillor who signed it to the pains of treason and that the only proper expedient both for giving sanction to the new settlement and freeing its partisans from danger was to summon a parliament and to obtain the consent of that assembly the king said that he intended afterwards to follow that method and would call a parliament in which he purposed to have his settlement ratified but in the meantime he required the judges on their allegiance to draw the patent in the form required the council told the judges that their refusal would subject all of them to the pains of treason northumberland gave to montague the appellation of traitor 
and said that he would in his shirt fight any man in so just a cause as that of Lady Jane's succession. The judges were reduced to great difficulties between the dangers from the law and those which arose from the violence of present power and authority. The arguments were canvassed in several different meetings between the council and the judges, and no solution could be found of the difficulties. At last Montague proposed an expedient, which satisfied both his brethren and the councillors. He desired that a special commission should be passed by the king and council, requiring the judges to draw a patent for the new settlement of the crown, and that a pardon should immediately after be granted them for any offence which they might have incurred by their compliance. When the patent was drawn and brought to the Bishop of Eli, Chancellor, in order to have the great seal affixed to it, this prelate required that all the judges should previously sign it. Gosnold at first refused, and it was with much difficulty that he was prevailed on by the violent menaces of Northumberland to comply. But the constancy of Sir James Hales, who, though a zealous Protestant, preferred justice on this occasion to the prejudices of his party, could not be shaken by any expedient. The Chancellor next required, for his greater security, that all the privy councillors should set their hands to the patent. The intrigues of Northumberland, or the fears of his violence, were so prevalent that the councillors complied with this demand. Cranmer alone hesitated during some time, but at last yielded to the earnest and pathetic entreaties of the king. Cecil, at that time Secretary of State, pretended afterwards that he only signed as witness to the king's subscription, and thus, by the king's letters patent, the two princesses, Mary and Elizabeth, were set aside, and the crown was settled on the heirs of the Duchess of Suffolk, for the Duchess herself was content to give place to her daughters. After this settlement was made, with so many inauspicious circumstances, Edward visibly declined every day, and small hopes were entertained of his recovery. To make matters worse, his physicians were dismissed by Northumberland's advice and by an order of council, and he was put into the hands of an ignorant woman, who undertook in a little time to restore him to his former state of health. After the use of her medicines, all the bad symptoms increased to the most violent degree. He felt a difficulty of speech and breathing. His pulse failed, his legs swelled, his colour became livid, and many other symptoms appeared of his approaching end. He expired at Greenwich in the sixteenth year of his age and the seventh of his reign. All the English historians dwell with pleasure on the excellent qualities of this young prince, whom the flattering promises of hope, joined to many real virtues, had made an object of tender affection to the public. He possessed mildness of disposition, application to study and business, a capacity to learn and judge, and an attachment to equity and justice. He seems only to have contracted from his education, and from the genius of the age in which he lived, too much of a narrow prepossession in matters of religion, which made him incline somewhat to bigotry and persecution. But as the bigotry of Protestants, less governed by priests, lies under more restraints than that of Catholics, the effects of this malignant quality were the less to be apprehended if a longer life had been granted to young Edward. End of section 43, chapter 34, part 4《ポッドキャスト Section 44 of Volume 1C of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume, Volume 1C, Section 44, Chapter 36, Part 1. Mary The title of the Princess Mary, after the demise of her brother, was not exposed to any considerable difficulty, and the objections started by the Lady Jane's partisans were new and unheard of by the nation. Though all the Protestants, and even many of the Catholics, believed the marriage of Henry the Eighth with Catherine of Aragon to be unlawful and invalid, yet, as it had been contracted by the parties without any criminal intention, had been avowed by their parents, recognized by the nation, and seemingly founded on those principles of law and religion which then prevailed, few imagined that their issue ought on that account to be regarded as illegitimate. A declaration to that purpose had indeed been extorted from Parliament by the usual violence and caprice of Henry, but, as that monarch had afterwards been induced to restore his daughter to the right of succession, her title was now become as legal and parliamentary as it was ever esteemed just and natural. The public had long been familiarized to these sentiments. During all the reign of Edward, the princess was regarded as his lawful successor, and though the Protestants dreaded the effects of her prejudices, the extreme hatred universally entertained against the Dudleys, who men foresaw would, under the name of Jane, be the real sovereigns, was more than sufficient to counterbalance, even with that party, the attachment to religion. This last attempt to violate the order of succession had displayed Northumberland's ambition and injustice in a full light, and when the people reflected on the long train of fraud, iniquity, and cruelty by which that project had been conducted, that the lives of the two Seymours, as well as the title of the princesses, had been sacrificed to it, they were moved by indignation to exert themselves in opposition to such criminal enterprises. The general veneration also paid to the memory of Henry the Eighth prompted the nation to defend the rights of his posterity, and the miseries of the ancient civil wars were not so entirely forgotten that men were willing by a departure from the lawful heir to incur the danger of like bloodshed and confusion. Northumberland, sensible of the opposition which he must expect, had carefully concealed the destination made by the king, and in order to bring the two princesses into his power, he had had the precaution to engage the council before Edward's death to write to them in that prince's name, desiring their attendance on pretense that his infirm state of health required the assistance of their council and the consolation of their company. Edward expired before their arrival, but Northumberland, in order to make the princesses fall into the snare, kept the king's death still secret, and the Lady Mary had already reached Hoddesdon within half a day's journey of the court. Happily, the Earl of Arundel sent her private intelligence, both of her brother's death and of the conspiracy formed against her. She immediately made haste to retire, and she arrived by quick journeys, first at Kenning Hall in Norfolk, then at Framlingham in Suffolk, where she purposed to embark and escape to Flanders, in case she should find it impossible to defend her right of succession. She wrote letters to the nobility and most considerable gentry in every county in England, commanding them to assist her in the defence of her crown and person, and she dispatched a message to the council by which she notified to them that her brother's death was no longer a secret to her, promised them pardon for past offences, and required them immediately to give orders for proclaiming her in London. Northumberland found that further dissimulation was fruitless. 
He went to Sion House, accompanied by the Duke of Suffolk, the Earl of Pembroke, and others of the nobility, and he approached the Lady Jane, who resided there, with all the respect usually paid to the sovereign. Jane was in a great measure ignorant of these transactions, and it was with equal grief and surprise that she received intelligence of them. She was a lady of amiable person, an engaging disposition, accomplished parts, and being of an equal age with the late king, she had received all her education with him, and seemed even to possess greater facility in acquiring every part of manly and polite literature. She had attained a familiar knowledge of the Roman and Greek languages, besides modern tongues, had passed most of her time in an application to learning, and expressed a great indifference for other occupations and amusements usual with her sex and station. Roger Ascham, tutor to the Lady Elizabeth, having one day paid her a visit, found her employed in reading Plato, while the rest of the family were engaged in a party of hunting in the park and on his admiring the singularity of her choice, she told him that she received more pleasure from that author than the others could reap from all their sport and gaiety. Her heart, full of this passion for literature and the elegant arts, and of tenderness towards her husband, who was deserving of her affections, had never opened itself to the flattering allurements of ambition, and the intelligence of her elevation to the throne was no wise agreeable to her. She even refused to accept of the present, pleaded the preferable title of the two princesses, expressed her dread of the consequences attending an enterprise so dangerous, not to say so criminal, and desired to remain in the private station in which she was born. Overcome at last by the entreaties, rather than the reasons, of her father and father-in-law, and above all of her husband, she submitted to their will, and was prevailed on to relinquish her own judgment. It was then usual for the kings of England, after their accession, to pass the first days in the tower, and Northumberland immediately conveyed thither the new sovereign. All the councillors were obliged to attend her to that fortress, and by this means became, in reality, prisoners in the hands of Northumberland, whose will they were necessitated to obey. Orders were given by the council to proclaim Jane throughout the kingdom, but these orders were executed only in London and the neighbourhood. No applause ensued. The people heard the proclamation with silence and concern. Some even expressed their scorn and contempt, and one pot, a vintner's apprentice, was severely punished for this offence. The Protestant teachers themselves, who were employed to convince the people of Jane's title, found their eloquence fruitless, and Ridley, Bishop of London, who preached a sermon to that purpose, wrought no effect upon his audience. The people of Suffolk, meanwhile, paid their attendance on Mary. As they were much attached to the reformed communion, they could not forbear, amidst their tenders of duty, expressing apprehensions for their religion. But when she assured them that she never meant to change the laws of Edward, they enlisted themselves in her cause with zeal and affection. The nobility and gentry daily flocked to her, and brought her reinforcement. The earls of Bath and Sussex, the eldest sons of Lord Wharton and Lord Mordaunt, Sir William Drury, Sir Henry Benningfield, Sir Henry Jernigan, persons whose interests lay in the neighbourhood, appeared at the head of their tenants and retainers. Sir Edward Hastings, brother to the Earl of Huntingdon, having received a commission from the council to make levies for the Lady Jane in Buckinghamshire, carried over his troops, which amounted to four thousand men, and joined Mary. 
even a fleet which had been sent by Northumberland to lie off the coast of Suffolk, being forced into Yarmouth by a storm, was engaged to declare for that princess. Northumberland, hitherto blinded by ambition, saw at last the danger gather round him, and knew not to what hand to turn himself. He had levied forces which were assembled at London, but dreading the cabals of the courtiers and councillors, whose compliance he knew had been entirely the result of fear or artifice, he was resolved to keep near the person of the Lady Jane, and send Suffolk to command the army. But the councillors, who wished to remove him, working on the filial tenderness of Jane, magnified to her the danger to which her father would be exposed, and represented that Northumberland, who had gained reputation by formerly suppressing a rebellion in those parts, was more proper to command in that enterprise. The Duke himself, who knew the slender capacity of Suffolk, began to think that none but himself was able to encounter the present danger, and he agreed to take on him the command of the troops. The councillors attended on him at his departure with the highest protestations of attachment, and none more so than Arundel, his mortal enemy. As he went along he remarked the disaffection of the people, which foreboded a fatal issue to his ambitious hopes. Manny, said he to Lord Grey, come out to look at us, but I find not one who cries, God speed you. The Duke had no sooner reached St. Edmundsbury than he found his army, which did not exceed six thousand men, too weak to encounter the Queen's, which had amounted to double the number. He wrote to the council, desiring them to send him a reinforcement, and the councillors immediately laid hold of the opportunity to free themselves from confinement. They left the tower as if they meant to execute Northumberland's commands, but being assembled in Baynard's castle, a house belonging to Pembroke, they deliberated concerning the method of shaking off his usurped tyranny. Arundel began the conference by representing the injustice and cruelty of Northumberland, the exorbitancy of his ambition, the criminal enterprise which he had projected, and the guilt in which he had involved the whole council, and he affirmed that the only method of making atonement for their past offences was by a speedy return to the duty which they owed to their lawful sovereign. This motion was seconded by Pembroke, who, clapping his hand to his sword, swore he was ready to fight any man that expressed himself of a contrary sentiment. The mayor and aldermen of London were immediately sent for, who discovered great alacrity in obeying the orders they received to proclaim Mary. The people expressed their approbation by shouts of applause. Even Suffolk, who commanded in the tower, finding resistance fruitless, opened the gates and declared for the queen. The Lady Jane, after the vain pageantry of wearing a crown during ten days, returned to a private life with more satisfaction than she felt when the royalty was tended to her, and the messengers who were sent to Northumberland with orders to lay down his arms found that he had despaired of success, was deserted by all his followers, and had already proclaimed the queen with exterior marks of joy and satisfaction. The people everywhere on the queen's approach to London gave sensible expressions of their loyalty and attachment, and the Lady Elizabeth met her at the head of a thousand horse, which that princess had levied in order to support their joint title against the usurper. The queen gave orders for taking into custody the Duke of Northumberland, who fell on his knees to the Earl of Arundel, that arrested him, and abjectly begged his life. At the same time were committed the Earl of Warwick, his eldest son, Lord Ambrose, and Lord Henry Dudley, 
two of his younger sons, Sir Andrew Dudley, his brother the Marquis of Northampton, the Earl of Huntingdon, Sir Thomas Palmer, and Sir John Gates. The Queen afterwards confined the Duke of Suffolk, Lady Jane Grey, and Lord Guildford to Dudley, but Mary was desirous in the beginning of her reign to acquire popularity by the appearance of clemency, and because the councillors pleaded constraint as an excuse for their treason, she extended her pardon to most of them. Suffolk himself recovered his liberty, and he owed this indulgence in a great measure to the contempt entertained of his capacity. But the guilt of Northumberland was too great, as well as his ambition and courage too dangerous, to permit him to entertain any reasonable hopes of life. When brought to his trial, he only desired permission to ask two questions of the peers appointed to sit on his jury. Whether a man could be guilty of treason that obeyed orders given him by the council under the great seal, and whether those who were involved in the same guilt with himself could sit as his judges. Being told that the great seal of a usurper was no authority, and that the persons not lying under any sentence of attainder were still innocent in the eye of the law, and might be admitted on any jury, he acquiesced and pleaded guilty. At his execution he made profession of the Catholic religion, and told the people that they never would enjoy tranquillity till they returned to the faith of their ancestors. Whether that such were his real sentiments, which he had formerly disguised from interest and ambition, or that he hoped by this declaration to render the Queen more favourable to his family. Sir Thomas Palmer and Sir John Gates suffered with him, and this was all the blood spilled on account of so dangerous and criminal an enterprise against the rights of the sovereign. Sentence was pronounced against the Lady Jane and Lord Guildford, but without any present intention of putting it in execution, the youth and innocence of the persons, neither of whom had reached their seventeenth year, pleaded sufficiently in their favour. When Mary first arrived in the tower, the Duke of Norfolk, who had been detained prisoner during all the last reign, Courtney, son of the Marquis of Exeter, who, without being charged with any crime, had been subjected to the same punishment ever since his father's attainder, Gardiner, Tonstall, and Bonner, who had been confined for their adhering to the Catholic cause, appeared before her, and implored her clemency and protection. They were all of them restored to their liberty, and immediately admitted to her confidence and favour. Norfolk's attainder, notwithstanding that it had passed in Parliament, was represented as null and invalid, because, among other informalities, no special matter had been alleged against him, except wearing a coat of arms which he and his ancestors, without giving any offence, had always made use of, in the face of the court and of the whole nation. Courtney, soon after, received the title of Earl of Devonshire, and though educated in such close confinement that he was altogether unacquainted with the world, he soon acquired all the accomplishments of a courtier and gentleman, and made a considerable figure during the few years which he lived after he recovered his liberty. Besides performing all those popular acts, which, though they only affected individuals, were very acceptable to the nation, the Queen endeavoured to ingratiate herself with the public by granting a general pardon, though with some exceptions, and by remitting the subsidy voted to her brother by the last Parliament. The joy arising from the succession of the lawful heir, and from the gracious demeanour of the sovereign, hindered not the people from being agitated with great anxiety concerning the state of religion, and as the bulk of the nation inclined to the Protestant communion, the apprehensions entertained concerning the principles and prejudices of the new queen were pretty general. 
the legitimacy of Mary's birth had appeared to be somewhat connected with the papal authority, and that princess, being educated with her mother, had imbibed the strongest attachment to the Catholic communion, and the highest aversion to those new tenets whence she believed all the misfortunes of her family had originally sprung. The discouragements which she lay under from her father, though at last they brought her to comply with his will, tended still more to increase her disgust to the reformers, and the vexations which the protector and the council gave her during Edward's reign had no other effect than to confirm her further in her prejudices. Naturally of a sour and obstinate temper, and irritated by contradiction and misfortunes, she possessed all the qualities fitted to compose a bigot, and her extreme ignorance rendered her utterly incapable of doubt in her own belief, or of indulgence to the opinions of others. The nation, therefore, had great reason to dread not only the abolition, but the persecution of the established religion from the zeal of Mary, and it was not long ere she discovered her intentions. Gardiner, Bonner, Tonstall, Day, Heath, and Vesey were reinstated in their sees, either by a direct act of power, or, what is nearly the same, by the sentence of commissioners appointed to review their trial and condemnation. Though the bishopric of Durham had been dissolved by authority of Parliament, the Queen erected it anew by letters patent, and replaced Tonstall in his regalities as well as in his revenue. On pretense of discouraging controversy, she silenced by an act of prerogative all the preachers throughout England, except such as should obtain a particular license, and it was easy to foresee that none but Catholics would be favoured with this privilege. Holgate, Archbishop of York, Coverdale, Bishop of Exeter, Ridley of London, and Hooper of Gloucester were thrown into prison, whither old Latimer also was sent soon after. The zealous bishops and priests were encouraged in their forwardness to revive the mass, though contrary to the present laws. Judge Hales, who had discovered such constancy in defending the Queen's title, lost all his merit by an opposition to those illegal practices, and being committed to custody was treated with such severity that he fell into frenzy and killed himself. The men of Suffolk were browbeaten because they presumed to plead the promise which the Queen, when they enlisted themselves in her service, had given them of maintaining the reformed religion. One in particular was set in the pillory, because he had been too peremptory in recalling to her memory the engagements which she had taken on that occasion. And although the Queen still promised in a public declaration before the Council, to tolerate those who had differed from her, men foresaw that this engagement, like the former, would prove but a feeble security when set in opposition to religious prejudices. The merits of Cranmer towards the Queen during the reign of Henry had been considerable, and he had successfully employed his good offices in mitigating the severe prejudices which that monarch had entertained against her but the active part which he had borne in promoting her mother's divorce, as well as in conducting the Reformation, had made him the object of her hatred. And though Gardiner had been equally forward in soliciting and defending the divorce, he had afterwards made sufficient atonement by his sufferings in defence of the Catholic cause. The primate, therefore, had reason to expect little favour during the present reign, but it was by his own indiscreet zeal that he brought on himself the first violence and persecution. A report being spread that Cranmer, in order to pay court to the Queen, had promised to officiate in the Latin service, 
the archbishop to wipe off this aspersion published a manifesto in his own defence among other expressions he there said that as the devil was a liar from the beginning and the father of lies he had at this time stirred up his servants to persecute christ and his true religion that this infernal spirit now endeavoured to restore the latin satisfactory masses a thing of his own invention and device and in order to effect his purpose had falsely made use of cranmer's name and authority and that the mass is not only without foundation either in the scriptures or in the practice of the primitive church but likewise discovers a plain contradiction to antiquity and the inspired writings and is besides replete with many horrid blasphemies on the publication of this inflammatory paper cranmer was thrown into prison and was tried for the part which he had acted in concurring with the lady jane and opposing the queen's accession sentence of high treason was pronounced against him and though his guilt was shared with the whole privy council and was even less than that of the greater part of them this sentence however severe must be allowed entirely legal the execution of it however did not follow and cranmer was reserved for a more cruel punishment peter martyr seeing a persecution gathering against the reformers desired leave to withdraw and while some zealous catholics moved for his commitment gardiner both pleaded that he had come over by an invitation from the government and generously furnished him with supplies for his journey but as bigoted zeal still increased his wife's body which had been interred at oxford was afterwards dug up by public orders and buried in a dunghill the bones of bucer and fagius two foreign reformers were about the same time committed to the flames at cambridge john alasco was first silenced then ordered to depart the kingdom with his congregation the greater part of the foreign protestants followed him and the nation thereby lost many useful hands for arts and manufactures several english protestants also took shelter in foreign parts and everything bore a dismal aspect for the reformation during this revolution of the court no protection was expected by protestants from the parliament which was summoned to assemble a zealous reformer pretends that great violence and iniquity were used in the elections but beside that the authority of this writer is inconsiderable that practice as the necessities of government required it had not hitherto been often employed in england there still remained such numbers devoted by opinion or affection to many principles of the ancient religion that the authority of the crown was able to give such candidates the preference in most elections and all those who hesitated to comply with the court religion rather declined taking a seat which while it rendered them obnoxious to the queen could afterwards afford them no protection against the violence of prerogative it soon appeared therefore that a majority of the commons would be obsequious to mary's designs and as the peers were mostly attached to the court from interest or expectations little opposition was expected from that quarter in opening the parliament the court showed a contempt of the laws by celebrating before the two houses a mass of the holy ghost in the latin tongue attended with all the ancient rites and ceremonies though abolished by act of parliament taylor bishop of lincoln having refused to kneel at this service was severely handled and was violently thrust out of the house the queen however still retained the title of supreme head of the church of england and it was generally pretended that the intention of the court was only to restore religion to the same condition in which it had been left by henry but that the other abuses of popery which were the most grievous to the nation would never be revived end of section forty four chapter thirty six part one
Section forty five C of Volume One C of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of sixteen eighty eight. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of sixteen eighty eight by David Hume. Volume 1C, Section 45, Chapter 36, Part 2. The first bill passed by the Parliament was of a popular nature, and abolished every species of treason not contained in the statute of Edward III, and every species of felony that did not subsist before the first of Henry VIII. The Parliament next declared the Queen to be legitimate, ratified the marriage of Henry with Catherine of Aragon, and annulled the divorce pronounced by Cranmer, whom they greatly blamed on that account. No mention, however, is made of the Pope's authority as any ground of the marriage. All the statutes of King Edward with regard to religion were repealed by one vote. The attainder of the Duke of Norfolk was reversed, and this act of justice was more reasonable than the declaring of that attainder invalid without further authority. Many clauses of the Riot Act, passed in the late reign, were revived, a step which eluded in a great measure the popular statute enacted at the first meeting of Parliament. Notwithstanding the compliance of the two houses with the Queen's inclinations, they had still a reserve in certain articles, and her choice of a husband in particular was of such importance to national interest that they were determined not to submit tamely in that respect to her will and pleasure. There were three marriages concerning which it was supposed that Mary had deliberated after her accession. The first person proposed to her was Courtney, Earl of Devonshire, who being an Englishman nearly allied to the crown, could not fail of being acceptable to the nation, and as he was of an engaging person and address, he had visibly gained on the Queen's affections, and hints were dropped him of her favourable dispositions towards him. But that nobleman neglected these overtures, and seemed rather to attach himself to the Lady Elizabeth, whose youth and agreeable conversation he preferred to all the power and grandeur of her sister. This choice occasioned a great coldness in Mary towards Devonshire, and made her break out in a declared animosity against Elizabeth. The ancient quarrel between their mothers had sunk deep into the malignant heart of the Queen, and after the declaration made by Parliament in favour of Catherine's marriage, she wanted not a pretence for representing the birth of her sister as illegitimate. The attachment of Elizabeth to the reformed religion offended Mary's bigotry, and as the young princess had made some difficulty in disguising her sentiments, violent menaces had been employed to bring her to compliance. But when the Queen found that Elizabeth had obstructed her views in a point which perhaps touched her still more nearly, her resentment, excited by pride, no longer knew any bounds, and the Princess was visibly exposed to the greatest danger. Cardinal Pole, who had never taken priest's orders, was another party proposed to the Queen and there appeared many reasons to induce her to make choice of this prelate. The high character of Pole for virtue and humanity, the great regard paid him by the Catholic Church, of which he had nearly reached the highest dignity on the death of Paul the Third, the Queen's affection for the Countess of Salisbury, his mother, who had once been her governess, the violent animosity to which he had been exposed on account of his attachment to the Romish communion. All these considerations had a powerful influence on Mary. But the cardinal was now in the decline of life, 
and having contracted habits of study and retirement, he was represented to her as unqualified for the bustle of a court and the hurry of business. The queen, therefore, dropped all thoughts of that alliance, but as she entertained a great regard for Pole's wisdom and virtue, she still intended to reap the benefit of his counsel in the administration of her government. She secretly entered into a negotiation with Comendone, an agent of Cardinal Dandino, legate at Brussels. She sent assurances to the Pope, then Julius the Third, of her earnest desire to reconcile herself and her kingdoms to the Holy See, and she desired that Pole might be appointed legate for the performance of that pious office. These two marriages being rejected, the queen cast her eye towards the emperor's family, from which her mother was descended, and which, during her own distresses, had always afforded her countenance and protection. Charles V, who a few years before was almost absolute master of Germany, had exercised his power in such an arbitrary manner that he gave extreme disgust to the nation, who apprehended the total extinction of their liberties from the encroachments of that monarch. Religion had served him as a pretense for his usurpations, and from the same principle he met with that opposition which overthrew his grandeur, and dashed all his ambitious hopes. Morris, elector of Saxony, enraged that the landgrave of Hesse, who by his advice and on his assurances had put himself into the emperor's hands, should be unjustly detained a prisoner, formed a secret conspiracy among the Protestant princes, and covering his intentions with the most artful disguises, he suddenly marched his forces against Charles, and narrowly missed becoming master of his person. The Protestants flew to arms in every quarter, and their insurrection, aided by an invasion from France, reduced the emperor to such difficulties that he was obliged to submit to terms of peace which ensured the independence of Germany. To retrieve his honour, he made an attack on France, and laying siege to Metz with an army of a hundred thousand men, he conducted the enterprise in person, and seemed determined at all hazards to succeed in an undertaking which had fixed the attention of Europe. But the Duke of Guise, who defended Metz with a garrison composed of the bravest nobility of France, exerted such vigilance, conduct, and valour, that the siege was protracted to the depth of winter, and the emperor found it dangerous to persevere any longer. He retired with the remains of his army into the low countries, much dejected with that reverse of fortune which in his declining years had so fatally overtaken him. No sooner did Charles hear of the death of Edward, and the accession of his kinswoman Mary to the crown of England, then he formed the scheme of acquiring that kingdom to his family, and he hoped by this incident to balance all the losses which he had sustained in Germany. His son Philip was a widower, and though he was only twenty-seven years of age, eleven years younger than the queen, this objection, it was thought, would be overlooked, and there was no reason to despair of her still having a numerous issue. The emperor, therefore, immediately sent over an agent to signify his intentions to Mary, who, pleased with the support of so powerful an alliance, and glad to unite herself more closely with her mother's family, to which she was ever strongly attached, readily embraced the proposal. Norfolk, Arundel, and Paget gave their advice for the match, and Gardiner, who was become Prime Minister, and who had been promoted to the office of Chancellor, finding how Mary's inclinations lay, seconded the project of the Spanish alliance. At the same time he represented, both to her and the Emperor, the necessity of stopping all further innovations in religion, till the completion of the marriage. 
he observed that the Parliament, amidst all their compliances, had discovered evident symptoms of jealousy, and seemed at present determined to grant no further concessions in favour of the Catholic religion, that though they might make a sacrifice to their sovereign of some speculative principles which they did not well comprehend, or of some rights which seemed not of any great moment, they had imbibed such strong prejudices against the pretended usurpations and exactions of the court of Rome, that they would with great difficulty be again brought to submit to its authority, that the danger of resuming the abbey lands would alarm the nobility and gentry, and induce them to encourage the prepossessions which were but too general among the people, against the doctrine and worship of the Catholic Church, that much pains had been taken to prejudice the nation against the Spanish alliance. And if that point were urged at the same time with further changes in religion, it would hazard a general revolt and insurrection, that the marriage being once completed would give authority to the Queen's measures, and enable her afterwards to forward the pious work in which she was engaged, and that it was even necessary previously to reconcile the people to the marriage by rendering the conditions extremely favourable to the English, and such as would be seen to ensure to them their independency and the entire possession of their ancient laws and privileges. The Emperor, well acquainted with the prudence and experience of Gardiner, assented to all these reasons, and he endeavoured to temper the zeal of Mary, by representing the necessity of proceeding gradually in the great work of converting the nation. Hearing that Cardinal Pole, more sincere in his religious opinions, and less guided by the maxims of human policy, after having sent contrary advice to the Queen, had set out on his journey to England, where he was to exercise his legantine commission. He thought proper to stop him at Dillingen, a town on the Danube, and he afterwards obtained Mary's consent for this detention. The negotiation for the marriage meanwhile proceeded apace, and Mary's intentions of espousing Philip became generally known to the nation. The commons, who hoped that they had gained the queen by the concessions which they had already made, were alarmed to hear that she was resolved to contract a foreign alliance, and they sent a committee to remonstrate in strong terms against that dangerous measure. To prevent further applications of the same kind, she thought proper to dissolve the Parliament. A convocation had been summoned at the same time with the Parliament, and the majority here also appeared to be of the court religion. An offer was very frankly made by the Romanists to dispute concerning the points controverted between the two communions, and as transubstantiation was the article which of all others they deemed the clearest, and founded on the most irresistible arguments, they chose to try their strength by defending it. The Protestants pushed the dispute as far as the clamour and noise of their antagonists would permit, and they fondly imagined that they had obtained some advantage, when in the course of the debate they obliged the Catholics to avow that, according to their doctrine, Christ had in his last supper held himself in his hand, and had swallowed and eaten himself. This triumph, however, was confined only to their own party. The Romanists maintained that their champions had clearly the better of the day, that their adversaries were blind and obstinate heretics, that nothing but the most extreme depravity of heart could induce men to contest such self-evident principles, and that the severest punishments were due to their perverse wickedness. So pleased were they with their superiority in this favourite point, that they soon after renewed the dispute at Oxford, and to show that they feared no force of learning or abilities, where reason was so evident on their side, they sent thither Cranmer, Latimer, and Ridley, 
under a guard to try whether these renowned controversialists could find any appearance of argument to defend their baffled principles. The issue of the debate was very different from what it appeared to be a few years before, in a famous conference held at the same place during the reign of Edward. After the Parliament and Convocation were dismissed, the new laws with regard to religion, though they had been anticipated in most places by the zeal of the Catholics, countenanced by government, were still more openly put in execution. The mass was everywhere re-established, and marriage was declared to be incompatible with any spiritual office. It has been asserted by some writers that three-fourths of the clergy were at this time deprived of their livings, though other historians, more accurate, have estimated the number of sufferers to be far short of this proportion. A visitation was appointed in order to restore more perfectly the mass and the ancient rites. Among other articles, the commissioners were enjoined to forbid the oath of supremacy to be taken by the clergy on their receiving any benefice. It is to be observed that this oath had been established by the laws of Henry the Eighth, which were still in force. This violent and sudden change of religion inspired the Protestants with great discontent, and even affected indifferent spectators with concern, by the hardships to which so many individuals were on that account exposed. But the Spanish match was a point of more general concern, and diffused universal apprehension for the liberty and independence of the nation. To obviate all clamour, the articles of marriage were drawn as favourable as possible for the interests and security, and even grandeur, of England. It was agreed that though Philip should have the title of king, the administration should be entirely in the queen that no foreigner should be capable of enjoying any office in the kingdom, that no innovation should be made in the English laws, customs, and privileges, that Philip should not carry the queen abroad without her consent, nor any of her children without the consent of the nobility, that sixty thousand pounds a year should be settled as her jointure, that the male issue of this marriage should inherit together with England, both Burgundy and the Low Countries, and that if Don Carlos, Philip's son by his former marriage, should die, and his line be extinct, the Queen's issue, whether male or female, should inherit Spain, Sicily, Milan, and all the other dominions of Philip. Such was the treaty of marriage signed by Count Egmont and three other ambassadors, sent over to England by the Emperor. These articles, when published, gave no satisfaction to the nation. It was universally said that the Emperor, in order to get possession of England, would verbally agree to any terms, and the greater advantage there appeared in the conditions which he granted, the more certainly might it be concluded that he had no serious intention of observing them that the usual fraud and ambition of that monarch might assure the nation of such a conduct, and his son Philip, while he inherited these vices from his father, added to them tyranny, sullenness, pride, and barbarity, more dangerous vices of his own, that England would become a province, and a province to a kingdom which usually exercised the most violent authority over all her dependent dominions, that the Netherlands, Milan, Sicily, Naples, groaned under the burden of Spanish tyranny, and throughout all the new conquests in America there had been displayed scenes of unrelenting cruelty, hitherto unknown in the history of mankind, that the Inquisition was a tribunal invented by that tyrannical nation, and would infallibly, with all their other laws and institutions, be introduced into England, and that the divided sentiments of the people with regard to religion would subject multitudes to this iniquitous tribunal, and would reduce the whole nation to the most abject servitude. 
These complaints, being diffused everywhere, prepared the people for a rebellion, and had any foreign power given them encouragement, or any great man appeared to head them, the consequence might have proved fatal to the Queen's authority. But the King of France, though engaged in hostilities with the Emperor, refused to concur in any proposal for an insurrection, lest he should afford Mary a pretense for declaring war against him. And the more prudent part of the nobility thought that, as the evils of the Spanish alliance were only dreaded at a distance, matters were not yet fully prepared for a general revolt. Some persons, however, more turbulent than the rest, believed that it would be safer to prevent than to redress grievances, and they formed a conspiracy to rise in arms, and declare against the Queen's marriage with Philip. Sir Thomas Wyatt proposed to raise Kent, Sir Peter Carew, Devonshire, and they engaged the Duke of Suffolk, by the hopes of recovering the crown for the Lady Jane, to attempt raising the Midland counties. Carew's impatience or apprehensions engaged him to break the concert, and to rise in arms before the day appointed. He was soon suppressed by the Earl of Bedford, and constrained to fly into France. On this intelligence, Suffolk, dreading an arrest, suddenly left the town with his brothers, Lord Thomas and Lord Leonard Grey, and endeavoured to raise the people in the counties of Warwick and Leicester, where his interest lay. But he was so closely pursued by the Earl of Huntingdon, at the head of three hundred horse, that he was obliged to disperse his followers, and being discovered in his concealment, he was carried prisoner to London. Wyatt was at first more successful in his attempt, and having published a declaration at Maidstone in Kent against the Queen's evil counsellors, and against the Spanish match, without any mention of religion, that people began to flock to his standard. The Dufoc, with Sir Henry Jernigan, was sent against him, at the head of the guards and some other troops, reinforced with five hundred Londoners commanded by Brett, and he came within sight of the rebels at Rochester, where they had fixed their headquarters. Sir George Harper here pretended to desert from them, but having secretly gained Brett, these two malcontents so wrought on the Londoners, that the whole body deserted to Wyatt, and declared that they would not contribute to enslave their native country. Norfolk, dreading the contagion of the example, immediately retreated with his troops, and took shelter in the city. After this proof of the disposition of the people, especially of the Londoners, who were mostly Protestants, Wyatt was encouraged to proceed. He led his forces to Southwark, where he required of the Queen that she put the tower into his hands, should deliver four councillors as hostages, and in order to ensure the liberty of the nation, should immediately marry an Englishman. Finding that the bridge was secured against him, and that the city was overawed, he marched up to Kingston, where he passed the river with four thousand men, and returning towards London, hoped to encourage his partisans who had engaged to declare for him. He had imprudently wasted so much time at Southwark, and in his march from Kingston, that the critical season on which all popular commotions depend was entirely lost. Though he entered Westminster without resistance, his followers, finding that no person of note joined him, insensibly fell off and he was at last seized near Temple Bar by Sir Maurice Barclay. Four hundred persons are said to have suffered for this rebellion. Four hundred more were conducted before the Queen with ropes about their necks, and falling on their knees received a pardon and were dismissed. Wyatt was condemned and executed, as it had been reported that on his examination he had accused the Lady Elizabeth and the Earl of Devonshire as accomplices. He took care on the scaffold before the whole people, fully to acquit them of having any share in his rebellion. 
The Lady Elizabeth had been during some time treated with great harshness by her sister, and many studied instances of discouragement and disrespect had been practised against her. She was ordered to take place at court, after the Countess of Lennox and the Duchess of Suffolk, as if she were not legitimate. Her friends were discountenanced on every occasion, and while her virtues, which were now become eminent, drew her to the attendance of all the young nobility, and rendered her the favourite of the nation, the malevolence of the queen still discovered itself every day by fresh symptoms, and obliged the princess to retire into the country. Mary seized the opportunity of this rebellion, and hoping to involve her sister in some appearance of guilt, sent for her under a strong guard, committed her to the tower, and ordered her to be strictly examined by the council. But the public declaration made by Wyatt rendered it impractical to employ against her any false evidence which might have offered, and the princess made so good a defence that the queen found herself under a necessity of releasing her. In order to send her out of the kingdom, a marriage was offered her with the Duke of Savoy, and when she declined the proposal she was committed to custody under a strong guard at Woodstoke. The Earl of Devonshire, though equally innocent, was confined in Fotheringay Castle. But this rebellion proved still more fatal to the Lady Jane Grey, as well as to her husband. The Duke of Suffolk's guilt was imputed to her, and though the rebels and malcontents seemed chiefly to rest their hopes on the Lady Elizabeth and the Earl of Devonshire, the Queen, incapable of generosity or clemency, determined to remove every person from whom the least danger could be apprehended. Warning was given the Lady Jane to prepare for death, a doom which she had long expected, and which the innocence of her life, as well as the misfortunes to which she had been exposed, rendered nowise unwelcome to her. The Queen's zeal, under colour of tender mercy to the prisoner's soul, induced her to send divines, who harassed her with perpetual disputation, and even a reprieve for three days was granted her, in hopes that she would be persuaded during that time to pay, by a timely conversion, some regard to her eternal welfare. The Lady Jane had presence of mind, in those melancholy circumstances, not to defend her religion by all the topics then in use, but also to write a letter to her sister in the Greek language, in which, besides sending her a copy of the scriptures in that tongue, she exhorted her to maintain in every fortune a like steady perseverance. On the day of her execution her husband, Lord Guildford, desired permission to see her, but she refused her consent, and informed him by a message that the tenderness of their parting would overcome the fortitude of both, and would too much unbend their minds from that constancy which their approaching end required of them. Their separation, she said, would be only for a moment, and they would soon rejoin each other in a scene where their affections would be forever united, and where death, disappointment, and misfortunes could no longer have access to them, or disturb their eternal felicity. End of section 45, chapter 36, part 2 Section 46 of Volume 1C of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume, Volume 1C, Section 46, Chapter 36, Part 3. It had been intended to execute the Lady Jane and Lord Guildford together on the same scaffold at Tower Hill. 
But the council, dreading the compassion of the people for their youth, beauty, innocence, and noble birth, changed their orders, and gave directions that she should be beheaded within the verge of the tower. She saw her husband led to execution, and having given him from the window some token of her remembrance, she waited with tranquillity till her own appointed hour should bring her to a like fate. She even saw his headless body carried back in a cart, and found herself more confirmed by the reports which she heard of the constancy of his end than shaken by so tender and melancholy a spectacle. Sir John Gage, constable of the tower, when he led her to execution, desired her to bestow on him some small present which he might keep as a perpetual memorial of her. She gave him her table-book, on which she had written three sentences on seeing her husband's dead body, one in Greek, another in Latin, a third in English. The purport of them was that human justice was against his body, but divine mercy would be favourable to his soul, that if her fault deserved punishment, her youth at least and her imprudence were worthy of excuse, and that God and posterity she trusted would show her favour. On the scaffold she made a speech to the bystanders, in which the mildness of her disposition led her to take the blame wholly on herself, without uttering one complaint against the severity with which she had been treated. She said that her offence was not the having laid her hand upon the crown, but the not rejecting it with sufficient constancy, that she had less erred through ambition than through reverence to her parents, whom she had been taught to respect and obey, that she willingly received death as the only satisfaction which she could now make to the injured state, and though her infringement of the laws had been constrained, she would show by her voluntary submission to their sentence that she was desirous to atone for that disobedience into which too much filial piety had betrayed her that she had justly deserved this punishment for being made the instrument, though the unwilling instrument, of the ambition of others, and that the story of her life, she hoped, might at least be useful, by proving that innocence excuses not great misdeeds, if they tend any wise to the destruction of the commonwealth. After uttering these words, she called herself to be disrobed by her women, and with a steady, serene countenance, submitted herself to the executioner. The Duke of Suffolk was tried, condemned, and executed soon after, and would have met with more compassion had not his temerity been the cause of his daughter's untimely end. Lord Thomas Grey lost his life for the same crime. Sir Nicholas Throgmorton was tried in Guildhall, but there appearing no satisfactory evidence against him, he was able, by making an admirable defence, to obtain a verdict of the jury in his favour. The Queen was so enraged at this disappointment that instead of releasing him as the law required, she recommitted him to the Tower and kept him in close confinement during some time. But her resentment stopped not there. The jury, being summoned before the council, were all sent to prison, and afterwards fined, some of them a thousand pounds, others two thousand apiece. The violence proved fatal to several, among others Sir John Throgmorton, brother to Sir Nicholas, who was condemned on no better evidence than had formerly been rejected. The Queen filled the tower and all the prisons with nobility and gentry, whom their interest with the nation, rather than any appearance of guilt, had made the objects of her suspicion, and finding that she was universally hated, she determined to disable the people from resistance, by ordering general musters and directing the commissioners to seize their arms, and lay them up in forts and castles. 
Though the government labored under so general an odium, the Queen's authority had received such an increase from the suppression of Wyatt's rebellion, that the ministry hoped to find a compliant disposition in the new Parliament which was summoned to assemble. The Emperor also, in order to facilitate the same end, had borrowed no less a sum than four hundred thousand crowns, which he had sent over to England to be distributed in bribes and pensions among the members, a pernicious practice of which there had not hitherto been any instance in England, and not to give the public any alarm with regard to the church lands. The Queen, notwithstanding her bigotry, resumed her title of supreme head of the church, which she had dropped three months before. Gardiner, the Chancellor, opened the session by a speech, in which he asserted the Queen's hereditary title to the crown, maintained her right of choosing a husband for herself, observed how proper a use she had made of that right by giving the preference to an old ally, descended from the House of Burgundy, and remarked the failure of Henry the Eighth's posterity, of whom there now remained none but the Queen and the Lady Elizabeth. He added that, in order to obviate the inconveniences which might arise from different pretenders, it was necessary to invest the Queen, by law, with the power of disposing of the crown, and of appointing her successor, a power, he said, which was not to be thought unprecedented in England, since it had formerly been conferred on Henry the Eighth. The Parliament was much disposed to gratify the Queen in all her desires, but when the liberty, independency, and very being of the nation were in such visible danger, they could not by any means be brought to compliance. They knew both the inveterate hatred which she bore to the Lady Elizabeth, and her devoted attachment to the House of Austria. They were acquainted with her extreme bigotry, which would lead her to postpone all considerations of justice or national interest to the establishment of the Catholic religion. They remarked that Gardiner had carefully avoided in his speech the giving to Elizabeth the appellation of the Queen's sister, and they thence concluded that a design was formed of excluding her as illegitimate. They expected that Mary, if invested with such a power as she required, would make a will in her husband's favour, and thereby render England forever a province to the Spanish monarchy. And they were the more alarmed with these projects, as they heard that Philip's descent from the House of Lancaster was carefully insisted on, and that he was publicly represented as the true and only heir by right of inheritance. The Parliament, therefore, aware of their danger, were determined to keep at a distance from the precipice which lay before them. They could not avoid ratifying the articles of marriage which were drawn very favourable for England, but they declined the passing of any such law as the Chancellor pointed out to them. They would not so much as declare it treason to imagine or attempt the death of the Queen's husband while she was alive and a bill introduced for that purpose was laid aside after the first reading, the more effectually to cut off Philip's hopes of possessing any authority in England, they passed a law in which they declared that Her Majesty, as the only Queen, should solely, and as a sole Queen, enjoy the crown and sovereignty of her realms, with all the preeminences, dignities, and rights thereto belonging, in as large and ample a manner after her marriage as before, without any title or claim accruing to the Prince of Spain, either as tenant by courtesy of the realm, or by any other means. A law passed in this Parliament for re-erecting the bishopric of Durham, which had been dissolved by the last Parliament of Edward. The Queen had already, by an exertion of her power, put Tonstall in possession of that see, but though it was usual at that time for the crown to assume authority which might seem entirely legislative, 
it was always deemed more safe and satisfactory to procure the sanction of Parliament. Bills were introduced for suppressing heterodox opinions contained in books, and for reviving the law of the six articles, together with those against the Lollards, and against heresy and erroneous preaching. But none of these laws could pass the two houses, a proof that the Parliament had reserves even in their concessions with regard to religion, about which they seemed to have been less scrupulous. The Queen, therefore, finding that they would not serve all her purposes, finished the session by dissolving them. Mary's thoughts were now entirely employed about receiving Don Philip, whose arrival she hourly expected. This princess, who had lived so many years in a very reserved and private manner, without any prospect or hopes of a husband, was so smitten with affection for her young consort, whom she had never seen, that she waited with the utmost impatience for the completion of the marriage, and every obstacle was to her a source of anxiety and discontent. She complained of Philip's delays as affected, and she could not conceal her vexation, that though she brought him a kingdom as her dowry, he treated her with such neglect that he had never yet favoured her with a single letter. Her fondness was but the more increased by this supercilious treatment, and when she found that her subjects had entertained the greatest aversion for the event to which she directed her fondest wishes, she made the whole English nation the object of her resentment. A squadron under the command of Lord Effingham had been fitted out to convoy Philip from Spain, where he then resided, but the admiral informing her that the discontents ran very high among the seamen, and that it was not safe for Philip to entrust himself in their hands, she gave orders to dismiss them. She then dreaded lest the French fleet, being masters of the sea, might intercept her husband, and every rumour of danger, every blast of wind, threw her into panics and convulsions. Her health, and even her understanding, were visibly hurt by this extreme impatience, and she was struck with a new apprehension lest her person, impaired by time and blasted by sickness, should prove disagreeable to her future consort. Her glass discovered to her how haggard she was become, and when she remarked the decay of her beauty, she knew not whether she ought more to desire or apprehend the arrival of Philip. At last came the moment so impatiently expected, and news was brought to the Queen of Philip's arrival at Southampton. A few days after they were married in Westminster, and having made a pompous entry into London, where Philip displayed his wealth with great ostentation, she carried him to Windsor, the palace in which they afterwards resided. The prince's behaviour was ill calculated to remove the prejudices which the English nation had entertained against him. He was distant and reserved in his address, took no notice of the salutes even of the most considerable noblemen, and so entrenched himself in form and ceremony that he was in a manner inaccessible. But this circumstance rendered him the more acceptable to the queen, who desired to have no company but her husband's, and who was impatient when she met with any interruption to her fondness. The shortest absence gave her vexation, and when he showed civilities to any other woman, she could not conceal her jealousy and resentment. Mary soon found that Philip's ruling passion was ambition, and that the only method of gratifying him and securing his affections was to render him master of England. The interest and liberty of her people were considerations of small moment in comparison of her obtaining this favourite point. She summoned a new Parliament in hopes of finding them entirely compliant, and that she might acquire the greater authority over them, she imitated the precedent of the former reign, and wrote circular letters, 
directing a proper choice of members. The zeal of the Catholics, the influence of Spanish gold, the powers of prerogative, the discouragement of the gentry, particularly of the Protestants, all these causes seconding the intrigues of Gardiner, had procured her a house of commons which was in a great measure to her satisfaction, and it was thought from the disposition of the nation that she might now safely omit, on her assembling the Parliament, the title of supreme head of the Church, though inseparably annexed by law to the Crown of England. Cardinal Pole had arrived in Flanders, invested with legatine powers from the Pope, in order to prepare the way for his arrival in England, the Parliament passed an act reversing his attainder and restoring his blood, and the Queen, dispensing with the old statute of provisors, granted him permission to act as legate. The Cardinal came over, and after being introduced to the King and Queen, he invited the Parliament to reconcile themselves and the Kingdom to the Apostolic See, from which they had so long and so unhappily divided. The message was taken in good part, and both houses voted an address to Philip and Mary, acknowledging that they had been guilty of a most horrible defection from the true Church, professing a sincere repentance of their past transgression, declaring their resolution to repeal all laws enacted in prejudice of the Church of Rome and praying their majesties that since they were happily uninfected with that criminal schism, they would intercede with the Holy Father for the absolution and forgiveness of their penitent subjects. The request was easily granted. The legate, in the name of his holiness, gave the Parliament and Kingdom absolution, freed them from all censures, and received them again into the bosom of the Church. The Pope, then Julius the Third, being informed of these transactions, said that it was an unexampled instance of his felicity to receive thanks from the English for allowing them to do what he ought to give them thanks for performing. Notwithstanding the extreme zeal of those times for and against popery, the object always uppermost with the nobility and gentry was their money and estates. They were not brought to make these concessions in favour of Rome till they had received repeated assurances from the Pope as well as the Queen that the plunder which they had made on the ecclesiastics should never be inquired into, and that the abbey and church lands should remain with their present possessors but not trusting altogether to these promises, the Parliament took care, in the law itself by which they repealed the former statutes enacted against the Pope's authority, to insert a clause in which, besides bestowing validity on all marriages celebrated during the schism, and fixing the right of incumbents to their benefices, they gave security to the possessors of church lands, and freed them from all danger of ecclesiastical censures. The convocation also, in order to remove apprehensions on that head, were induced to present a petition to the same purpose, and the legate, in his master's name, ratified all these transactions. It now appeared that, notwithstanding the efforts of the Queen and King, the power of the papacy was effectually suppressed in England and invincible barriers fixed against its re-establishment, for though the jurisdiction of the ecclesiastics was for the present restored, their property on which their power much depended was irretrievably lost, and no hopes remained of recovering it. Even these arbitrary, powerful, and bigoted princes, while the transactions were yet recent, could not regain to the church her possessions so lately ravished from her, and no expedients were left to the clergy for enriching themselves but those which they had at first practised, and which had required many ages of ignorance, barbarism, and superstition to produce their effect on mankind. The Parliament, having secured their own possessions, 
were more indifferent with regard to religion or even to the lives of their fellow citizens they revived the old sanguinary laws against heretics which had been rejected in the former parliament they also enacted several statutes against seditious words and rumours and they made it treason to imagine or attempt the death of philip during his marriage with the queen each parliament hitherto had been induced to go a step farther than their predecessors but none of them had entirely lost all regard to national interests. Their hatred against the Spaniards, as well as their suspicion of Philip's pretensions, still prevailed, and though the Queen attempted to get her husband declared presumptive heir of the crown, and to have the administration put into his hands, she failed in all her endeavours and could not so much as procure the Parliament's consent to his coronation. All attempts likewise to obtain subsidies from the commons in order to support the emperor in his war against France proved fruitless. The usual animosity and jealousy of the English against that kingdom seemed to have given place for the present to like passions against Spain. Philip, sensible of the prepossessions entertained against him, endeavoured to acquire popularity by procuring the release of several prisoners of distinction. Lord Henry Dudley, Sir George Harper, Sir Nicholas Throgmorton, Sir Edward Warner, Sir William St. Lowe, Sir Nicholas Arnold, Harrington Tremaine, who had been confined from the suspicions or resentment of the court but nothing was more agreeable to the nation than his protecting the Lady Elizabeth from the spite and malice of the Queen, and restoring her to liberty. This measure was not the effect of any generosity in Philip, a sentiment of which he was wholly destitute, but of a refined policy which made him foresee that, if that princess were put to death, the next lawful heir was the Queen of Scots, whose succession would forever annex England to the crown of France. The Earl of Devonshire also reaped some benefit from Philip's affectation of popularity, and recovered his liberty, but that nobleman, finding himself exposed to suspicion, begged permission to travel, and he soon after died at Padua from poison, as is pretended, given him by the imperialists. He was the eleventh and last Earl of Devonshire of that noble family, one of the most illustrious in Europe. The Queen's extreme desire of having issue had made her fondly give credit to any appearance of pregnancy, and when the legate was introduced to her, she fancied that she felt the embryo stir in her womb. Her flatterers compared this motion of the infant to that of John the Baptist, who leapt in his mother's belly at the salutation of the Virgin. Dispatches were immediately sent to inform foreign courts of this event. Orders were issued to give public thanks. Great rejoicings were made. The family of the young prince was already settled, for the Catholics held themselves assured that the child was to be a male, and Bonner, Bishop of London, made public prayers be said, that heaven would please to render him beautiful, vigorous, and witty. But the nation still remained somewhat incredulous, and men were persuaded that the queen labored under infirmities which rendered her incapable of having children. Her infant proved only the commencement of a dropsy, which the disordered state of her health had brought upon her, the belief, however, of her pregnancy was upheld with all possible care, and was one artifice by which Philip endeavoured to support his authority in the kingdom. The Parliament passed a law which, in the case of the Queen's demise, appointed him protector during the minority, and the King and Queen, finding they could obtain no further concessions, came unexpectedly to Westminster and dissolved them. There happened an incident this session which must not be passed over in silence. Several members of the lower house 
dissatisfied with the measures of the Parliament, but finding themselves unable to prevent them, made a secession in order to show their disapprobation, and refused any longer to attend the house. For this instance of contumacy, they were indicted in the king's bench after the dissolution of Parliament. Six of them submitted to the mercy of the court and paid their fines. The rest traversed, and the queen died before the affair was brought to an issue. Judging of the matter by the subsequent claims of the House of Commons, and indeed by the true principles of free government, this attempt of the Queen's ministers must be regarded as a breach of privilege, but it gave little umbrage at the time, and was never called in question by any House of Commons which afterwards sat during this reign. The Count of Noé, the French ambassador, says that the Queen threw several members into prison for their freedom of speech. End of section 46, chapter 36, part 3《Section 47 of Volume 1C of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 to 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 Chapter 37, Part 1 Mary The success which Gardiner, from his cautious and prudent conduct, had met with in governing the Parliament and engaging them to concur both in the Spanish match and in the re-establishment of the ancient religion, two points to which it was believed they bore an extreme aversion, had so raised his character for wisdom and policy that his opinion was received as an oracle in the council, and his authority, as it was always great in his own party, no longer suffered any opposition or control. Cardinal Pole himself, though more beloved on account of his virtue and candor, and though superior in birth and station, had not equal weight in public deliberations, and while his learning, piety, and humanity were extremely respected, he was represented more as a good man than a great minister. A very important question was frequently debated before the Queen and Council by these two ecclesiastics, whether the laws lately revived against heretics should be put in execution, or should only be employed to restrain by terror the bold attempts of these zealots. Paul was very sincere in his religious principles, and though his moderation had made him be suspected at Rome of a tendency towards Lutheranism, he was seriously persuaded of the Catholic doctrines, and thought that no consideration of human policy ought ever to come in competition with such important interests. Gardiner, on the contrary, had always made his religion subservient to his schemes of safety or advancement, and by his unlimited complaisance to Henry, he had shown that, had he not been pushed to extremity under the late minority, he was sufficiently disposed to make a sacrifice of his principles to the established theology. This was the well-known character of these two great counsellors. Yet such is the prevalence of temper above system, that the benevolent disposition of Pole led him to advise a toleration of the heretical tenets which he highly blamed, while the severe manners of Gardiner included him to support by persecution that religion which at the bottom he regarded with great indifference. This circumstance of public conduct was of the highest importance, and from being the object of deliberation in the council, it soon became the subject of discourse throughout the nation. We shall relate in a few words the topics by which each side supported, or might have supported, their scheme of policy, 
and shall display the opposite reasons which have been employed with regard to an argument that has ever been and ever will be so much canvassed the practice of persecution said the defenders of pole's opinion is the scandal of all religion and the theological animosity so fierce and violent far from being an argument of men's conviction in their opposite sects is a certain proof that they have never reached any serious persuasion with regard to these remote and sublime subjects even those who are the most impatient of contradiction in other controversies are mild and moderate in comparison of polemical divines and whenever a man's knowledge and experience give him a perfect assurance in his own opinion he regards with contempt rather than anger the opposition and mistakes of others but while men zealously maintain what they neither clearly comprehend nor entirely believe they are shaken in their imagined faith by the opposite persuasion or even doubts of other men and vent on their antagonists that impatience which is the natural result of so disagreeable a state of the understanding they then easily embrace any pretense for representing opponents as impious and profane, and if they can also find a colour for connecting this violence with the interests of civil government, they can no longer be restrained from giving uncontrolled scope to vengeance and resentment. But surely never enterprise was more unfortunate than that of founding persecution upon policy, or endeavouring for the sake of peace to settle an entire uniformity of opinion in questions which of all others are least subjected to the criterion of human reason the universal and uncontradicted prevalence of one opinion in religious subjects can be owing at first to the stupid ignorance alone and barbarism of the people who never indulge themselves in any speculation or inquiry, and there is no expedient for maintaining that uniformity so fondly sought after, but by banishing forever all curiosity and all improvement in science and cultivation. It may not indeed appear difficult to check, by a steady severity, the first beginnings of controversy, but besides that this policy exposes forever the people to all the abject terrors of superstition and the magistrate to the endless encroachments of ecclesiastics it also renders men so delicate that they can never endure to hear of opposition and they will some time pay dearly for that false tranquillity in which they have been so long indulged as healthful bodies are ruined by too nice a regimen and are thereby rendered incapable of bearing the unavoidable incidents of human life a people who never were allowed to imagine that their principles could be contested fly out into the most outrageous violence when any event and such events are common produces a faction among their clergy and gives rise to any difference in tenet or opinion but whatever may be said in favour of suppressing by persecution the first beginnings of heresy no solid argument can be alleged for extending severity towards multitudes or endeavouring by capital punishments to extirpate an opinion which has diffused itself among men of every rank and station besides the extreme barbarity of such an attempt it commonly proves ineffectual to the purpose intended and serves only to make men more obstinate in their persuasion and to increase the number of their proselytes the melancholy with which the fear of death torture and persecution inspires the sectaries is the proper disposition for fostering religious zeal the prospect of eternal rewards when brought near overpowers the dread of temporal punishments the glory of martyrdom stimulates all the more furious zealots especially the leaders and preachers 
where a violent animosity is excited by oppression, men naturally pass from hating the persons of their tyrants to a more violent abhorrent of their doctrines, and the spectators, moved with pity towards the supposed martyrs, are easily seduced to embrace those principles which can inspire men with a constancy that appears almost supernatural. Open the door to toleration. Mutual hatred relaxes among the sectaries. Their attachment to their particular modes of religion decays. The common occupations and pleasures of life succeed to the acrimony of disputation, and the same man who in other circumstances would have braved flames and tortures is induced to change his sect from the smallest prospect of favour and advancement, or even from the frivolous hope of becoming more fashionable in his principles. If any exception can be admitted to this maxim of toleration, it will only be where a theology altogether new, nowise connected with the ancient religion of the state, is imported from foreign countries, and may easily at one blow be eradicated, without leaving the seeds of future innovation. But as this exception would imply some apology for the ancient pagan persecutions, or for the extirpation of Christianity in China and Japan, it ought surely, on account of this detested consequence, to be rather buried in eternal silence and oblivion. Though these arguments appear entirely satisfactory, yet such is the subtlety of human wit, that Gardiner and the other enemies to toleration were not reduced to silence, and they still found topics on which to maintain the controversy. The doctrine, said they, of liberty of conscience, is founded on the most flagrant impiety, and supposes such an indifference among all religions, such an obscurity in theological doctrines, as to render the church and magistrate incapable of distinguishing with certainty the dictates of heaven from the mere fictions of human imagination. If the divinity reveals principles to mankind, he will surely give a criterion by which they may be ascertained, and a prince who knowingly allows these principles to be perverted or adulterated is infinitely more criminal than if he gave permission for the vending of poison under the shape of food to all his subjects. Persecution may indeed seem better calculated to make hypocrites than converts, but experience teaches us that the habits of hypocrisy often turn into reality, and the children, at least, ignorant of the dissimulation of their parents, may happily be educated in more orthodox tenets. It is absurd, in opposition to considerations of such unspeakable importance, to plead the temporal and frivolous interests of civil society, and if matters be thoroughly examined, even that topic will not appear so universally certain in favour of toleration as by some it is represented. Where sects arise whose fundamental principle on all sides is to execrate, and abhor, and damn, and extirpate each other, what choice has the magistrate left but to take part, and by rendering one sect entirely prevalent, restore, at least for a time, the public tranquillity? The political body, being here sickly, must not be treated as if it were in a state of sound health, and an affected neutrality in the prince, or even a cool preference, may serve only to encourage the hopes of all the sects, and keep alive their animosity. The Protestants, far from tolerating the religion of their ancestors, regard it as an impious and detestable idolatry, and during the late minority, when they were entirely masters, they enacted very severe, though not capital, punishments against all exercise of the Catholic worship and even against such as barely abstained from their profane rites and sacraments. Nor are instances wanting of their endeavours to secure an imagined orthodoxy 
by the most rigorous executions. Calvin has burned Servetus at Geneva. Cranmer brought Arians and Anabaptists to the stake, and if persecution of any kind be admitted, the most bloody and violent will surely be allowed the most justifiable as the most effectual. Imprisonments, fines, confiscations, whippings, serve only to irritate the sects without disabling them from resistance, but the stake, the wheel, and the gibbet must soon terminate in the extirpation or banishment of all the heretics inclined to give disturbance, and in the entire silence and submission of the rest. The arguments of Gardiner, being more agreeable to the cruel bigotry of Mary and Philip, were better received, and though Pole pleaded, as is affirmed, the advice of the Emperor, who recommended it to his daughter-in-law not to exercise violence against the Protestants, and desired her to consider his own example, who, after endeavouring through his whole life to extirpate heresy, had in the end reaped nothing but confusion and disappointment, the scheme of toleration was entirely rejected. It was determined to let loose the laws in their full vigour against the reformed religion, and England was soon filled with scenes of horror, which have ever since rendered the Catholic religion the object of general detestation, and which prove that no human depravity can equal revenge and cruelty covered with the mantle of religion. The persecutors began with Rogers, prebendary of St. Paul's, a man eminent in his party for virtue as well as for learning. Gardiner's plan was first to attack men of that character whom he hoped terror would bend to submission, and whose example either of punishment or recantation, would naturally have influence on the multitude. But he found a perseverance and courage in Rogers, which it may seem strange to find in human nature, and of which all ages and all sects do nevertheless furnish many examples. Rogers, besides the care of his own preservation, lay under other powerful temptations to compliance, he had a wife whom he tenderly loved, and ten children, yet such was his serenity after his condemnation, that the jailers, it is said, waked him from a sound sleep when the hour of his execution approached. He had desired to see his wife before he died, but Gardiner told him that he was a priest, and could not possibly have a wife, thus joining insult to cruelty. Rogers was burned in Smithfield. Hooper, Bishop of Gloucester, had been tried at the same time with Rogers, but was sent to his own diocese to be executed. This circumstance was contrived to strike the greater terror into his flock, but it was a source of consolation to Hooper, who rejoiced in giving testimony by his death to that doctrine which he had formerly preached among them. When he was tied to the stake, a stool was set before him, and the Queen's pardon laid upon it, which it was still in his power to merit by a recantation, but he ordered it to be removed, and cheerfully prepared himself for that dreadful punishment to which he was sentenced. He suffered it in its full severity, the wind, which was violent, blew the flame of the reeds from his body. The faggots were green and did not kindle easily. All his lower parts were consumed before his vitals were attacked. One of his hands dropped off, with the other he continued to beat his breast. He was heard to pray and to exhort the people, till his tongue, swollen with the violence of his agony, could no longer permit him utterance. He was three-quarters of an hour in torture, which he bore with inflexible constancy. Sanders was burned at Coventry. A pardon was also offered him, but he rejected it, 
and embraced the stake, saying, Welcome the cross of Christ, welcome everlasting life. Taylor, parson of Hadley, was punished by fire in that place, surrounded by his ancient friends and parishioners. When tied to the stake, he rehearsed a psalm in English. One of his guards struck him on the mouth and bade him speak Latin. Another, in a rage, gave him a blow on the head with his halbert, which happily put an end to his torments. There was one Philpot, archdeacon of Winchester, inflamed with such seal for orthodoxy, that having been engaged in dispute with an Arian, he spit in his adversary's face to show the great detestation which he had entertained against that heresy. He afterwards wrote a treatise to justify this unmannerly expression of zeal. He said that he was led to it in order to relieve the sorrow conceived from such horrid blasphemy, and to signify how unworthy such a miscreant was of being admitted into the society of any Christian. Philpot was a Protestant, and falling now into the hands of people as zealous as himself, but more powerful, he was condemned to the flames and suffered at Smithfield. It seems to be almost a general rule that in all religions except the true, no man will suffer martyrdom who would not also inflict it willingly on all that differ from him. The same zeal for speculative opinions is the cause of both. The crime for which almost all the Protestants were condemned was their refusal to acknowledge the real presence. Gardiner, who had vainly expected that a few examples would strike a terror into the reformers, finding the work daily multiply upon him, devolved the invidious office on others, chiefly on Bonner, a man of profligate manners and of a brutal character, who seemed to rejoice in the torments of the unhappy sufferers. He sometimes whipped the prisoners with his own hands, till he was tired of the violence of the exercise. He tore out the beard of a weaver who refused to relinquish his religion, and that he might give him a specimen of burning, he held his hand to the candle till the sinews and veins shrunk and burst. It is needless to be particular in enumerating all the cruelties practised in England during the course of three years that these persecutions lasted. The savage barbarity on the one hand, and the patient constancy on the other, are so similar in all those martyrdoms that the narrative, little agreeable in itself, would never be relieved by any variety. Human nature appears not on any occasion so detestable and at the same time so absurd as in these religious persecutions which sink men below infernal spirits in wickedness and below the beasts in folly. A few instances only may be worth preserving in order, if possible, to warn zealous bigots forever to avoid such odious and such fruitless barbarity. Ferrar, Bishop of St. David's, was burned in his own diocese, and his appeal to Cardinal Pole was not attended to. Ridley, Bishop of London, and Latimer, formerly Bishop of Worcester, two prelates celebrated for learning and virtue, perished together in the same flames at Oxford, and supported each other's constancy by their mutual exhortations. Latimer, when tied to the stake, called to his companion, Be of good cheer, brother, we shall this day kindle such a torch in England, as, I trust in God, shall never be extinguished. The executioners had been so merciful, for that clemency may more naturally be ascribed to them than to the religious zealots, as to tie bags of gunpowder about these prelates, in order to put a speedy period to their tortures, the explosion immediately killed Latimer, who was in extreme old age. Ridley continued alive during some time in the midst of the flames. One hunter, 
a young man of nineteen, an apprentice, having been seduced by a priest into a dispute, had unwarily denied the real presence. Sensible of his danger, he immediately absconded, but Bonner, laying hold of his father, threatened him with the greatest severities if he did not produce the young man to stand his trial. Hunter, hearing of the vexations to which his father was exposed, voluntarily surrendered himself to Bonner, and was condemned to the flames by that barbarous prelate. Thomas Hawkes, when conducted to the stake, agreed with his friends that if he found the torture tolerable, he would make them a signal to that purpose in the midst of the flames. His zeal for the cause in which he suffered so supported him that he stretched out his arms, the signal agreed on, and in that posture he expired. This example, with many others of like constancy, encouraged multitudes not only to suffer, but even to court and aspire to martyrdom. The tender sex itself, as they have commonly greater propensity to religion, produced many examples of the most inflexible courage in supporting the profession of it against all the fury of the persecutors. One execution in particular was attended with circumstances which even at that time excited astonishment by reason of their unusual barbarity. A woman in Guernsey, being near the time of her labor when brought to the stake, was thrown into such agitation by the torture that her belly burst and she was delivered in the midst of the flames. One of the guards immediately snatched the infant from the fire and attempted to save it, but a magistrate who stood by ordered it to be thrown back, being determined, he said, that nothing should survive which sprang from so obstinate and heretical a parent. End of section 47, chapter 37, part 1. Section 48 of Volume 1C of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1C, Chapter 37. Part two. The persons condemned to these punishments were not convicted of teaching or dogmatizing contrary to the established religion. They were seized merely on suspicion, and articles being offered them to subscribe, they were immediately upon their refusal condemned to the flames. These instances of barbarity, so unusual in the nation, excited horror. The constancy of the martyrs was the object of admiration, and as men have a principle of equity engraven in their minds, which even false religion is not able totally to obliterate, they were shocked to see persons of probity, of honour, of pious dispositions, exposed to punishments more severe than were inflicted on the greatest ruffians for crimes subversive of civil society. To exterminate the whole Protestant party was known to be impossible, and nothing could appear more iniquitous than to subject to torture the most conscientious and courageous among them, and allow the cowards and hypocrites to escape. Each martyrdom, therefore, was equivalent to a hundred sermons against popery, and men either avoided such horrid spectacles, or returned from them full of a violent, though secret, indignation against the persecutors. Repeated orders were sent from the council to quicken the diligence of the magistrates in searching out heretics, and in some places the gentry were constrained to countenance by their presence those barbarous executions. These acts of violence tended only to render the Spanish government daily more odious, 
and Philip, sensible of the hatred which he incurred, endeavoured to remove the reproach from himself by a very gross artifice, he ordered his confessor to deliver, in his presence, a sermon in favour of toleration, a doctrine somewhat extraordinary in the mouth of a Spanish friar. But the court, finding that Bonner, however shameless and savage, would not bear alone the whole infamy, soon threw off the mask, and the unrelenting temper of the queen, as well as of the king, appeared without control. A bold step was even taken towards introducing the Inquisition into England, as the bishops' courts, though extremely arbitrary and not confined by any ordinary forms of law, appeared not to be invested with sufficient power. A commission was appointed by authority of the Queen's prerogative more effectually to extirpate heresy. Twenty-one persons were named, but any three were armed with the powers of the whole. The commission runs in these terms. That since many false rumours were published among the subjects, and many heretical opinions were also spread among them, the commissioners were to inquire into those, either by presentments, by witnesses, or any other political way they could devise, and to search after all heresies, the bringers in, the sellers, the readers of all heretical books. They were to examine and punish all misbehaviours or negligences in any church or chapel, and to try all priests that did not preach the sacrament of the altar. All persons that did not hear mass, or come to their parish church to service, that would not go in processions, or did not take holy bread or holy water, and if they found any that did obstinately persist in such heresies, they were to put them in the hands of their ordinaries, to be punished according to the spiritual laws, giving the commissioners full power to proceed as their discretions and consciences should direct them, and to use all such means as they would invent for the searching of the premises, empowering them also to call before them such witnesses as they pleased, and to force them to make oath of such things as might discover what they sought after. Some civil powers were also given the commissioners to punish vagabonds and quarrelsome persons. To bring the methods of proceeding in England still nearer to the practice of the Inquisition, Letters were written to Lord North and others, enjoining them to put to the torture such obstinate persons as would not confess, and there to order them at their discretion. Secret spies also, and informers were employed, according to the practice of that iniquitous tribunal. Instructions were given to the justices of peace, that they should call secretly before them one or two honest persons within their limits, or more at their discretion, and command them by oath or otherwise, that they shall secretly learn and search out such persons as shall evil behave themselves in church, or idly, or shall despise openly by words the king's or queen's proceedings, or go about to make any commotion or tell any seditious tales or news, and also that the same persons so to be appointed shall declare to the same justices of peace the ill behaviour of lewd, disordered persons, whether it shall be for using unlawful games, and such other light behaviour of such suspected persons, and that the same information shall be given secretly to the justices, and the same justices shall call such accused persons before them, and examine them without declaring by whom they were accused. And that the same justices shall, upon their examination, punish the offenders according as their offences shall appear, upon the accusement and examination, by their discretion, either by open punishment, or by good a-bearing. In some respects, 
This tyrannical edict even exceeded the oppression of the Inquisition, by introducing into every part of government the same iniquities which that tribunal practices for the extirpation of heresy only, and which are in some measure necessary, wherever that end is earnestly pursued. But the court had devised a more expeditious and summary method of supporting orthodoxy than even the Inquisition itself. They issued a proclamation against books of heresy treason and sedition, and declared that whosoever had any of these books, and did not presently burn them, without reading them or showing them to any other person, should be esteemed rebels, and without any further delay be executed by martial law. From the state of the English government during that period, it is not so much the illegality of these proceedings as their violence and their pernicious tendency which ought to be the object of our censure. We have thrown together almost all the proceedings against heretics, though carried on during a course of three years, that we may be obliged as little as possible to return to such shocking violences and barbarities. It is computed that in that time two hundred and seventy-seven persons were brought to the stake, besides those who were punished by imprisonment, fines, and confiscations. Among those who suffered by fire were five bishops, twenty-one clergymen, eight lay gentlemen, eighty-four tradesmen, one hundred husbandmen, servants and labourers, fifty-five women and four children. This persevering cruelty appears astonishing, yet is it much inferior to what has been practised in other countries. A great author computes that, in the Netherlands alone, from the time that the edict of Charles V was promulgated against the reformers, there had been fifty thousand persons hanged, beheaded, buried alive, or burnt, on account of religion, and that in France the number had also been considerable. Yet in both countries, as the same author subjoins, the progress of the new opinions, instead of being checked, was rather forwarded by these persecutions. The burning of heretics was a very natural method of reconciling the kingdom to the Romish communion, and little solicitation was requisite to engage the Pope to receive the strayed flock, from which he reaped such considerable profit. Yet there was a solemn embassy sent to Rome, consisting of Sir Anthony Brown, created Viscount Montacute, the Bishop of Ely, and Sir Edward Carne, in order to carry the submissions of England, and beg to be readmitted into the bosom of the Catholic Church. Paul the Fourth, after a short interval, now filled the papal chair, the most haughty pontiff that during several ages had been elevated to that dignity. He was offended that Mary still retained among her titles that of Queen of Ireland, and he affirmed that it belonged to him alone, as he saw cause either to erect new kingdoms or abolish the old, but to avoid all dispute with the new converts, he thought proper to erect Ireland into a kingdom, and he then admitted the title as if it had been assumed from his concession. This was a usual artifice of the popes, to give allowance to what they could not prevent, and afterwards pretend that princes, while they exercised their own powers, were only acting by authority from the papacy. And though Paul had first intended to oblige Mary formally to recede from this title before he would bestow it upon her, he found it prudent to proceed in a less haughty manner. Another point in discussion between the Pope and the English ambassadors was not so easily terminated. Paul insisted that the property and possessions of the church should be restored to the uttermost farthing, that whatever belonged to God, 
could never by any law be converted to profane uses, and every person who detained such possessions was in a state of eternal damnation, that he would willingly, in consideration of the humble submissions of the English, make them a present of these ecclesiastical revenues. But such a concession exceeded his power, and the people might be certain that so great a profanation of holy things would be a perpetual anathema upon them, and would blast all their future felicity, that if they would truly show their filial piety, they must restore all the privileges and emoluments of the Romish church, and Peter's pence among the rest, nor could they expect that this apostle would open to them the gates of paradise, while they detained from him his patrimony on earth. These earnest remonstrances, being transmitted to England, though they had little influence on the nation, operated powerfully on the Queen, who was determined, in order to ease her conscience, to restore all the church lands which were still in the possession of the crown, and the more to display her zeal, she erected anew some convents and monasteries, notwithstanding the low condition of the exchequer. When this measure was debated in council, some members objected that if such a considerable part of the revenue were dismembered, the dignity of the crown would fall to decay, but the queen replied that she preferred the salvation of her soul to ten such kingdoms as England. These imprudent measures would not probably have taken place so easily had it not been for the death of Gardiner, which happened about this time. The great seal was given to Heath, Archbishop of York, that an ecclesiastic might still be possessed of that high office, and be better enabled by his authority to forward the persecutions against the reformed. These persecutions were now become extremely odious to the nation, and the effects of the public discontent appeared in the new Parliament, summoned to meet at Westminster. A bill was passed restoring to the church the tenths and first fruits, and all the impropriations which remained in the hands of the crown, but though this matter directly concerned none but the queen herself, great opposition was made to the bill in the House of Commons. An application being made for a subsidy during two years, and for two fifteenths, the latter was refused by the Commons, and many members said that while the crown was thus despoiling itself of its revenue, it was in vain to bestow riches upon it. The Parliament rejected a bill for obliging the exiles to return under certain penalties, and another for incapacitating such as were remiss in the prosecution of heresy from being justices of peace. The Queen, finding the intractable humour of the Commons, thought proper to dissolve the Parliament. The spirit of opposition which began to prevail in Parliament was the more likely to be vexatious to Mary, as she was otherwise in very bad humour on account of her husband's absence, who, tired of her importunate love and jealousy, and finding his authority extremely limited in England, had laid hold of the first opportunity to leave her, and had gone over last summer to the emperor in Flanders. The indifference and neglect of Philip, added to the disappointment in her imagined pregnancy, threw her into deep melancholy, and she gave vent to her spleen by daily enforcing the persecutions against the Protestants, and even by expressions of rage against all her subjects, by whom she knew herself to be hated, and whose opposition in refusing an entire compliance with Philip was the cause, she believed, why he had alienated his affections from her, and afforded her so little of his company. The less return her love met with, the more it increased, and she passed most of her time in solitude, where she gave vent to her passion, either in tears or in writing fond epistles to Philip 
who seldom returned her any answer, and scarcely deigned to pretend any sentiment of love or even of gratitude towards her. The chief part of government to which she attended was the extorting of money from her people in order to satisfy his demands, and as the Parliament had granted her but a scanty supply, she had recourse to expedients very violent and irregular. She levied a loan of sixty thousand pounds upon a thousand persons, of whose compliance, either on account of their riches or their affections to her, she held herself best assured. But that sum not sufficing, she exacted a general loan on every one who possessed twenty pounds a year. This imposition lay heavy on the gentry, who were obliged, many of them, to retrench their expenses and dismiss their servants in order to enable them to comply with her demands, and as these servants, accustomed to idleness and having no means of subsistence, commonly betook themselves to theft and robbery, the Queen published a proclamation by which she obliged their former masters to take them back to their service. She levied sixty thousand marks on seven thousand yeomen who had not contributed to the former loan, and she exacted thirty-six thousand pounds more from the merchants. In order to engage some Londoners to comply more willingly with her multiplied extortions, she passed an edict prohibiting for four months the exporting of any English cloths or curseys to the Netherlands, an expedient which procured a good market for such as had already sent any quantity of cloth thither. Her rapaciousness engaged her to give endless disturbance and interruption to commerce. The English company settled in Antwerp, having refused her a loan of forty thousand pounds. She dissembled her resentment till she found that they had bought and shipped great quantities of cloth for Antwerp fair which was approaching. She then laid an embargo on the ships, and obliged the merchants to grant her a loan of the forty thousand pounds at first demanded, to engage for the payment of twenty thousand pounds more at a limited time, and to submit to an arbitrary imposition of twenty shillings on each piece. Some time after she was informed that the Italian merchants, had shipped above forty thousand pieces of cloth for the Levant, for which they were to pay her a crown apiece, the usual imposition. She struck a bargain with the merchant adventurers in London, prohibited the foreigners from making any exportation, and received from the English merchants, in consideration of this iniquity, the sum of fifty thousand pounds and an imposition of four crowns on each piece of cloth which they should export. She attempted to borrow great sums abroad, but her credit was so low that though she offered fourteen per cent to the city of Antwerp for a loan of thirty thousand pounds, she could not obtain it till she compelled the city of London to be surety for her. All these violent expedients were employed while she herself was in profound peace with all the world, and had visibly no occasion for money but to supply the demands of a husband who gave attention only to his own convenience, and showed himself entirely indifferent about her interests. Philip was now become master of all the wealth of the new world, and of the richest and most extensive dominions in Europe, by the voluntary resignation of the Emperor Charles V, who, though still in the vigour of his age, had taken a disgust to the world, and was determined to seek, in the tranquillity of retreat, for that happiness which he had in vain pursued amidst the tumults of war and the restless projects of ambition. He summoned the states of the Low Countries, and seating himself on the throne for the last time, explained to his subjects the reasons of his resignation, absolved them from all oaths of allegiance, and, devolving his authority on Philip, told him that his paternal tenderness made him weep 
when he reflected on the burden which he imposed upon him. He inculcated on him the great and only duty of a prince, the study of his people's happiness, and represented how much preferable it was to govern by affection rather than by fear the nations subjected to his dominion. The cool reflections of age now discovered to him the emptiness of his former pursuits, and he found that the vain schemes of extending his empire had been the source of endless opposition and disappointment, and kept himself, his neighbors, and his subjects in perpetual inquietude, and had frustrated the sole end of government, the felicity of the nations committed to his care, an object which meets with less opposition, and which, if steadily pursued, can alone convey a lasting and solid satisfaction. End of section 48, chapter 37, part 2《セクション49of Volume 1 C of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume, Volume 1 C, Section 49. Chapter 37, Part 3 A few months after, he resigned to Philip his other dominions, and embarking on board a fleet, sailed to Spain, and took his journey to St. Just, a monastery in Estremadura, which being situated in a happy climate, and amidst the greatest beauties of nature, he had chosen for the place of his retreat. When he arrived at Burgos, he found by the thinness of his court and the negligent attendance of the Spanish grandees that he was no longer emperor, and though this observation might convince him still more of the vanity of the world and make him more heartily despise what he had renounced, he sighed to find that all former adulation and obeisance had been paid to his fortune, not his person. With better reason was he struck with the ingratitude of his son Philip, who obliged him to wait a long time for the payment of the small pension which he had reserved, and this disappointment in his domestic enjoyments gave him a sensible concern. He pursued, however, his resolution with inflexible constancy, and shutting himself up in his retreat, he exerted such self-command that he restrained even his curiosity from any inquiry concerning the transactions of the world which he had entirely abandoned. The fencing against the pains and infirmities under which he labored occupied a great part of his time, and during the intervals he employed his leisure either in examining the controversies of theology, with which his age had been so much agitated, and which he had hitherto considered only in a political light, or in imitating the works of renowned artists, particularly in mechanics, of which he had always been a great admirer and encourager. He is said to have here discovered a propensity to the new doctrines, and to have frequently dropped hints of this unexpected alteration in his sentiments. Having amused himself with the construction of clocks and watches, he thence remarked how impractical the object was in which he had so much employed himself during his grandeur, and how impossible that he, who could never frame two machines that would go exactly alike, could ever be able to make all mankind concur in the same belief and opinion. He survived his retreat two years. The Emperor Charles had very early in the beginning of his reign found the difficulty of governing such distant dominions, and he had made his brother Ferdinand be elected King of the Romans, with a view to his inheriting the imperial dignity as well as his German dominions, but having afterwards enlarged his schemes and formed plans of aggrandizing his family, 
he regretted that he must dismember such considerable states, and he endeavoured to engage Ferdinand, by the most tempting offers and most earnest solicitations, to yield up his pretensions in favour of Philip. Finding his attempts fruitless, he had resigned the imperial crown with his other dignities, and Ferdinand, according to common form, applied to the Pope for his coronation. The arrogant pontiff refused the demand, and pretended that, though on the death of an emperor he was obliged to crown the prince elected, yet in the case of a resignation the right devolved to the Holy See, and it belonged to the Pope alone to appoint an emperor. The conduct of Paul was in everything conformable to these lofty pretensions. He thundered always in the ears of all ambassadors, that he stood in no need of the assistance of any prince, that he was above all potentates on the earth, that he would not accustom monarchs to pretend to a familiarity or equality with him, that it belonged to him to alter and regulate kingdoms, that he was successor of those who had deposed kings and emperors, and that rather than submit to anything below his dignity, he would set fire to the four corners of the world. He went so far as, at table, in the presence of many persons, and even openly in a public consistory, to say that he would not admit any kings for his companions. They were all his subjects, and he would hold them under these feet, so saying he stamped on the ground with his old and infirm limbs, for he was now past fourscore years of age. The world could not forbear making a comparison between Charles V, a prince who, though educated amidst wars and intrigues of state, had prevented the decline of age, and had descended from the throne in order to set apart an interval for thought and reflection, and a priest who in the extremity of old age exulted in his dominion, and from restless ambition and revenge was throwing all nations into combustion. Paul had entertained the most inveterate animosity against the house of Austria, and though a truce of five years had been concluded between France and Spain, he excited Henry by his solicitations to break it, and promised to assist him in recovering Naples and the dominions to which he laid claim in Italy, a project which had ever proved hurtful to the predecessors of that monarch. He himself engaged in hostilities with the Duke of Alva, Viceroy of Naples, and Guise being sent with forces to support him, the renewal of war between the two crowns seemed almost inevitable. Philip, though less warlike than his father, was no less ambitious, and he trusted that, by the intrigues of the cabinet, where he believed his caution and secrecy and prudence gave him the superiority, he should be able to subdue all his enemies and extend his authority and dominion. For this reason, as well as from the desire of settling his new empire, he wished to maintain peace with France. But when he found that, without sacrificing his honour, it was impossible for him to overlook the hostile attempts of Henry, he prepared for war with great industry. In order to give himself the more advantage, he was desirous of embarking England in the quarrel, and though the Queen was of herself extremely averse to that measure, he hoped that the devoted fondness, which notwithstanding repeated instances of his indifference, she still bore to him, would effectually second his applications. Had the matter indeed depended solely on her, she was incapable of resisting her husband's commands. But she had little weight with her council, still less with her people, and her government, which was every day becoming more odious, seemed unable to maintain itself, even during the most profound tranquillity, much more if a war were kindled with France, and what seemed an inevitable consequence with Scotland, supported by that powerful kingdom. An act of barbarity was this year exercised in England, 
which added to many other instances of the same kind, tended to render the government extremely unpopular. Cranmer had long been detained prisoner, but the Queen now determined to bring him to punishment, and in order the more fully to satiate her vengeance, she resolved to punish him for heresy rather than for treason. He was cited by the Pope to stand his trial at Rome, and though he was known to be kept in close custody at Oxford, he was, upon his not appearing, condemned as contumacious. Bonner, Bishop of London, and Thirlby of Ely, were sent to degrade him, and the former executed the melancholy ceremony with all the joy and exultation which suited his savage nature. The implacable spirit of the Queen, not satisfied with the eternal damnation of Cranmer, which she believed inevitable, and with the execution of that dreadful sentence to which he was condemned, prompted her also to seek the ruin of his honour and the infamy of his name. Persons were employed to attack him, not in the way of disputation against which he was sufficiently armed, but by flattery, insinuation, and address, by representing the dignities to which his character still entitled him, if he would merit them by a recantation, by giving hopes of long enjoying those powerful friends whom his beneficent disposition had attached to him during the course of his prosperity. Overcome by the fond love of life, terrified by the prospect of those tortures which awaited him, he allowed in an unguarded hour the sentiments of nature to prevail over his resolution, and he agreed to subscribe to the doctrines of the papal supremacy and of the real presence. The court, equally perfidious and cruel, were determined that this recantation should avail him nothing, and they sent orders that he should be required to acknowledge his errors in church before the whole people, and that he should thence be immediately carried to execution. Cranmer, whether that he had received a secret intimation of their design, or had repented of his weakness, surprised the audience by a contrary declaration. He said that he was well apprised of the obedience which he owed to his sovereign and the laws, but this duty extended no further than to submit patiently to their commands, and to bear without resistance whatever hardships they should impose upon him. That a superior duty, the duty which he owed to his Maker, obliged him to speak truth on all occasions, and not to relinquish by a base denial the holy doctrine which the Supreme Being had revealed to mankind, that there was one miscarriage in his life, of which, above all others, he severely repented, the insincere declaration of faith to which he had the weakness to consent, and which the fear of death alone had extorted from him, that he took this opportunity of atoning for his error by a sincere and open recantation, and was willing to seal with his blood that doctrine which he firmly believed to be communicated from heaven, and that, as his hand had erred by betraying his heart, it should first be punished by a severe but just doom, and should first pay the forfeit of his offences. He was thence led to the stake amidst the insults of the Catholics, and having now summoned up all the force of his mind, he bore their scorn as well as the torture of his punishment with singular fortitude. He stretched out his hand, and without betraying either by his countenance or motions the least sign of weakness or even of feeling, he held it in the flames till it was entirely consumed. His thoughts seemed wholly occupied with reflections on his former fault, and he called aloud several times, This hand has offended. Satisfied with that atonement, he then discovered a serenity in his countenance, and when the fire attacked his body, he seemed to be quite insensible of his outward sufferings, 
and by the force of hope and resolution to have collected his mind altogether within itself, and to repel the fury of the flames. It is pretended that after his body was consumed, his heart was found entire and untouched amidst the ashes, an event which, as it was the emblem of his constancy, was fondly believed by the zealous Protestants. He was undoubtedly a man of merit, possessed of learning and capacity, and adorned with candor, sincerity, and beneficence, and all those virtues which were fitted to render him useful and amiable in society. His moral qualities procured him universal respect, and the courage of his martyrdom, though he fell short of the rigid inflexibility observed in many, made him the hero of the Protestant party. After Cranmer's death, Cardinal Pole, who had now taken priest's orders, was installed in the See of Canterbury, and was thus, by this office, as well as by commission of legate, placed at the head of the Church of England. But though he was averse to all sanguinary methods of converting heretics, and deemed the reformation of the clergy the more effectual as the more laudable expedient for that purpose, he found his authority too weak to oppose the barbarous and bigoted disposition of the Queen and of her counsellors. He himself, he knew, had been suspected of Lutheranism, and as Paul, the reigning Pope, was a furious persecutor, and his personal enemy, he was prompted by the modesty of his disposition to reserve his credit for other occasions, in which he had a greater probability of success. The great object of the Queen was to engage the nation in the war which was kindled between France and Spain, and Cardinal Pole, with many other councillors, openly and zealously opposed this measure. Besides insisting on the marriage articles which provided against such an attempt, they represented the violence of the domestic factions in England, and the disordered state of the finances, and they foreboded that the tendency of all these measures was to reduce the kingdom to a total dependence on Spanish councils. Philip had come to London in order to support his partisans, and he told the Queen that if he were not gratified in so reasonable a request, he never more would set foot in England. This declaration extremely heightened her zeal for promoting his interests, and overcoming the inflexibility of her counsel. After employing other menaces of a more violent nature, she threatened to dismiss all of them, and to appoint counsellors more obsequious. Yet, could she not procure a vote for declaring war with France? At length, one Stafford and some other conspirators were detected in a design of surprising Scarborough, and a confession being extorted from them that they had been encouraged by Henry in the attempt, the Queen's importunity prevailed, and it was determined to make this act of hostility, with others of a like secret and doubtful nature, the ground of the quarrel. War was accordingly declared against France, and preparations were everywhere made for attacking that kingdom. The revenue of England at that time little exceeded three hundred thousand pounds. Any considerable supplies could scarcely be expected from Parliament, considering the recent disposition of the nation, and as the war would sensibly diminish that branch arising from the customs, the finances, it was foreseen, would fall short even of the ordinary charges of government, and must still more prove unequal to the expenses of war. But though the Queen owed great arrears to all her servants, besides the loans extorted from her subjects, these considerations had no influence with her, and in order to support her warlike preparations, she continued to levy money in the same arbitrary and violent manner which she had formerly practised. She obliged the city of London to supply her with sixty thousand pounds on her husband's entry. She levied before the legal time the second year's subsidy voted by Parliament. She issued anew many privy seals by which she procured loans from her people, and having equipped a fleet, 
which she could not victual by reasons of the dearness of provisions, she seized all the corn she could find in Suffolk and Norfolk, without paying any price to the owners. By all these expedients, assisted by the power of pressing, she levied an army of ten thousand men, which she sent over to the Low Countries under the command of the Earl of Pembroke. Meanwhile, in order to prevent any disturbance at home, many of the most considerable gentry were thrown into the tower, and lest they should be known, the Spanish practice was followed. They either were carried thither in the night-time, or were hoodwinked and muffled by the guards who conducted them. The King of Spain had assembled an army, which after the junction of the English amounted to above sixty thousand men, conducted by Philibert, Duke of Savoy, one of the greatest captains of the age. The constable Montmorency, who commanded the French army, had not half the number to oppose to him. The Duke of Savoy, after menacing Mariembra and Rockroy, suddenly sat down before St. Quentin, and as the place was weak and ill provided with a garrison, he expected in a few days to become master of it. But Admiral Coligny, governor of the province, thinking his honour interested to save so important a fortress, threw himself into St. Quintin with some troops of French and Scottish gendarmerie, and by his exhortations and example, animated the soldiers to a vigorous defence. He dispatched a messenger to his uncle Montmorency, desiring a supply of men, and the constable approached the place with his whole army, in order to facilitate the entry of these succours. But the Duke of Savoy, falling on the reinforcement, did such execution upon them, that not above five hundred got into the place. He next made an attack on the French army, and put them to total rout, killing four thousand men, and dispersing the remainder. In this unfortunate action many of the chief nobility of France were either slain or taken prisoner. Among the latter was the old constable himself, who, fighting valiantly and resolute to die rather than survive his defeat, was surrounded by the enemy, and thus fell alive into their hands. The whole kingdom of France was thrown into consternation. Paris was attempted to be fortified in a hurry, and had the Spaniards presently marched thither, it could not have failed to fall into their hands. But Philip was of a cautious temper, and he determined first to take St. Quentin, in order to secure a communication with his own dominions. A very little time, it was expected, would finish this enterprise, but the bravery of Coligny still prolonged the siege seventeen days, which proved the safety of France. Some troops were levied and assembled. Couriers were sent to recall the Duke of Guise and his army from Italy, and the French, having recovered from their first panic, put themselves in a posture of defence. Philip, after taking Ham and Catelet, found the season so far advanced that he could attempt no other enterprise. He broke up his camp and retired to winter quarters. But the vigilant activity of Guise, not satisfied with securing the frontiers, prompted him in the depth of winter to plan an enterprise which France, during her greatest successes, had always regarded as impracticable, and had never thought of undertaking. Calais was in that age deemed an impregnable fortress, and as it was known to be the favourite of the English nation, by whom it could easily be succoured, the recovery of that place by France was considered as totally desperate. But Coligny had remarked that as the town of Calais was surrounded with marshes, which during the winter were impassable, except over a dike guarded by two castles, St. Agatha and Newnham Bridge, the English were of late accustomed, on account of the lowness of their finances, to dismiss a great part of the garrison at the end of autumn, and to recall them in the spring, at which time alone they judged their attendance necessary. 
On this circumstance he had founded the design of making a sudden attack on Calais. He had caused the place to be secretly viewed by some engineers, and a plan of the whole enterprise being found among his papers, it served though he himself was made prisoner on the taking of St. Quintin, to suggest the project of that undertaking, and to direct the measures of the Duke of Guise. Several bodies of troops defiled towards the frontiers on various pretenses, and the whole being suddenly assembled formed an army, with which Guise made an unexpected march towards Calais, at the same time, a great number of French ships, being ordered into the channel under colour of cruising on the English, composed a fleet which made an attack by sea on the fortifications. The French assaulted St. Agatha with three thousand arquebusiers, and the garrison, though they made a vigorous defence, were soon obliged to abandon the place and retreat to Newnham Bridge. The siege of this latter place was immediately undertaken, and at the same time the fleet battered the Rizbank, which guarded the entrance of the harbour, and both these castles seemed exposed to imminent danger. The governor, Lord Wentworth, was a brave officer, but finding that the greater part of his weak garrison was enclosed in the castle of Newnham Bridge and the Rizbank, he ordered them to capitulate and to join him in Calais, which, without their assistance, he was utterly unable to defend. The garrison of Newnham Bridge was so happy as to effect this purpose, but that of the Rizbank could not obtain such favourable conditions, and were obliged to surrender at discretion. End of section 49, chapter 37, part 3. Section 50 of Volume 1C of History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Invasion of Julius Caesar to the Revolution of 1688 by David Hume. Volume 1C, Section 50, Chapter 37. Part Four. The Duke of Guise, now holding Calais blockaded by sea and land, thought himself secure of succeeding in his enterprise, but in order to prevent all accident, he delayed not a moment the attack of the place. He planted his batteries against the castle, where he made a large breach, and having ordered Andelot, Coligny's brother, to drain the fosse, he commanded an assault, which succeeded, and the French made a lodgment in the castle. On the night following, Wentworth attempted to recover this post, but having lost two hundred men in a furious attack which he made upon it, he found his garrison so weak that he was obliged to capitulate. Ham and Guinée fell soon after, and thus the Duke of Guise, in eight days during the depth of winter, made himself master of this strong fortress, that had cost Edward the Third a siege of eleven months at the head of a numerous army, which had that very year been victorious in the Battle of Crecy. The English had held it above two hundred years, and as it gave them an easy entrance into France, it was regarded as the most important possession belonging to the crown. The joy of the French was extreme, as well as the glory acquired by Guise, who at the time when all Europe imagined France to be sunk by the unfortunate battle of St. Quentin, had, in opposition to the English and their allies the Spaniards, acquired possession of a place which no former king of France, even during the distractions of the civil wars between the houses of York and Lancaster, had ever ventured to attempt. The English, on the other hand, bereaved of this valuable fortress, murmured loudly against the improvidence of the Queen and her council, who, after engaging in a fruitless war for the sake of foreign interests, had thus exposed the nation to so severe a disgrace. A treasury exhausted by expenses and burdened with debts, 
a people divided and dejected, a sovereign negligent of her people's welfare, were circumstances which, notwithstanding the fair offers and promises of Philip, gave them little hopes of recovering Calais, and as the Scots, instigated by French councils, began to move on the borders, they were now necessitated rather to look to their defence at home than to think of foreign conquests. After the peace, which in consequence of King Edward's treaty with Henry, took place between Scotland and England, the Queen Dowager, on pretence of visiting her daughter and her relations, made a journey to France, and she carried along with her the earls of Huntley, Sutherland, Marechal, and many of the principal nobility. Her secret design was to take measures for engaging the Earl of Iran, to resign to her the government of the kingdom, and as her brothers, the Duke of Guise, the Cardinal of Lorraine, and the Duke of Ormal, had uncontrolled influence in the court of France, she easily persuaded Henry, and by his authority the Scottish nobles, to enter into her measures. Having also gained Carnegie of Kinnaird, Panter, Bishop of Ross, and Gavin Hamilton, Commendator of Kilwinning, three creatures of the governors, she persuaded him by their means to consent to this resignation, and when everything was thus prepared for her purpose, she took a journey to Scotland, and passed through England in her way thither. Edward received her with great respect and civility, though he could not forbear attempting to renew the old treaty for his marriage with her daughter. A marriage, he said, so happily calculated for the tranquillity, interest, and security of both kingdoms, and the only means of ensuring a durable peace between them. For his part, he added, he could never entertain a cordial amity for any other husband whom she could choose, nor was it easy for him to forgive a man who, at the same time that he disappointed so natural an alliance, had bereaved him of a bride to whom his affections, from his earliest infancy, had been entirely engaged. The Queen Dowager eluded these applications by telling him that if any measures had been taken disagreeable to him, they were entirely owing to the imprudence of the Duke of Somerset, who, instead of employing courtesy, caresses, and gentle offices, the proper means of gaining a young princess, had had recourse to arms and violence, and had constrained the Scottish nobility to send their sovereign into France, in order to interest that kingdom in protecting their liberty and independence. When the Queen Dowager arrived in Scotland, she found the governor very unwilling to fulfil his engagements, and it was not till after many delays that he could be persuaded to resign his authority. But finding that the majority of the young princess was approaching, and that the Queen Dowager had gained the affections of all the principal nobility, he thought it more prudent to submit, and having stipulated that he should be declared next heir to the crown, and should be free from giving any account of his past administration, he placed her in possession of the power, and she thenceforth assumed the name of regent. It was a usual saying of this princess that provided she could render her friends happy, and could ensure to herself a good reputation, she was entirely indifferent what befell her. And though this sentiment is greatly censured by the zealous reformers, as being founded wholly on secular motives, it discovers a mind well calculated for the government of kingdoms. Doisel, a Frenchman, celebrated for capacity, had attended her as ambassador from Henry, but in reality to assist her with his counsels in so delicate an undertaking as the administration of Scotland. And this man had formed a scheme for laying a general tax on the kingdom, in order to support a standing military force, which might at once repel the inroads of foreign enemies, and check the turbulence of the Scottish nobles. But though some of the courtiers were gained over to this project, it gave great and general discontent to the nation, and the Queen Regent, after ingenuously confessing that it would prove pernicious to the kingdom, had the prudence to desist from it, 
and to trust entirely for her security to the good will and affections of her subjects. This laudable purpose seemed to be the chief object of her administration, yet was she sometimes drawn from it by her connections with France, and by the influence which her brothers had acquired over her. When Mary commenced hostilities against that kingdom, Henry required the Queen Regent to take part in the quarrel, and she summoned a convention of states at Newbottle, and requested them to concur in a declaration of war against England. The Scottish nobles, who were become as jealous as French of the English were of Spanish influence, refused their assent, and the Queen was obliged to have recourse to stratagem in order to effect her purpose. She ordered Doisel to begin some fortifications at Eymouth, a place which had been dismantled by the last treaty with Edward, and when the garrison of Berwick, as she foresaw, made an inroad to prevent the undertaking, she effectually employed this pretense to inflame the Scottish nation, and to engage them in hostilities against England. The enterprises, however, of the Scots, proceeded no farther than some inroads on the borders, when Doisel of himself conducted artillery and troops to besiege the castle of Werk, he was recalled and sharply rebuked by the council. In order to connect Scotland more closely with France, and to increase the influence of the latter kingdom, it was thought proper by Henry to celebrate the marriage between the young queen and the Dauphin, and a deputation was sent by the Scottish Parliament to assist at the ceremony, and to settle the terms of the contract. The close alliance between France and Scotland threatened very nearly the repose and security of Mary, and it was foreseen that though the factions and disorders which might naturally be expected in the Scottish government during the absence of the sovereign would make its power less formidable, that kingdom would at least afford to the French a means of invading England. The Queen, therefore, found it necessary to summon a Parliament and to demand of them some supplies to her exhausted exchequer. As such an emergency usually gives great advantage to the people, and as the parliaments during this reign had shown that, where the liberty and independence of the kingdom were menaced with imminent danger, they were not entirely overawed by the court, we shall naturally expect that the late arbitrary methods of extorting money should at least be censured, and perhaps some remedy be for the future provided against them. The commons, however, without making any reflections on the past, voted, besides a fifteenth, a subsidy of four shillings in the pound on land, and two shillings and eight pence on goods. The clergy granted eight shillings in the pound, payable, as was also the subsidy of the laity, in four years by equal portions. The Parliament also passed an act confirming all the sales and grants of crown lands, which either were already made by the Queen, or should be made during the seven ensuing years. It was easy to foresee that in Mary's present disposition and situation, this power would be followed by a great alienation of the royal domain, and nothing could be more contrary to the principles of good government than to establish a prince with very extensive authority, yet permit him to be reduced to beggary. This act met with opposition in the House of Commons. One Copley expressed his fears lest the Queen, under colour of the power there granted, might alter the succession and alienate the crown from the lawful heir. But his words were thought irreverent to Her Majesty, he was committed to the custody of the sergeant-at-arms, and though he expressed sorrow for his offence, he was not released till the Queen was applied to for his pardon. The English nation, during this whole reign, were under great apprehensions with regard not only to the succession, but the life of the Lady Elizabeth. The violent hatred which the Queen bore to her broke out on every occasion, and it required all the authority of Philip, as well as her own great prudence, to prevent the fatal effects of it. The princess retired into the country, 
and knowing that she was surrounded with spies, she passed her time wholly in reading and study, intermeddled with no business, and saw very little company. While she remained in this situation, which for the present was melancholy, but which prepared her mind for those great actions by which her life was afterwards so much distinguished, proposals of marriage were made to her by the Swedish ambassador in his master's name. As her first question was, whether the queen had been informed of these proposals, the ambassador told her that his master thought, as he was a gentleman, it was his duty first to make his addresses to herself, and having obtained her consent, he would next, as a king, apply to her sister. But the princess would allow him to proceed no further, and the queen, after thanking her for this instance of duty, desired to know how she stood affected to the Swedish proposals. Elizabeth, though exposed to many present dangers and mortifications, had the magnanimity to reserve herself for better fortune, and she covered her refusal with professions of a passionate attachment to a single life, which, she said, she infinitely preferred before any other. The princess showed like prudence in concealing her sentiments of religion, in complying with the present modes of worship, and in eluding all questions with regard to that delicate subject. The money granted by Parliament enabled the Queen to fit out a fleet of a hundred and forty sail, which, being joined by thirty Flemish ships, and carrying six thousand land forces on board, was sent to make an attempt on the coast of Brittany. The fleet was commanded by Lord Clinton, the land forces by the earls of Huntingdon and Rutland, but the equipment of the fleet and army was so dilatory that the French got intelligence of the design, and were prepared to receive them. The English found Brest so well guarded as to render an attempt on that place impracticable, but landing at Conquet they plundered and burnt the town, with some adjacent villages, and were proceeding to commit greater disorders, when Ker Simon, a Breton gentleman, at the head of some militia, fell upon them, put them to rout, and drove them to their ships with considerable loss. But a small squadron of ten English ships had an opportunity of amply revenging this disgrace upon the French. The Maréchal de Thermes had made an eruption into Flanders with an army of fourteen thousand men, and having forced a passage upon the river Ah, had taken Dunkirk and Burg St. Winock, and had advanced as far as Newport. But Count Egmont, coming suddenly upon him with superior forces, he was obliged to retreat, and being overtaken by the Spaniards near Gravelines, and finding a battle inevitable, he chose very skilfully his ground for the engagement. He fortified his left wing with all the precautions possible, and posted his right along the river Ah, which he reasonably thought gave him full security from that quarter. But the English ships, which were accidentally on the coast, being drawn by the noise of the firing, sailed up the river, and flanking the French, did such execution by their artillery that they put them to flight, and the Spaniards gained a complete victory. Meanwhile the principal army of France under the Duke of Guise, and that of Spain under the Duke of Savoy, approached each other on the frontiers of Picardy, and as the two kings had come into their respective camps, attended by the flower of their nobility, men expected that some great and important event would follow from the emulation of these warlike nations. But Philip, though actuated by the ambition, possessed not the enterprising genius of a conqueror, and he was willing, notwithstanding the superiority of his numbers, and the two great victories which he had gained at St. Quintin and Gravelines, to put a period to the war by treaty. Negotiations were entered into for that purpose, and as the terms offered by the two monarchs were somewhat wide of each other, the armies were put into winter quarters till the princes could come to better agreement. 
Among other conditions, Henry demanded the restitution of Navarre to its lawful owner, Philip, that of Calais and its territory to England. But in the midst of these negotiations, news arrived of the death of Mary, and Philip, no longer connected with England, began to relax in his firmness on that capital article. This was the only circumstance that could have made the death of that princess be regretted by the nation. Mary had long been in a declining state of health, and having mistaken her dropsy for a pregnancy, she had made use of an improper regimen, and her malady daily augmented. Every reflection now tormented her. The consciousness of being hated by her subjects, the prospect of Elizabeth's succession, apprehensions of the danger to which the Catholic religion stood exposed, dejection for the loss of Calais, concern for the ill state of her affairs, and above all anxiety for the absence of her husband, who she knew intended soon to depart for Spain, and to settle there during the remainder of his life. All these melancholy reflections preyed upon her mind, and threw her into a lingering fever, of which she died, after a short and unfortunate reign of five years, four months, and eleven days. It is not necessary to employ many words in drawing the character of this princess. She possessed few qualities either estimable or amiable, and her person was as little engaging as her behavior and dress. Obstinacy, bigotry, violence, cruelty, malignity, revenge, tyranny, every circumstance of her character took a tincture from her bad temper and narrow understanding, and amidst that complication of vices which entered into her composition, we shall scarcely find any virtue but sincerity a quality which she seemed to have maintained throughout her whole life, except in the beginning of her reign, when the necessity of her affairs obliged her to make some promises to the Protestants, which she certainly never intended to perform. But in these cases, a weak, bigoted woman, under the government of priests, easily finds casuistry sufficient to justify to herself the violation of a promise, she appears, also, as well as her father, to have been susceptible of some attachments of friendship, and that without the caprice and inconstancy which were so remarkable in the conduct of that monarch, to which we may add that in many circumstances of her life she gave indications of resolution and vigour of mind, a quality which seems to have been inherent in her family. Cardinal Pole had long been sickly from an intermitting fever, and he died the same day with the Queen, about sixteen hours after her. The benign character of this prelate, the modesty and humanity of his deportment, made him be universally beloved, insomuch that in a nation where the most furious persecution was carried on, and where the most violent religious factions prevailed, entire justice even by most of the reformers, has been done to his merit. The haughty pontiff, Paul IV, had entertained some prejudices against him, and when England declared war against Henry, the ally of that pope, he seized the opportunity of revenge, and revoking Paul's legantine commission, appointed in his room Cardinal Pato, an observantine friar, and confessor to the queen. But Mary would never permit the new legate to act upon the commission, and Paul was afterwards obliged to restore Cardinal Pole to his authority. There occur few general remarks, besides what have already been made in the course of our narration, with regard to the general state of the kingdom during this reign. The naval power of England was then so inconsiderable that fourteen thousand pounds being ordered to be applied to the fleet, both for repairing and victualling it, it was computed that ten thousand pounds a year would afterwards answer all necessary charges. The arbitrary proceedings of the Queen above mentioned, 
joined to many monopolies granted by this princess, as well as by her father, checked the growth of commerce, and so much the more, as all other princes in Europe either were not permitted, or did not find it necessary to proceed in so tyrannical a manner. Acts of Parliament, both in the last reign and in the beginnings of the present, had laid the same impositions on the merchants of the still yard as on other aliens, yet the queen, immediately after her marriage, complied with the solicitations of the emperor, and by her prerogative suspended those laws. Nobody in that age pretended to question this exercise of prerogative. The historians are entirely silent with regard to it and it is only by the collection of public papers that it is handed down to us. An absurd law had been made in the preceding reign, by which every one was prohibited from making cloth unless he had served an apprenticeship of seven years. The law was repealed in the first year of the Queen, and this plain reason given, that it had occasioned the decay of the woollen manufacture, and had ruined several towns. It is strange that Edward's law should have been revived during the reign of Elizabeth, and still more strange that it should still subsist. A passage to Archangel had been discovered by the English during the last reign, and a beneficial trade with Muscovy had been established. A solemn embassy was sent by the Tsar to Queen Mary. The ambassadors were shipwrecked on the coast of Scotland, but being hospitably entertained there, they proceeded on the journey, and were received at London with great pomp and solemnity. This seems to have been the first intercourse which that empire had with any of the western potentates of Europe. A law was passed in this reign, by which the number of horses, arms, and furniture was fixed with each person, according to the extent of his property, should be provided with for the defence of the kingdom. A man of a thousand pounds a year, for instance, was obliged to maintain at his own charge six horses fit for demi-lances, of which three at least to be furnished with sufficient harness, steel saddles, and weapons proper for the demi-lances, and ten horses fit for light horsemen, with furniture and weapons proper for them. He was obliged to have forty corselets, furnished, fifty Almain revets, or instead of them forty coats of plate, coarse, etc., or brigandines furnished, forty pikes, thirty long bows, thirty sheafs of arrows, thirty steel caps or skulls, twenty black bills or halberts, twenty hark boots, and twenty morions or sallets. We may remark that a man of a thousand marks of stock was rated equal to one of two hundred pounds a year, a proof that few or none at that time lived on their stock in money, and that great profits were made by the merchants in the course of trade. There is no class above a thousand pounds a year. We may form a notion of the little progress made in arts and refinement about this time from one circumstance. A man of no less rank than the comptroller of Edward the Sixth's household, paid only thirty shillings a year of our present money for his house in Channel Row. Yet labour and provisions, and consequently houses, were only about a third of the present price. Erasmus ascribes the frequent plagues in England to the nastiness and dirt, and slovenly habits among the people. The floors, he said, are commonly of clay, strewed with rushes under which lies unmolested an ancient collection of beer, grease, fragments, bones, spittle, excrements of dogs and cats and everything that is nasty. Hollingshead, who lived in Queen Elizabeth's reign, gives a very curious account of the plain or rather rude way of living of the preceding generation. There scarcely was a chimney to the houses, even in considerable towns. The fire was kindled by the wall, and the smoke sought its way out at the roof, or door, or windows. 
The houses were nothing but watling plastered over with clay. The people slept on straw pallets, and had a good round log under their head for a pillow, and almost all the furniture and utensils were of wood. In this reign we find the first general law with regard to highways, which were appointed to be repaired by parish duty all over England. End of section 50, chapter 37, part 4. End of History of England, volume 1C, by David Hume.